live from Burbank, the media capital of the world. To participate in the general public comment period, please call now at 818-238-3335. For any scheduled public hearings, please call when prompted to speak if you want the comment to be part of the record. Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes depending on the number of speakers. Meeting of the Burbank City Council and the Burbank Unified School District Board of Education. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. We are all present here in room 104 of the Community Services Building shortly after 6 p.m. And at the outset, I just want to say it is really an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you. We've only done this a handful of times in my time on council. and. Uh, it's going to be really fun tonight. Uh, before we get into the agenda items, I just wanted to acknowledge for the community that this is a joint meeting of equal partnership between our two bodies. So in some instances, there are differences in custom and tradition and approach. And so as best we can, President Weisberg and I are going to steer the meeting in a productive way that is inclusive of the traditions of both of our bodies. So with that, we're going to begin uh, as the council typically begins its meeting with a brief moment of reflection. This moment is intended to begin each of our meetings with a positive and collective support for our beloved Burbank community. The City Council welcomes everyone joining us this evening, both in person and virtually. We encourage you right now to take a moment to reflect on our community and the work that we will be doing together tonight. Although each of us has our own unique reasons for being here, we're united in our shared passion for this wonderful city that we all call home. And as we pause, Please let us consider our individual contributions and what it means to those around us. Let us find solace in knowing that by working together with a shared spirit of community and true partnership, we will always act responsibly for the betterment of Burbank. Thank you all. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Weisberg uh, for your uh, uh, beginning of meeting tradition. Uh, as it is uh, become tradition at our board meetings, we begin each of our meetings with a land acknowledgement, which I will uh, read now. We acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Chumash, Tongva, Fernandeño, Tatavaim, and First Nations on which we are learning, educating, and living. Thank you so much, President Weisberg. Now, if you'd all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please place your hand over your right hand over your heart, face the flag here, and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you, everyone. Ms. Tai, it's wonderful to have you with us tonight uh, in the place of Ms. Clark. Would you please begin by conducting roll call for both the City Council and Board of Education? Yes, Mayor. Um, Councilmember Anthony? Present. Councilmember Mullins? Present. Councilmember Takahashi? Present. Vice Mayor Perez? Here. And Mayor Schultz? Present. Thank you. I will now conduct the roll for the school district. Member Ferguson? Member Tabit? Here. Clerk Ponser Kamkar? Present. Vice President Agakanian? Present. And President Weisberg? Present. Thank you. 
We would like to advise the community that there will be one period of public comment this evening. Members of the public may comment in person or by telephone during the general public comment period on any matter concerning city business or school district business or any agenda item this evening. If you would like to participate in general public comment by phone, please call right now at 818-238-3335. Callers will be placed in a queue until all in-person public comment has been received. At this time, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of our BUSD Board of Education members, including the board members, staff, uh, everyone in attendance this evening. Uh, and on behalf of the City Council, we are just so happy to have you with us and look forward to a very productive conversation uh, in betterment of our community. President Weisberg, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, just thank you, and thank you to city staff for putting everything together. I know this was a bit of an undertaking. There are like 12,000 tables. Um, and I just, I like that it gives us an opportunity to dispel the myth that the district and the city don't work together, because we do, and I think we work quite well together uh, in partnership, and we will continue to strengthen that partnership, which is the point of these joint meetings. So um, I welcome this opportunity, and I look forward to many more. Thank you so much. Uh, next on our agenda, um, we have uh, public announcements. We have uh, five public announcements this evening. If we could please roll the tape. The following are announcements for April 3rd, 2024. Help the Leadership Burbank Class of 2024 with their class project, A Cause for Pause. The goal of the project is to create a new dog run and adoption area at the Burbank Animal Shelter, which will provide animals with exercise and socialization and allow more families to meet more pets at the same time. Join us on Saturday, April 13th for a fundraising event at Johnny Carson Park from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Visit leadershipburbank.org forward slash a cause for pause to donate today and learn more. The Sustainable Burbank Commission and Burbank Community Garden are thrilled to announce their Earth Day celebration on Saturday, April 13th from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Come to the garden for a fun morning of children's activities and presentations on composting, native plants, seed starting, and growing your own vegetables. This event is free and open to community members of all ages. Follow at Burbank Community Garden for more information. The Our Burbank 311 mobile app has expanded to now include parking enforcement services such as reporting vehicles in violation of the 72-hour parking restriction, which would include abandoned vehicles on Burbank city streets. Citizens will be able to submit new reports, attach photos, and follow the progress of the report from start to finish. Download the mobile app for free on the Apple app and Google Play stores or access online at 311.burbankca.gov. The City of Burbank, in collaboration with RJM Design Group, is conducting a City Parks Master Plan. This plan will guide parks and recreation development now and in the future. Provide your input by filling out a community survey. The survey only takes a few minutes and can be conveniently accessed by visiting burbankca.gov forward slash City Parks Master Plan. Burbank is in Stage 3 of the Sustainable Water Use Ordinance. During the hotter months of April through October, Burbank will move back to two days per week watering schedule. Residents are asked to use irrigation on Tuesdays and Saturdays only before 9 a.m. and after 6 p.m. for up to 15 minutes per irrigation station. Hand watering is allowed any day of the week, but should be done before 9 a.m. or after 6 p.m. Please note that the sustainable water use ordinance does not apply to recycled water. To learn more about Burbank's water conservation efforts, please visit burbankwaterandpower.com. This concludes the announcements for this evening. All right, thank you all very much. We do have one more announcement on behalf of the school district. At this time, I'm going to recognize Superintendent of Education, John Paramo. Thank you so much. As we know, uh, March is Women's Month, and I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the amazing female leadership, not just on council, but also on our Board of Education. So uh, I want you to all to know that we are so appreciative of who you are. We're grateful for what you do, and uh, I salute the goddess that resides in each of you. And if Dr. Agakanyan, if you can please uh, present a token of our appreciation. Thank you for that, Dr. Paramo. And I just want to note, because we have some scouts here in the room, that of the uh, city elected officials sitting in front of you, I'm proud to say that between the council and the school board, we are 60% women which I think is an, a real accomplishment for Burbank. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, I didn't come bearing gifts, but I do come get bearing the gift of public comments. So if you'll all indulge me, <laughs> dad jokes will be in full mode tonight. Uh, now is the time for joint general public comment to the uh, school board and the city council. For members of the public who are here in person and would like to speak, please present a completed yellow general public comment card to our city clerk. Uh, any person speaking during general public po comment may address the council and the board of education on any matter on the agenda and or any matter of, of business with the city of Burbank or the unified school district. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. And in order to promote fairness, we ask that you please stay within your maximum allotted time of three minutes. A timer is available on the podium to help you keep track of how much time you have remaining. We also ask that you state your name for the record when you come up. And for those wishing to call in during general public comment, if you haven't done so already, please call 818-238-3335. Callers, again, will be placed in a queue until all in-person public comment has been received. Um, so if you haven't filled out one of these puppies, now's the time to do it. I'm in receipt of six cards so far. Uh, I typically like to say who's up and who's on deck, so that way you know what's coming. First, we'll be hearing from Joel Schlossman, followed by Joe Pimienta. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Ms. Weisberg, you're the only one who did not stand up for the flag salute in this room. You should be ashamed of yourself. I'm interested in both the city and the school board saving money for the taxpayers and eliminating redundancy. Um, some things here, about 10 things that you might consider. Combining your purchasing power, which could be uh, examples like office supplies or bathroom products. Uh, the city has two vehicle maintenance repair yards. The school district has one. Perhaps there's some way where we can eliminate some of these um, repair yards that are redundant. Um, the school district has a number of painters and plumbers, locksmiths, glazers. That's somebody who works with glass, Ms. Perez. And others, roofers and these types of things. And perhaps we could have a... Uh, employment sharing type of deal and we could eliminate some jobs. Um, why do we have two print shops? Perhaps we could combine our print shops into one. Um, maybe we could give each other first options on vehicles that are no longer serve us because there may be some life in them and there may be some usage for the other department. Um, perhaps we could share use of our facilities. You know our Schools have wonderful auditoriums and our cafeterias have kitchens and maybe we wouldn't need to go out of the city for functions. Maybe we could have some functions here in Burbank. Um, let's talk about Film LA. Maybe we could eliminate Film LA and do that in-house. We're giving away a huge portion of our money, our monies to Film LA and I would prefer if that went to help our schools. Um, we need a joint merit award program. That means when uh, our employees uh, have an idea that can save the city or the school district money, they, per they, perceive, they receive 10% of the profits the first year. Neither the city or the district has this program. And finally, um, can't read my writing. Well, I put lending of special equipment. So if one, one, if the city or the school district had some kind of special equipment, maybe we could lend it instead of going out and renting it. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Joe Pimienta, followed by Joe Sullivan. Good evening to everyone in the school board, mayor, vice mayor, council members, staff, and everyone here and everyone present here, members of the public. Uh, my name is Joe Pimienta. I am a contributing member to the Burbank Tenant Union. And one of the things that we've been doing for quite some time now is that we continue to canvas. That means going door to door and talking to tenants directly. And one of the things that we keep finding out is whenever a stranger Chops up, shows, up, shows up at your door, they're not entirely open to discuss how, you know, how being a tenant is going until we start discussing a little bit more. And usually it goes the same way. They're saying that living in Burbank is great. They love it here. It's really cool. They, uh, they love everything around it. And then we start getting into the conversation of like, well, you know, how have you received the rent increase? And we always get the same answer, which is, yeah, those keep showing up every year. 
Uh, we don't know what we're going to do about that. We don't know if we can stay here another year or so. And then the conversation keeps going from there, um, which, again, it's something that we continue to add up that, well, if many residents are constantly stressed about whether or not they can remain here another year or so because of the constant high rent increases, maybe there's something that can be done about that. Uh, the Burbank Tenant Union has been advocating you know, in order to pass a rent stabilization ordinance, and we continue to hope that that actually gets into the agenda. Um, other than that, um, uh, I do want to congratulate, you know, on a completely different topic, I do want to congratulate the city of El Monte, which last night they passed a ceasefire resolution. They, add, they are now in one of the other cities within the, the, the state of California. So, and I would just like for Burbank to be on that list as well. We would be following cities like Alhambra, Sacramento, Bell Gardens, um, as I mentioned, El Monte. Um, and it would be fantastic because, as we all know, there's a genocide going on that needs to stop. And I think it would be great if Burbank adds themselves to that list and saying, yes, cease fire now and the slaughter and everything that goes with it. For the rest of it, thank you very much for your service. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I will continue seeing you the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Joe Sullivan, followed by Rama Kokobian. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Board President, Vice Mayor, Board members, Council members, and staff. I think I got it all. Uh, my name's Joe Sullivan. I work for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 11, and the National Electrical Contractors Association of Greater Los Angeles. And I wanna take a moment to, one, introduce myself, and to encourage you when you are undertaking construction projects, be it um, electric vehicle infrastructure, which is very common right now, solar, which is very common right now, or facilities improvements or creating new uh, facilities to include workforce standards that create local high road careers. Um, careers in the construction industry, they can lift, lift up communities. We've seen it in Lancaster where they build a lot of solar and unemployment's dropped and the middle class has gone way up. Um, in addition to paying family sustaining wages, these careers, um, include apprenticeship training, mentorship, job placement, job placement, career advancement opportunities, and there's benefits and retirement that are you know, very high end. It really creates a pathway to the middle class, but this all starts with good workforce policies that create these high road careers. So that's all I wanted to say tonight, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next we have Rama Kakobian, followed by Jordan Barger. Good evening, City Council. Um, <clears throat> sorry, there's a long list. Um, are we going to start? Okay. So, good evening, uh, Mayor Schultz, President Weisberg, uh, the school board, and the City Council, and staff. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I am a public appointed police commissioner serving on behalf of the, um, uh, about the pleasure of the City Council, but I'm here representing myself and not the commission. <clears throat> Just want to give some comments on the um, SRO update and also the SRO program in general. And um, just to provide my support for helping expand this program, specifically in the field of helping this current SRO officer with the with the SCAR reports and finding someone that can help them uh, with the actual work that's being done. And you know, from what I've experienced in working with Sergeant Lawford, working with uh, uh, School Resource Officer Kiyomi Roberts, uh, seeing the workload that's being taken uh, taken upon. Um, independently on their own and seeing what they're doing, it has been fantastic. So I myself have, you know, worked with uh, Officer Roberts. I've gone to um, Disney Elementary School, gave a presentation with her, and just seeing the vital, vital work that's done and the relationships that are built. So it's something I definitely do support. And um, spoke with also many principals all throughout the community in regards to this program. And they believe that um, building a relationship between the, the police department and the schools and normalizing conversations and making people feel comfortable with having conversations has been great. So um, just want to kind of come up and just talk about that, provide my support. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Jordan Barger, followed by Naveen G. And if I mispronounce anyone's name, please feel free to correct me before your time begins. Hey, my name is Jordan Barger for the record. Thank you for having me. I'm here today regarding the need for the Burbank City Council to pass resolution for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. It is important for Burbank to join the 70 other United States cities that have passed ceasefire resolutions. You may ask, how can a city on the other side of the world make an impact on such a large issue? Well, Israel's bloodshed on Gaza is an issue that impacts us all, including um, the fact that as representatives of the people of Burbank, city council members should be resisting Islamophobia, anti-Arab sentiment, and anti-Semitism towards their own constituents. 
Passing a permanent ceasefire resolution is one way we can set a precedent for other cities and overall encourage the federal government to do so as well. Even in 2019, Nina Hachigan, the first United States Special Representative for City and D State Diplomacy, argued that cities will determine the future of diplomacy when international diplomacy fails at the federal level. She writes, quote, perhaps the most important way in which cities operate internationally is when they use their collective power and will to tackle a serious global challenge, end quote. That is what we are requesting Burbank do now. Join the collective power of individual cities passing permanent ceasefire resolutions. The time is now. The people of Gaza cannot wait any longer. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. My last speaker card is Naveen G. Um, good evening, City Council, school board, and everyone. My name is Naveen, a Burbank resident, a BUSD employee, and a proud Christian Palestinian from the little town of Bethlehem. I spoke in your presence two weeks ago about passing a resolution for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. A lot, a lot has happened since then. 75 years of occupation has led us to even before October 7th and to where we are now. Over 33,000 people and more have perished, including seven innocent aid workers with World Central Kitchen just two days ago. A temporary ceasefire was passed at the United Nations a week ago, but Israel keeps on ignoring the world's collective voice and continues to slaughter and starve Gazans. 180 days of live stream genocide and our country just sent a fresh round of weapons to Israel. When will this end? When will our government stop sending our tax money to Israel? It's becoming an issue in every city and state here in the US. That's why we are here to demand a ceasefire. Since the BUSD is present here today, I have seen the struggle that the school district faces with funding programs constantly. So I cannot understand how our tax dollars are being used to support the murder of tens and thousands of innocent humans, especially school children in Gaza, and not being used here to help our schools thrive and have more programs and a pay raise for teachers. And I would like to mention one more thing. When this genocide started, we got a letter from the superintendent's office mentioning assistance for some students in our community on multiple occasions. And uh, always left out the other ethnicities in our schools, especially Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese, and so on. Why is it always that our kids have to suffer? We live in a free country, but there is still cherry picking going on. A ceasefire is not taking sides. A ceasefire is not anti-Semitic. A ceasefire is not pro-Hamas. A ceasefire is about ending the violence, is about ending the death of innocent children and the starvation in Gaza, freeing the hostages on both sides, and being human. Burbank has a history of standing up for its values, including condemning the aggression in Artsakh. My dream is to see my family in Palestine free for one day, and I mean one day, sorry, and I can travel to see them freely without being stopped 100 times by Israeli checkpoints and, and to visit all churches in Jerusalem during Easter without being harassed and checked. My dream is for the Gazans people, especially the children, to have a normal life like our children here going to schools every day and dreaming to become of becoming doctors and teachers. Please adopt a ceasefire resolution now from this beautiful city of Burbank to my strong country of Palestine. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We have now completed in-person public comment. Uh, for those who will be calling in, please remember to lower the volume on your TV or computer and take your phone off of speaker mode when you deliver public comment so that we can hear you. Uh, Ms. Ty, do we have any callers on the line? Yes, Mayor, we have four speakers in the queue. Okay, send the first one through. The first Hello? Caller is Daisy. Yes, hi, you're on with the City Council and School Board. Oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Daisy Sum. I am a Korean American who is able to recognize the historical parallel between the common history of genocide and resistance between Korea and Palestine. Today is the anniversary of the Jeju uprising, but I have Palestine on my mind. It's been 76 years since Jeju and Nakba. But today, the Korean and Palestinian revolutions are pushing imperialism into a crisis. The truth is, liberation is inevitable. There's no stopping the will of the people. Korea will be won. Palestine will be free. Let's be honest. Joe Biden is old. He's going to die in a few years. But Palestinians and the rest of the world will be dealing with his terrible decisions for generations to come. We could start the rebuilding process for peace right now by having y'all vote for our ceasefire resolution tonight. Every day, Americans are growing more and more disillusioned by our current federal government. 
the mere fact that there are public commenters here tonight speaks on this issue, um, who speak on this issue, highlights a lingering fear in our local representatives. I hope um, oh, to, do, to do your part by voting for the local ceasefire resolution. Let's go over some basic facts. This genocide did not start on October 7th. Over 30,000 Palestinians dead, majority of them being children. Over 55% of Americans disapprove of the actions of Israeli military because supporting a genocide was never a popular position. The majority of the people of this country want to see the violence end. We also need to understand that the U.S. support of Israel's federal colonial projects play an important role in how Arab Americans are being treated inside the United States. This is a local issue. The end goal of this genocide has always been about U.S. colonial ambitions of accessing oil, deconstructing anti-Muslim racism, and understanding the underlying Orientalist framework and Cold War tactics to maintain our current U.S. imperialism is super critical in how we will bring about a free Palestine. We will no longer fool ourselves into falling into the trap of benevolent supremacy like we did in 2004 to stay in Iraq. Instead, we need to let go of any paternalistic colonial attitudes and allow Palestinian self-determination. And we start this by passing a permanent and lasting ceasefire resolution. So I'm leaving a public comment asking the city of Burbank, Burbank um, to vote for a city, uh, sorry, to vote for a ceasefire resolution. So uh, please join more than the 70 U.S. cities that has been that have already issued this resolution. That includes El Mani from last yesterday night, uh, Pasadena, and Alhambra. Thank you so much for listening to my uh, concerns, and uh, yeah, I'm done. Thank you for your comment. Next caller, please. The next caller is Lily Beth um, Jimenez. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lily Beth Jimenez. I am a Burbank resident. I couldn't attend the meeting in person today, but I am watching the live stream remotely. Two weeks ago, I came in person to ask our city to call for a ceasefire, and today I'm calling in to ask that you bring back the first step report for a ceasefire resolution for Palestine um, as soon as possible. It is incredibly important that we expedite this resolution. It is my belief that the biggest changes can be started by our local governments and communities. A ceasefire today would save lives tomorrow, and it is our responsibility to do our part in stopping a genocide. Um, most recently, El Monte City has joined Pasadena, Alhambra, Pomona, Montebello, and dozens of other cities that have called for a ceasefire, and it would be incredible if the great city of Burbank was next. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next caller, please. Uh, one of the callers dropped, so we, uh, that's the end of our calls. Okay. Um, there being no further oh, no? public comment. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there's one more person. I there is? Guess. Okay, send them through, please. The next caller would like to remain anonymous. Hello? Yes, hi, you're on with the City Council and the School Board. Yes, I wanted to say that uh, we need more affordable housing in Burbank. Burbank, uh, Burbank is a rent majority. Um, the cost of housing is affecting our schools, our teachers, parents, and students. For the, the lively, for the to increase the uh, quality of life in Burbank, we need greater rent, renter protections and more affordable housing. Um, on another note, I would please ask to expedite the call for a ceasefire for Palestine. Um, the people in Palestine are still dying. Um, Alhambra and Pasadena have called for a resolution for a ceasefire. Um, I ask that Burbank City Council that up and visit um, soon. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Ms. Tai, do we have any other callers? Okay, send them through, please. The next caller is Ever Huerta. Hi, before, uh, you're on with City Council and the School Board. Before you go on, can we bump the volume? That was difficult to hear their name. All right. All right, can, can staff please repeat the name and then uh, you may begin your comment. The next caller is Ever Huerta. Thank you. All right. Ever, you're on with the Council and School Board. Begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Mayor Schultz, Vice Mayor Perez, Council Members Takahashi and Mullins, School Board President Weisberg, Vice President Ozakanyan, uh, Clerk uh, Ponzer Kamkar, and Members Ferguson and Cabot, Superintendent Paramo, and City Staff and other District Staff. Um, the reason that I'm calling in is for the purpose of public safety that is on the agenda. 
Um, the reason for that is um, as an older brother now, the role that I have taken on, um, my sister attends Dolores Huerta Middle School, um, and we have seen at the four-way intersection on Mariposa, I have seen myself, uh, students nearly been hit by cars. Um, I know that's been a problem in the past. I know before there used to be a, a sort of crossing guard, which used to be the admin on site. Uh, now, with a shift of admin that has occurred on the school site, um, I have not seen anybody out there crossing uh, students safely across and have almost witnessed multiple accidents for students trying to cross the street safely. Um, as I know, some drivers are not paying attention, and as well, some students, when crossing, they also don't pay attention. So I think it would be a great investment if the city or uh, district staff could have some sort of um, solution or some sort of coming together to try and have that safety ensured for all students to make sure they're reaching home or the classroom safely. Thank you so much for letting me comment, and thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, no more callers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tai. There being no further public comment, I now declare the joint general public comment period closed. Now is the time for a brief response from the City Council, members of the Board of Education, the City Manager, the Superintendent, and or the City Attorney. Uh, to keep the general order of the meeting, I'm going to ask if there are any staff comments. We begin there, and then Dr. Weisberg and I will, will alternate with calling on Board and Council members. Any staff response from either staff? If I could, Mr. Mayor. Please, uh, Mr. Hess. Yes, um, just uh, in response to our first uh, speaker, Mr. Schlossman, um, I know there's, uh, um, we do partner in a lot of different ways with our joint use agreements and, and certain things, but I did write down a few of the things, and I know uh, me and uh, our superintendent uh, meet regularly, so um, I have some good notes, and uh, anything that we could do to partner and save money, I I'm all in. So uh, uh, so we'll, we'll re-up on that and uh, certainly uh, look at ways to uh, uh, save money and also be good partners. Thank you, Mr. Hess. Uh, Dr. Paramo? I would really like to echo that. Uh, Mr. Schlossman, I really appreciate the suggestions you brought forward, and we will give it its due diligence. And uh, in addition to meeting with our city manager, I've also meet with uh, district staff to see what we can do about some of those ideas. Uh, and I also want to comment on any message that was sent out on the district uh, regarding the global issues that have been going on. If they appeared to be one-sided, I, I just want to tell you that uh, that was never the intention and we just have to do better. And I'm committed to doing that. Thank you, Dr. Paramo. Any other staff response? Seeing none, I just got to say it's great to see you all there at the table working together. That's a good luck for the city. Um, all right, so we're now going to go to response from board and council. Um, just in general tonight, everyone, um, we don't mean to limit discussion, but we just want everyone's voice to be heard at least one time before those uh, before folks start to uh, maybe add a, have a second or third comment. So in general, Dr. Weisberg and I will be alternating and calling on you in a specific order. Um, so with that, Dr. Weisberg, would you like to begin? Certainly. Uh, I believe, uh, Mr. Ferguson, you are up. Thank you, Dr. Weisberg. And, uh, uh, to everybody uh, who came down for public comment, thank you very much for your time uh, and for spending it with us uh, this evening. Uh, Mr. Schlossman, usually uh, there are a lot of different comments that you make tonight. I thought they were very constructive, uh, and I think there are plenty of areas that we can certainly explore. Um, different agencies, different needs, uh, they, they all come at us very quickly. So um, these are the experts. If there's a place to collaborate, I know that there's a spirit and a, a willingness to do so. So thank you on that front. Uh, when it comes to the, the note that was sent home uh, to families offering supports, um, we are seeing conflicts increase around the world. And, and it was, the intention was not, uh, because it came from the Board of Education, the direction to, hey, let's get outreach out there. Let's let people know that there are tools and services available. It's helpful when we hear this feedback because it wasn't received by you or your family or, or people you know uh, as something that they could then take advantage of it. They were so, so focused on the messaging of it that they didn't focus on the services that could have been offered. And so we've got to do better on our end about that. So um, we'll, we'll certainly look into that, but thank you for, for bringing that point up. Um, and then to uh, Commissioner Hakobian, is he still here? Yes, hi, Roman. Um, you know, uh, when I started this work on SROs years ago, and we're gonna get into that conversation, in, in, I think, in more depth, but. The program looked the same as when I was in elementary school. 
And, and that's a problem. You know, we need programs to evolve. And that's what we're discussing. Um, what does that look like in the modern context? And what, so uh, I think we're all looking to get that right. And I think uh, it's clear that the police commission is very, I, I've heard from two commissioners already. Um, so uh, it's exciting that you want to engage at this level. And I, I think we need to be incorporating you as partners uh, as, we, as we move forward. So thank you very much for coming down and spending time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Board Member Ferguson. Next, we'll go to Council Member Zazette Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you everyone who's attending. Uh, also, those who called in today. Um, I do want to echo um, Member Ferguson as well regarding the joint work together with the school and the city. I, I really applaud you both for looking into some of these items that Mr. Schlossman uh, mentioned. I think it's a great idea. And Commissioner Hagobian, um, we will be discussing this item tonight. I am looking forward to find out um, the updates and what that program can look like moving forward. And I wanted to quickly address the callers and also those who spoke tonight about ceasefire um, agreement or resolution. We, um, I believe we have it scheduled for future agenda item, and if the city manager would like to share with us the date, um, perhaps maybe when, when it's coming back. Absolutely. Uh, right now it's currently uh, scheduled for uh, May 21st to bring back what other cities uh, have adopted uh, as, as far as local resolutions. So um, thank you all that spoke in regards to that. And the last caller regarding the safety on Mariposa, I'm sure um, maybe our police can address this issue. Thank you. Uh, board member Tabit. Thank you, President Weisberg, and thank you to everyone else. Um, it's really great to be here tonight and see so many folks come out and share their thoughts with us. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Schlossman, I do want to say that I, I heard everything that you said, and I'm glad that our leadership will be talking and discussing it. But I do want to point out that I think we have a very good joint use agreement with the city, and we are very supportive of each other in that way. Um, so I want to thank you for that and hope that continues, because there's things that you have that we don't and vice versa and it's nice that we are able to share our facilities with each other so thank you for that um mr akobian romick thank you for your comment um i'm looking forward to hearing the discussion tonight uh, i'm normally in in favor of sros so i i am excited about to hear what we're going to discuss tonight so thank you for being here and bringing that up um, and finally, where was I? Mr. Huerta, ever, thank you for bringing up public safety, especially the specific location. I don't know, two, eight, four, six years ago, uh, I, at this joint meeting, I brought up an idea um, during, the, during the joint meeting, and, and Ron Davis was the city manager at the time, and he took it on and really did a fantastic job with some of our um, public streets and the, especially around our schools with lowering the speed limit, with putting in four-way stops. So I know, I know that the city is very welcoming about those topics and discussing them. So uh, I'm looking forward to those discussions as we move on to the meeting too. So thank you everyone for coming and speaking up. Um, good to be here. Thank you, Board Member Tabbitt. Next, we'll go to Council Member Tamala Takahashi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, I want to say I'm so happy to be here tonight with you all. I have been in the audience where you're sitting many times. I was here for the first joint meeting, and it's so exciting to be here on the other side. Um, and I also know this is a Wednesday night, which is unusual for both bodies to meet on Wednesday, so thank you for being out here tonight and those who are watching. Um, and also those who send us emails, too. Thank you for your emails and your comments. I don't want to echo too much of what's already been said to, you know, the, considering time, but I did want to say that in general, and to Mr. Schlossman's points earlier, is that in general, I really appreciate when folks come up with ideas. 
Even if ideas may not be immediately feasible, that approach is, I think, so welcoming to have thoughts and ideas about how we can do better, and that starts a conversation, and that starts us on the page of agreement that we can move forward. So I really appreciate that approach tonight and um, encourage further, th further ideas. And then to Mr. Sullivan, who, who spoke about um, some ideas about uh, workforce, I would love to connect. Please reach out. It'd be great. And then to Mr. Huerta um, at the end, I, I'm, safety is very important to me as well, especially pedestrian and bicycle safety. So I agree that it's important. And uh, we will talk about it. And just wanted to highlight that's an important issue for me. But thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, Clerk Ponser Kamkar. Thank you, President Weisberg. Um, similar to Member Takahashi, last time this happened, I was watching from home. Um, and here I am. Um, happy Women's History Month. So um, this is great to be here with you all, and thank you for all the public comments. Um, you've certainly given me a lot to think about, um, and, and in terms of thinking about how does council uh, deal with essentially issues of foreign policy uh, right here in our backyard, right? So thank you, thank you for um, the thoughtful comments today. Um, in order to um, you know, try not to piggyback too much, I'll just say um, thank you to Mr. Huerta um, for coming with uh, a concern about pedestrian safety. I've noticed that we take it very seriously for our little kids. Um, all of the elementary schools, I think, have a crossing guard. Um, certainly ours at Disney is very vigilant, um, and living very near to boroughs, I know that we don't have that, right? And we may be used to when it was a more split campus. So I'd, I would just like for us to think about the fact that we still have parents doing a lot of drop-off at our secondary schools. We still have lots of little bodies walking around trying to not get hit by cars. And so I would love to see us um, make sure that we're addressing our secondary students as much as we do for our primary. Thanks. Thank you very much, board member. Next, we'll go to council member Constantine Anthony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, glad to be here on a Wednesday. I see we split the difference between the Tuesday and Thursday nights. That's fun. Uh, thanks for everybody else for coming down and, and uh, joining us at this larger room. And um, I, you know, thank you for everybody for the comments made. Um, most of the comments were on an item that is not currently on the agenda, so we'll deal with that when it comes back. Uh, in May. Um, to Joe from IBEW Local 11, I think that is an excellent idea to um, really watch how we build. Not just what we build, but how we build. That is key and that is important. Um, and uh, I'm wondering uh, for to Mr. Huerta's question about uh, safety. I know the City Council uh, gave some direction, Mr. City Manager, about um, crossing guards. Yes, I, I, if I could, if I could have the police chief uh, just uh, provide a quick update on that. Please, Chief Albanese, come up. I, I can tell you are very happy we called you up. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to disappoint a lot of people. <laughs> uh, I really am. Oh. So I can tell you what the current uh, hourly rate is for our crossing guards and what's on the horizon. I cannot give you a specific date or time. Forgive me for not greeting you this evening. <laughs> so uh, I will uh, I will get back to all of you. Um, I'm prepared for a lot of stuff. <laughs> I was not prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> and with all due respect to the chief, it's not on the agenda. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I love attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> that you might be uh, one of a few people in this room to say that, chief. But thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. McDougal. Council member, anything else? Uh, no. We'll just uh, we are um, this. For those uh, folks viewing at home, um, the uh, crossing guards are paid through uh, the city, and we have a joint, that's part of our joint use agreement with uh, the school board, um, and so that is one of the key components of why these two bodies need to work together, because uh, the kids' safety um, is part of that joint agreement. It's the work that we do here together that keeps our kids safe. So we will continue to look into that, and we will take that feedback, and uh, crossing guards is top of mind for us. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Agakanian. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, uh, Mary Schultz, and all of my colleagues here. Um, first, uh, to Mr. Sullivan, uh, I really like your idea, and I think uh, tonight we're going to be talking about creating a center for entrepreneurship and innovation. I think um, 
working on one right now at my work, I can tell you that we also already have some of our brothers and sisters from the unions coming in talking about training, job opportunities. So once we get this subject off the ground, I think it'll be also a good center for, you know, not only creating, you know, ideas, incubating, but also having a center where people can come in and learn about trades. Trades are becoming very big. Um, you don't believe me, watch the last South Park episode when uh, with AI and how people in trade now are kind of in demand now. So, um, also, uh, I love the fact that you have announcements. So you guys have announcements, we don't, but we give out gifts to our <laughs> <laughs> So try to copy that. Yeah, I, I just give them the gift of my deadpan humor, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and in closing also, uh, I know it's a uh, topic that you're going to be discussing later with the resolution with the council, but I can tell you as someone who survived war, um, I'm from Iran, I grew up in the border of Kuwait in Iraq, and I was there when the war broke out. I lost a lot of my friends, uh, neighbors, it's not pretty. I still suffer from PTSD. And um, so I want everyone to be mindful about what's happening and be respectful, people on both sides, whichever side you're on. It's difficult. Unless you've lived through war like I have, uh, it's something that uh, it's undescribable. And, you know, I'm hoping that all of this will end soon. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Um, Vice Mayor Perez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am also very excited to be here with all of my colleagues, all of our staff, and all of you tonight who joined us on a Wednesday. Um, thank you to everybody who commented tonight, both in person and on the phone. As my colleague mentioned, as Councilmember Mullins mentioned, this is an upcoming agenda item on the ceasefire, so I won't say anything further other than to thank you for being here and continuing your advocacy. Um, I am looking forward to talking about school safety to both of our commenters who talked about what our school safety looks like both on the inside and the outside of our schools. So I look forward to talking about that. And I will be brief. So my only other thing is I, I agree with what all of my colleagues shared and what staff shared in working together and in getting ideas for that. But I do want to correct the record on something Mr. Schlossman said. The city of Burbank actually does not use Film LA for our film permits. We utilize FilmBurbankCalifornia.com, which is FilmBurbankCA.com. Apologies. So if you are interested in getting a film permit in the city of Burbank, that would be your avenue, and it's actually a little bit more cost effective. So consider filming in Burbank. And if you have any questions, thoughts about our website, we're right here. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, can they call 311 for that service? Or for yeah, Yes. Oh, you should add that. <laughs> well, I feel like Mr. McDougall would tell me it's not on the agenda, but what a wonderful idea, right? <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, President Weisberg, please. Well said, Vice Mayor Perez. Uh, a couple of things. So to Mr. Pimienta, I'm mispronouncing your name, but we had a chance to talk a little bit before the meeting, and um, for anybody who's watched a school board meeting recently, one of the constant conversations is the decline in enrollment. And it has nothing to do with the quality of education. Our teachers are amazing. Our schools are, are wonderful. It, it comes down to two things, uh, low birth rate and lack of affordability. And so the issue of affordable housing is intrinsically tied to successful school districts, climbing enrollment. And so I think it's a conversation that we as a uniform body should continue to have. And people might not make the connection between the two, but being able to afford to live in Burbank is vital to the, the success of the city and to the school district as a whole. So it was lovely to hear you come up. And it's not lovely because it's a bummer of a topic, but important, I think, for both governing bodies to continue this conversation and to look for solutions and work together. Um, and I commend the city for the work that they've already done and I know will continue to do. Um, Mr. Sullivan, thank you so much. I don't know where you are. Did he leave wisely? He may have left. But um, thank you. Um, it's a point well taken. We just went through our facilities master plan and are staring down the barrel of $1.2 billion of infrastructure repair that's needed. Um, and I know that, you know, who we choose to work with, you know, we use union 
exclusively in our district, and that's really, really important. Um, and we have a really wonderful CTE program, so internships, and, and I would love for us to reach out, um, Superintendent, to Mr. Sullivan to talk about any internship possibilities with um, IBW Local to see if there's anything we can do in regards to that. Um, let's see. Um, Ramek, we're going to talk. Thank you so much. We're going to continue talking about SROs later on, so I'll let that be temporarily. Um, Mr. Huerta, thank you so much for uh, bringing up this really, really important topic. I know Board Member Tabit, this has been something that she's been working on for two, four, six, eight years. <laughs> um, and it's uh, it's hugely important. I think it's something that falls by the wayside oftentimes when we think about school safety, but it's it's scary. And to uh, Cleric Ponser Kamkar's point, it can't just be for a little, it has to be for everyone. Um, to uh, the rest of our speakers who came and uh, spoke, obviously the school board is not taking up in the, the resolution, but I did want to say a couple of things, and I went back and forth a lot about saying anything. I'm probably the only person up here who has uh, lived for a substantial period of time in Israel. Um, and, you know, Dr. Agakanian said something that, that made me think he brought up, and this is not a knock against you at all. He talked about, you know, both sides. I don't think there are sides. I think that Israelis and Palestinians want the same thing. Uh, I think the Israeli government doesn't speak for Israelis. If you've um, watched the news in the past couple of days and seen thousands and thousands of Israelis pour into the street demanding Netanyahu stop these atrocities in their name, that gave me a lot of hope. Um, just as I know deep in my core that Hamas doesn't represent Palestinians. Um, and I think, you know, it seems semantic, but the language we choose is so important, right? So that we don't perpetuate Islamophobia and we don't perpetuate anti-Semitism. Because um, for those of you who are personally touched by this, you understand that this is about human life. This isn't about the, maybe the words we're choosing to describe it. But we also know, because for those of us who have been subject to anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, that the words that people use are weapons. And that what's happening these tens of thousands of deaths have been weaponized for political gain. Um, and so I just want to tell you that, you know, as somebody who is impacted in a different way, I have not lost family, I have not lost friends. Um, I don't know a single Palestinian who could say the same right now. But that it is something that weighs on me deeply, that I think about constantly, um, and that I know, to echo Dr. Paramo, that we would never have intentionally excluded a group of people at all. Um, I feel like what you might be referencing is Ukraine, but I could be wrong. I don't know if we issued, but we should talk offline and figure out, I think it'd be really helpful to get some feedback on how we can create more inclusive language that doesn't feel like cherry picking, because if you're, we just, we don't know what we don't know, but it's so important. So I would also ask that like, don't wait, reach out to us, reach out to Dr. Pramo. Don't wait, you don't, uh-oh, uh, kidding. Um, so let's let's talk offline about it. And, and this is a great, to echo uh, board member Ferguson, it's a great learning opportunity for us um, to get better at our communication. I think we've done a great job this year, but we have a long way to go. So um, thank you to everybody. I know it is scary and um, difficult to come up and talk about something that is such a hot button issue right now, but, um, I'm always, I always feel very inspired and motivated to, because I, I feel like we can't have this dialogue. So thank you for that. Uh, that's it. Thank you, President Weisberg. I can see why y'all made her president. Seriously, thank you. I, <laughs> no, I, I, I can't say too much because this will be an agenda item coming back to council, but I just want to um, thank all of our commenters and, and, and of course your response, Dr. Weisberg. Um, I think there is a lot of positive conversation to be had. And because we'll be talking about it, I'll leave my response uh, there. Uh, Mr. Pimienta, I um, wanted to just make sure that you saw, I believe it's Tuesday, April 23rd, Mr. City Manager, we will be talking about tenant protections again. So Tuesday, April 23rd, 6 p.m., City Council Chamber. I recommend that you and anyone interested in the topic be there and share your voice, and I'm sure you will. Looking forward to it. Um, I want to thank everyone who, who came down tonight, everyone who called in. And really, my last response is both to the public and to my colleagues. Um, 
it's bittersweet to say that this will be my last joint meeting with the City Council and the Board of Education, but I believe in the power of these meetings. Um, when I took office with Councilmember Anthony, uh, to my recollection, we weren't meeting regularly for a variety of reasons. We also had COVID to deal with, but these meetings weren't happening. And when I look at everyone who's here tonight, everyone who's watching, all of us present, we're all committed to doing everything that we can to create a positive experience for Burbank students and teachers, staff, and families across this community. And I think that right now, when you look across the country, whether it's uh, Washington, D.C., or even in Sacramento, and even other communities not that far from here, you see a lot of rancor and divisiveness and an inability to govern effectively. And I think that in Burbank, we're very blessed to have not one but two bodies that have shown time and again an ability to overcome our differences, to problem solve together, to rise above the rhetoric, and to find good solutions. I am more encouraged than ever that Burbank does it the right way. And I think we are really a beacon, a model for the rest of the region, that when you put good people together with the hearts of public servants, talented staff, and we come together to solve problems, there's nothing we can't accomplish. So really an honor to be here tonight. And with that, let's, uh, let's get to business. Uh, before that, um, uh, Mayor Schultz, we can have a monthly meeting uh, we was, every month if you want to join. Well, I, I, I'm all for it. What, what, what do you, Don't I make this the last one. It's not over yet. Hold on. I, <laughs> you are getting absolute dagger eyes from our staff. I, I, I will say what, one more comment because you... You, 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 got, you prompted me there, Dr. Agakanian. No, in all seriousness to my colleagues, as we're going through our agenda items tonight, just keep in mind, and I'm saying this for the benefit of the community, we do have a regular subcommittee, a joint subcommittee comprised of the school board president, vice president, the mayor, the vice mayor, the city manager, and the superintendent. So we may not solve every issue tonight, but if we have recommendations for further discussion and study by that subcommittee as we're talking about each item, I think that's a great way to structure our thinking. See, don't, you, don't, you, don't want to, you don't want to prompt me for more. I can keep going. It's like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> okay. We have six items on this evening's agenda, and the first report is an update on Burbank Water and Power's partnership initiatives with the Burbank Unified uh, School District. I welcome Mr. Riyad Slayman, uh, Assistant General Manager of Electric Services at Burbank Water and Power, as well as uh, uh, Drew Johnstone, our Sustainability Officer. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council, and School Board. My name is Drew Johnstone. I'm the Sustainability Officer for Burbank Water and Power. And tonight, I'm representing numerous divisions within uh, Burbank Water and Power to talk about our partnerships with Burbank Unified School District. And I'll go through a few of the examples of initiatives that are alive and well today. Starting off with programs that directly benefit teachers, students, and their parents or guardians. Do you have a slideshow? Cool. You can go to the next slide. For years, BWP has sponsored middle school students' participation in a program called LivingWise, which provides sixth grade teachers with a curriculum about energy and water efficiency concepts and the importance of conservation. Each school year, over a thousand students receive kits to take home with energy and water saving devices, such as LED light bulbs, like the one I have here, smart power strips, and shower heads, aerators, and toilet leak detection kits. When kids take these home and install them with their parents, we estimate energy and water savings to the tune of 98,000 kilowatt hours and 3.1 million gallons of water. That's equivalent to the electricity needed to power 15 homes for a year and the water consumption of 28 homes a year. These quantifiable savings are certainly worth celebrating and we do, uh, but the empowering experience that the kids receive through the Living Wise program that help establish habits that improve sustainability in their lives that they can take with them for years to come. That's perhaps the most important. We want to thank the students for these beautiful thank you cards that we receive at the end of each school year. And today we actually got a video, or not to say this year, we got a video of a student who was talking about how they implemented the kits in their home. And we want to thank the principals and sixth grade teachers at Luther Burbank, John Muir and Dolores Huerta for their involvement. Next up is a program from the National Academy Foundation referred to as NAF. It brings educational programs to schools to teach subjects that aren't a part of most standard curricula, such as courses in medicine, engineering, and business. These specialized tracks focus on preparing students for the real world, like experiencing job interviews, going on field trips, and providing hands-on work experience and internships. 
BWP supports the NAF academies by hosting annual field trips, giving tours of our campus, and BWP staff give presentations on their careers at our utility in fields like engineering, administration, electrician work, pipe fitting, and other in-demand trade tech careers that align with the students' interests. Next slide, please. We're happy to host BWP campus visits, but in addition, every February, BWP field crews from our line workers, electricians, and water operations sections participate in BUSD career technical education days at Burbank and John Burroughs high schools. CTE days are an opportunity for students to be exposed to a variety of in-demand, high-paying career paths and learn about the training required to obtain entry-level positions and apprenticeships once they graduate high school. I also wanna mention that BWP is currently providing after school internships to BUSD students through the Workability Program. Next slide, please. Switching gears a bit to operational efficiencies thanks to our collaboration and infrastructure. It's at the city's public works yard where BUSD fuels its school vehicles. BUSD pays the discounted rate that the city purchased the fuel for, which saves BUSD about $15,000 per year. And the administrative time to procure the fuel, run monthly reports to reconcile usage, and invoice BUSD is not charged to the district. The staff time and organizational resources have an estimated value of about $5,000. Next slide, please. Yeah. Dependable high-speed internet is a necessity, and BWP has supported the district with the fiber backbone needed for internet for over 11 years. All Burbank Unified Schools are connected to one Burbank, which enables download and upload speeds of 10,000 megabits per second. And for reference, anything above 100 megabits per second is considered fast. Since 2012, BWP has provided the school district with a 98% discount on fiber services, which saves the district between $200,000 and $400,000 per year compared to the institutional or market rates. BWP also offers free citywide basic Wi-Fi service that students and other Burbank residents can access at no extra cost. We do see spikes in usage right before and after school, so we know students are taking advantage of it. Next slide, please. Solar energy. It's expected to make up a larger percentage of the energy generation need for Burbank. Our power supply team is actively seeking out utility scale uh, renewable contracts, typically outside of Burbank, because they're the most cost effective doing ground mounts. Um, but both BWP and the school would certainly like to see more solar in our community and on school campuses. Solar shade structures, for example, would provide much needed shade and of course, clean energy. To get the ball rolling, BWP hired a consultant to study the feasibility of solar on BUSD campuses and that study was shared with the district. It found that the top 10 BUSD sites can host in total about four megawatts of solar on shade structures. The cost is estimated to be about $22 million. BUSD can certainly consider purchasing or financing the solar and have it offset on site. Usage, lowering operational expenses, though paybacks would likely be in the 20 to 30 year range. Alternatively, since BWP has state mandates to generate renewables for our customers, we're open to partnering with BUSD in an arrangement where BWP would install, own, and maintain solar shade canopies on the campuses and have the systems be interconnected to our grid. The energy supplied to the, larger, the wider community would apply towards our statewide renewable mandates that we're working so hard to achieve. Opportunities are rare for large-scale solar within our city limits, so whether it's BUSD or BWP that invests in solar on campuses, we want to see it come to fruition. We look forward to continuing the dialogue with the district in the coming years to support more renewable energy within our community. With that, I thank you for the opportunity to present, and um, my colleague Rad and I are here to answer any questions you might have. Well, Mr. Johnstone, before I turn it over to President Weisberg, I just want to say if you have any shower heads in that goodie bag, we got to talk after. I, <laughs> I got a home improvement project with your name. I'm kidding. Right. President Weisberg, please. I don't, I don't have any home improvement projects. <laughs> um, just to thank you for the services that you have provided our students and our, our campuses. Um, and I have no doubt that Mr. Cantwell and Dr. Paramo will continue the conversation with you. But just thank you. And this is great because it gives me a nice overview of some things I didn't even know that you guys did for us. So that's fantastic. And Wonderful. I just always appreciate the updates. Do any of the other board members have? Ms. Ponser can come. Hi. Um, I always have questions. That's what you need to know about me. Um, so I have a question about uh, one thing that came up during our facilities master planning session and report 
um, was just the need for more greening of our campuses. And I know that that's a program that BWP offers for residential service in terms of trying to lower energy costs, et cetera. Is there any space to work together on, on something like that in terms of providing trees essentially to our campuses? I know we have a grant with um, tree people right now, but what else could we be doing together in that space? Yes, kudos and congrats to the district on receiving that grant with tree people. So that'll be a sort of feasibility study and planning exercise uh, for campus greening. Uh, we provide a letter of support for that and I'm really happy that it was awarded. Um, we do have a program called Energy Saving Trees where residents can get three free shade trees and uh, non-residential customers can also receive shade trees. So yeah, I think the school district would be a great um, participant in that program to provide shade trees. Um, one of the requirements of the program is that the trees are supposed to shade a building to offer cooling and air conditioning benefits, so the location is um, dependent on that. But we have a great one-stop shop website through the Arbor Day Foundation where you can put in your address. Um, it'll show you an aerial satellite image. You can select one of uh, 10 species of trees, put it on the map, and it'll estimate energy savings based on the location of the tree. And then you can order them, get them delivered to your property all through that website. On our website, uh, BWP, energy saving trees. Uh, uh, Dr. Agakanian and then board member Ferguson. <clears throat> so um, as far as all this, uh, the solar power and all the, are we, is the city capable, the grid line, is it capable of handling any kind of a, you know, surge by if we decide to put up these solar panels? Uh, the question always is raised of, do we have the infrastructure to support the extra energy if it's created? We had Sleeman, assistant general manager for electric services. Um, the short answer is yes, but I'm not going to give you the long answer. You know, so you're going to tell me what area of the city. So we do have uh, a project that we've had for the last 20 years, and we're going to have it for another 20 years, where we're converting the city uh, infrastructure to a higher voltage, which allows us to accept a lot more energy and distribute a lot more energy. Uh, in a dense area. So uh, the short answer is yes, we do. Uh, and we're able to extend that wherever we see big projects like this uh, happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the question would be, the idea would be that we would sell power back. We would produce power on campuses and then we'd sell back to BWP or just send it back to the grid. There would be three potential pathways, right. solar on campuses. Um, <clears throat> one, the school district could in invest either purchase it or mm -hmm. finance it, mm -hmm. um, have it offset on-site loads would be interconnected to the panel at the school, offset loads, any excess electricity would be sent back into the grid for some credit, it's called okay. solar net metering. Okay. Um, the second option would be for BWP to install, own, and maintain it, and it would be interconnected in front of the meter, so it would sort of bypass the school's usage and feed directly into the grid for the wider community. And the, the third potential option, which we haven't discussed yet, um, but it could be where the school district invests in the solar and we would work out a power purchase agreement where we would agree to purchase the energy from the district at a, at a given rate. Got it. So, I, and we currently purchase like reclaimed water from the city, right? It, it's not just piped to us, right? Okay. So that's where I would, I would really like us to work together on that. I think that there are plenty of opportunities for collaboration, things like that. And, and you guys ha hired a consultant. I didn't, you know, it's good to know. Um, so I, I think there are plenty of areas for collaboration. Having said that, we're still paying a lot for utility bills too. Uh, and so I want us to work together to reduce that overall when we're still paying each other. Uh, but, but to work to reduce costs across the board, because it does matter to us, a body that can't raise revenue in any way without uh, a 67% vote of the people. Um, so. Uh, I, I just want to flag that, not because it's, it's not in our interest. It's absolutely in our interest. And we are still paying off those solar panels that people see on our school sites. It was financed by the last bond. So uh, we have every interest to work in that, in that regard. But um, when we talk about working together, we're going to need to talk about, hey, we're paying for this. We're paying for this. How do we bring down costs overall for both bodies and both agencies? Um, so thank you on that front. I do want uh, to see if we can explore any additional partnerships with MWD. I, I know we're not in a drought, or we haven't, well, I know there was a snowpack story that I didn't get to read uh, yet, but um, around flipping some of our turf in the front ends of our schools in particular, uh, there's a lot of 
uh, non-drought tolerant, non, you know, California native plant species. We have to watch out about pollinators. We have kids that are allergic to bees, uh, things like that. But if there can be additional either square footage reimbursement rates or anything like that that we can work with you to work with MWD to get, wherever that exists, uh, I just would like to explore that if we can offline. Careful. Thank you for group. thank you for bringing that up. If I could just respond briefly, uh, MWD to just um, increase their incentive recently. They won a grant, so they increased the dollar per square foot. So if you're a Burbank customer, you can get up to four dollars per square foot to remove turf and replace it with California natives. It was three dollars. Now it's four dollars square foot. Mr. Cantwell. Good timing to uh, Smith. So it's really important it. for uh, residents or non-residential customers interested in this incentive to apply first. You have to um, send in your application and receive a reservation before starting any work. Okay. They need before photos, um, <laughs> and uh, they need to approve the landscape plan. It's not quite yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So thank you. That sounds great. And thank you to MWD for our partnership in that. Burbank's a member agency and has a vote on the board, so it's a significant uh, advantage for this community. So thank you for that. Great presentation. As Dr. Weisberg said, I learned a lot about some additional programs that you provide for our students and staff, and it's appreciated. Um, we had a speaker from the IED, DW. Thank you. Um, we always need professionals to help teach our uh, NAF Academy classes, so that would be a great way for them to jump in and help retired people that maybe want to get a CTE credential, which is not difficult to get, not to take anything away from anybody, but it's doable and always need that help, so that was awesome. I didn't realize that BWP was involved in our NAF Academy, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, and the fueling stations... Wow, that's huge. Um, we're, I mean, we're not a huge town, but our campuses are spread out, and uh, it's great. Uh, and does that include, I think we moved to electric, never mind, on our power mowers? Everything's electric now, or we're getting uh, there? We, we're not full electric now. Okay. Mike, please. No, we're not okay. uh, electrified yet. Sorry to bring that up. So thank you for Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that includes the gasoline for our power mowers, et cetera, as well. I would leave that to the district. Yep. Okay. Got the thumbs up. Thank you so much for all you do. Okay. Thank you, board members. Uh, council members, time for questions or comments. Who'd like to begin? Uh, council member Mullins. Um, thank you. I Great job. I think this is definitely demonstrates um, our partnership, our strong partnership. And I sound like the uh, superintendent and the city manager has, they have one more to add to the list with the water. So thank you, uh, board member Ferguson. Um, I do wanna make a comment regarding the career technical education. And this is such an excellent program to do early recruitment for our students and to also get them exposed to the job itself and see what if we can have them uh, as future city employees. I'm wondering if we track down um, who signs up for it or do we have any type of data or statistics of how successful the program, how many actually have taken advantage after they graduate or do we follow with them, we follow up with them in any way after um, they go through the program? I think I'll have to look into with our admin staff to see if we had any participants in the program actually join us at BWP in the future. Um, I'll have to find out. I don't have that information with me. Okay, but thank you. I, I would highly encourage you that to have um, kind of a log to find out who is interested, who signed up, who actually comes back to kind of find how successful the program, do we need to do more outreach? Because I assure you a lot of students would probably want to take advantage of this. Not everyone uh, wants to go to college after they graduate, so this will be a great program that we could follow up with them if you're not doing that already. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Takahashi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Johnstone, for that presentation. For those of you who don't know Mr. Johnstone, he is a fabulous uh, addition to our staff and has done a great job since day one. And I, I, I thought I knew about most of the programs that BWP was doing, and some of this was new to me too, so I really appreciate this presentation. 
Um, I like to, I look at this and I think, you know, BWP is quietly being awesome in the background. <laughs> um, so just to, to talk a little bit more about the solar, uh, since we're already on that topic, um, are there any uh, grants available that we can help uh, with either, if either the city installs a solar or the school installs a solar, that we can help use these grants to help pay for the installation versus uh, just having to front it ourselves? Potentially, we're always looking for grant opportunities. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of any off the top of my head, but we'll continue to look for them. But the incentive that is available now is a federal uh, tax credit from the Inflation Reduction Act. Okay. So that's 30% that, is, that didn't used to be available to nonprofits and government institutions, but it is now. It's called the Direct Payment Program. So that's 30%. And then there's also a 10% adder if you use domestically sourced uh, solar panels and, um, and other equipment. So that's something that we're looking into for our own projects. Yeah. That's, that's significant, 40%. Yeah, because right now there's such a, you know, there's a, um, such a push to pretty much you know, green everything in that we're seeing more and more opportunities for grants and funding for different initiatives. So if, if we have access in the city to know about grants that maybe the school district may not directly have access to, but maybe we do indirectly, um, to be able to partner with those, with those grants would be really helpful. Um, and then um, also I'm wondering for like more longer term plans, um, there has been some talk about a local solar network in the city. And I'm wondering if there's any, if there's thought about how the school district, if it were to, if there were to be um, solar installed in the district, how that would tie in in the long term for that, the local solar network. Like, um, there's a name for it. It's skipping, it's skipping my mind. Where it's like community. a solar farm, yeah. Community you know solar? What I'm talking about? Yeah. Virtual substation, is that yeah. what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, we, we have had talks about that. Uh, that does require an advanced amount of uh, planning and okay. coordination and having actually bidding it out a system that can control all of that. Last year, we did implement a TDMS, which is a transmission distribution management system, which is the first piece that you wouldn't want to have in place for something like that. And so I would look in the near future, we will be looking at that uh, as far as even uh, going out to residential, installing residential and being able to do that. So yes, okay. thank you. Yeah, I've been thinking if we're going to do such a large install of solar in the school district, that's, if that's the direction we're going, it'd be beneficial to make sure that we can somehow incorporate in long-term plans. So. Great. Um, and then I had some, kind of a general question about how you partner with the school. So um, I'm aware of the school district has the Eco Council that's very active. And then each individual school, many of them have sustainability groups or parents or groups that work on that. And then the, the high schools have ASB and Key Club and other sustainability groups. So how does BWP work together with these uh, advocacy and interest groups in the schools? Thank you so much for that question. I do attend the Eco Council meetings, um, so that's a great opportunity for me to connect with those members who are really passionate and hardworking. It's really a great group. Yeah. Um, and upcoming, we have a lot of Earth Day events in April, and one of them is the Eco Council Earth Day event at IKEA. So we'll have a prominent booth there great. with our Ford F-150 Lightning powering the sound stage, and I've got Yay. a um, really <laughs> awesome bike. And, uh, and so we're, you know, that's been a great um, collaboration. So yeah, when, when ideas come up through the Eco Council, we, we try to offer support um, where we can. Great. And um, thank you for reminding me about all the, the clubs at the schools. We haven't done too much with those clubs, so that's, I think, a good opportunity yeah. for more collaboration. Yeah, um, so my kids are in their 20s, and the youngest graduated high school three years ago. And there's just a lot of energy around sustainability in that age group. And so I think um, the folks in the Key Club, ASB, other groups, uh, I would, I'm sure they would have a lot of energy to be willing to, to be involved. Maybe not the career in sustainability, but being involved with, with local uh, efforts, for sure. Great. I presented at the Kiwanis Club a couple of weeks ago, and there were some key club members there. Mm -hmm. So it was great to see that collaboration. Right. Awesome. Um, so speaking of uh, uh, the students, and you were mentioning earlier about handing out um, shower heads and, and light bulbs and power strips, how can those of us who might not have those access those items after this meeting's <laughs> over? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Bourbon Quadrant Power does uh, give out light bulbs. If you need an LED light bulb, um, come visit us in our, our lobby, um, as well as uh, aerators and shower heads as well. Okay. So that was an investment we made a while back. We've got a stock of them. So yeah, Burbank Water and Power customers, um, you know, especially of older incandescent light bulbs, you know, got dimmable LEDs. And we're going to take them to all the Earth Day events in April. So Great. you'll be at the okay. Eco yeah, Council event and the Sustainable Burbank Commission event at the Community Garden. Um, yeah. So we'll see you there, and we'll bring some goodies to give away that save energy and water. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank oh, and you. also, I guess if you're 
uh, a resident and want to enroll in our home improvement program, that's where a specialized uh, energy specialist will come to the home and, and do full lighting retrofit, like replace bulbs, um, install those aerators and shower heads at no cost. And they'll also do, they'll, they'll help you go around uh, in, in your house and do a kind of an overview of where you could save. Yeah, and they right? do weatherization and air sealing and duct okay. sealing, AC tune-ups, a lot of great services. It's a really popular program. Awesome. Home improvement program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, President Weisberg, I believe Dr. Agakanian had a brief follow-up on this yeah, issue. Br brief follow-up, yes. It will be very brief. So um, I know that a lot of cities and counties are partnering up in projects of runoff rainwater, trying to... Are you hearing anything about that and Burbank working? I know that San Gabriel and San Bernardino, are, they're really seriously looking at working with the county and the city, creating a system where the rain runoff water goes, it cleans up, and there's a big talk about even the state level. Is there any anything you're hearing out there right now or not? There's a lot happening in the water space. You know, we, we focus a lot on water conservation here in Burbank since we don't have any groundwater rights. All the groundwater rights belong to the city of Los Angeles. So we don't collect massive amounts of rainwater. Um, however, we are, you know, looking, uh, collaborating with the Metropolitan Water District to increase water supplies. So looking at other investments in new reservoirs or um, we're doing a feasibility study for direct or indirect potable reuse. So we take wastewater and purify it to a level that satisfies drinking water needs. So that we're just doing a feasibility study right now on that. So we're, we've got a multi-pronged approach of looking to increase supply and conserving. <laughs> you, should, uh, you should watch the movie Chinatown. <laughs> on that... It's Chinatown. On that note, <laughs> Council Member Anthony, do you have any questions or comments? Um, it's true. That's what that movie was about. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I wanted to dig in just to, thank you for the presentation. This is great. I love this stuff. Uh, I wanted to dig in a little bit about um, the virtual substation that we talked about earlier. Um, so we did, we did the TDMS. We mentioned earlier there's a couple of options. If we were to build this on the BUSD lots, we could either tap it into the, um, the BWP grid pre-metering or post-metering. For a virtual substation, if we wanted to build out different solar installations across the city and have it be part of the network, which, which version of that would be better, pre-metering or post-metering? You typically want to tie in to the grid directly, not, not after the customer's meter, because you want those credits to be counted towards you as PCC one, which is what what, what the you know the credits that we're looking for, and those need to be tied into the grid directly as opposed to behind the customer's meter. That's our preference, and that's what would help <laughs> us uh, yeah. offset, obviously. Um, if we did it after the meter, would it, it? To me, it sounds effectively like we're simply charging BUSD and then giving them a rebate. So it's like. Here's some energy, and we'll give you a rebate based on how much it comes back. It seems like it's a two-step process versus just the first step pre-metering. Well, it would just be a net meter, which is what we have today. Okay. So the reason I bring that up is we have both bodies here. I'd like to get some consensus on this from, from our two different the, bodies. This isn't really agendized for oh, a power purchase agreement negotiation. Ah, okay. Then and I there's a great many other factors, including potential lease payment, mm -hmm. and it's it, also including they could become a generator subject to state regulation and their own. Um, th there's it really is due its own agenda. Okay, this, I'll do, this I'll doesn't do this. fall under one. I'll talk generally about power and what I see with net metering versus tying directly into the grid. Um, when a customer um, has a low, um, not low, but a, a, a comparatively low uh, liquid funds available. Uh, during a rainy season, a uh, cloudy season, the spike in price goes up because they're not able to get the rebates as readily available. Um, so that type of customer, um, I personally would prefer to have that 
that customer tie directly in pre-meter and then work out a purchasing agreement after the fact and negotiate. So that's just Mr. my own Mayor, personal preference. Mr. Mayor, this, this Please, is really Mr. beyond right. the agenda Very good. item. I am. I'm done. That's all I wanted to say. Um, one last thing. If you could, uh, we do have an event coming up for a 75-kilowatt iron flow battery. If you wanted to just let our board... Yes, thank you, sir. Um, we did, that was supposed to be Friday, but uh, because of the rains and uh, the thunderstorms, we had to delay that. We are looking at a May, perhaps a May date, but we'll be we'll be getting back to you about that. Thank you. Thank you. I believe um, uh, Dr. Ferguson had a had a follow up question. Not Dr. Ferguson, but I just <laughs> figure you're all doctors from Dr. Weisberg. Uh, definitely not. Um, well, first, uh, thank you very much. I don't know what a virtual substation is still or a virtual station is. And, and that's a part of, I think, where the collaboration can really start to, is if we could have a report at our body uh, so that we know what your water and power goals are, uh, I don't think anybody would be opposed. It's not my decision. It's Dr. Weisberg's and Dr. Ayakanian. Um, but, but some of this also, the, the t you know, uh, Mr. Anthony, uh, who I got to work with a lot last year, um, I, I laugh. You know, you're like, it's a two-step decision. It's a three-step decision, right? We have to decide to become customers first, right? Um, so, and we're being talked over at that moment, and I don't want that because we can really help inform this in, in a really good way and help you meet these goals, but we're not responsible for water and power generation. We have no idea. Uh, if you don't follow state policy, right, you have no idea what is being handed down, but this is where we can. So if, you know, if we could potentially have staff come to the board so that we can, you know, we are considering bond issues. We are considering this at all times. We can think with that in mind and be collaborators in that way. But speaking at the, at the meeting and trying to figure it out, like, I, I'm still going, what? <laughs> that you guys hired a consultant to review our sites? I didn't know that. So that's where I want to, I think there's so much opportunity for collaboration there. But if we could get some information at a baseline so we know what you guys are talking about, uh, <laughs> that, would, that would be a, a, kind of a good first step. Thank you, board member. He's still a doctor in my eyes, so you can keep the title. Uh, Vice Mayor Perez, you look like you're itching with a question. I was, but my colleagues asked a lot of my questions. Great minds think alike. Um, I just have one left. Um, when we're looking at, and, and Mr. Johnson kind of alluded to this, when we're looking at applying for grants, because all of the things that we'd like to do, be it landscaping, be it solar panels, cost money. It, are there any ways that we can apply for grants together a, as a school district and uh, the city? And I, I don't know if you've seen examples of that as you look at them. I'm not following grants, federal grants that closely, <laughs> but if you've seen anything in that vein and if it's beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of granting agencies love to see collaboration between multiple uh, agencies or jurisdictions, uh, between government and non-governmental organizations, community-based organizations and school districts. So I think we'd have a really strong application if the opportunity arises to partner. In the realm of, of energy, have we applied for any grants together in the past? Since I've been at the utility, we've provided letters of support for grants that the district has applied for. Um, so that's the extent so far that I know. But we're, we'd certainly be open to it. Thank you. More food for thought for staff. Um, and then I, I, that is my one and only question. All I will say is I do have my shower head, my lights. <laughs> I don't know what you all have been doing. I have all my supplies. I, I went over as a good BWP customer to the kiosk to ask for my light bulb and my shower head, which is great, by the way. You can also get the um, water, the gardening, or yeah, the watering um, hose. Yeah, yeah. What about that plastic green thing you were giving away? Oh, that's a compost bucket. A compost bin. We do in our lobby. Yes. If you're interested in <laughs> water efficiency or compost, come to the city of Burbank. We probably got a department for that. Go to the Burbank Water and Power Desk. They, well, yeah, they will. They will hook right. you up. Um, and then I guess since we're talking about recommendations, if you love Chinatown, you should read Cadillac Desert. It's a great book. I'm currently reading that book. There you go. <laughs> Anything else, Vice Mayor? Okay, um, so I just want to thank staff for the comprehensive presentation. Most of my questions have been asked. I have just a couple. Um, city fueling stations, that was slide number five. You don't need to show it necessarily, but my question is this. The city is looking at the electrification of our fleet and phasing out fossil fuel combustion vehicles. So is there, 
are there conversations underway to have uh, uh, charging sharing, charging resource sharing with the school district, especially as you know, 20 years from now, we look towards the day where we may not have gas powered cars, at least not to the prevalence we do today. Yeah, we should open you know those discussions. You know, we have a fleet that we're electrifying. Um, all fleets in the state of California are electrifying through the Advanced Clean Fleets Regulation. Um, so we are certainly partners for any customer in Burbank who are looking to install that infrastructure because they need to come up to come to Wonderful. us for service planning and um, some design work. So and we have an incentive program as well for um, both residential and non-residential customers looking to add chargers. So, yeah, we will certainly be a partner when the district's ready to electrify. It, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. McDougall, Mr. Hess, uh, I mean, we can take a vote, but it sounds like if, the, if both bodies through consent give that direction tonight, perhaps we can open those conversations. We can do a vote if it's needed. What exactly would you be voting on? Well, it's from what I'm what I am reading from Mr. Johnstone's response is that we have not yet had conversations about sharing power charging infrastructure. And well, so, so so even the city pays a utility bill to be the BWP. So there's a complex relationship between customer and utility. There are anti-subsidy requirements amongst ratepayers. So it's kind of a, a complicated um, conversation when we talk about sharing and the respective responsibilities of our staff. So um, I'm not sure I, what you're talking I, about. I guess vote. my question is, I would like to give direction tonight for the city, water and power, uh, the school district to at least commence those conversations. Do you need a vote by these two bodies to make that happen? Can you, because I'm sensing pretty unanimous consent across all my colleagues here. Can we just give this direction now in the form of a comment? I'm hearing that direction was received. Wonderful. I heard the same thing. That was, gosh, that was, uh, that was incredible. Okay. Um, Next up, I had um, One Burbank, which has been a very dependable uh, fiber optic network that we've provided uh, to uh, BUSD facilities. Uh, we get this question all the time about what we're doing to expand uh, the capacity of that program for you know families that live here in town. Uh, if I recall correctly, I believe we had a grant to conduct a feasibility study on, on extending the, the capacity of that network. Do we have any update we can provide today? That's correct. Um, we did receive a grant to look into the feasibility of uh, fiber to the premise or the home. Um, I don't have an update tonight, but our staff will be presenting to our board at the April board meeting okay. on, on the, the outcome of that study. If I could, Mr. Mayor, that report just concluded. So I just got a briefing on it last week. So uh, like uh, Mr. Johnson said, uh, we are going to be coming back with that and that will come back to council probably this summer. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and then the uh, the last, it's more of a comment, really not a question, but with regards to the solar study, I was aware that the study was done, but I obviously haven't seen the findings myself. Um, it would seem to me of the three options that you laid out, Mr. Johnstone, I, I don't know which option is going to be the best, nor would I presume to suggest what's best for the school district, but I would like to see some forward momentum on that. So I, what I heard from my colleagues was pretty unanimous direction to both our staffs to continue those conversations, but boil it down. Right now, we're talking at the very abstract large level I think we need to get more granular and figure out what this would look like so I guess my question Dr. Paramo is who's the point person at BUSD who's working with water and power on this Mr. Cantwell ah right there to your left I like that uh, and uh, Mr. Johnstone are you the point person for water and power or one of them I am yeah we've had meetings <laughs> so what I'd like to what I'd like to suggest with the concurrence of my colleagues is that the next joint subcommittee meeting um, I'd love to have at least a, an agenda item continuing that conversation and getting a little more, more granular on you know of the three options is there one that we think could be most feasible are there some that we just don't think will work for the district or water and power so uh, Mr. May also add option four free <laughs> you can have, you can bring as many options as you want, uh, but I would like that agenda item. I see concurrence among everyone, so great. All right, any other comments, questions? No? All right, thank you, thank you both very much for the presentation. Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. All right, next up we have our second report of the evening. This is an update on campus safety efforts. At this time, I welcome Burbank Unified School District Superintendent John Paramo to begin the report. Thank you so much. If we can get the PowerPoint, that would be great.
Thank you. Uh, as the city knows, we had uh, a few safety concerns at our school last year. And in all honesty, it was uh, a little bit scary on the district's part. And uh, we put into force immediately uh, an assessment of how we can improve security at our schools to ensure to our families that we are doing the absolute best for their kids. Uh, next slide. Before I get into a lot of what we've done, I, I really truly want to acknowledge how expedient the city was in responding to us to collaborate and to figure out how to best serve our kids. Uh, that included uh, city council members, that included uh, Burbank Police Department, Burbank Fire Department. Uh, the entire team got together with district staff. We walked sites. Uh, and it was a really good feeling. It was a really good feeling for me, and I felt that everyone there was truly invested. And I think as a result of that, you will see that we have put into place several things that are pretty monumental in trying to make sure that our kids are safe at all times. Next slide. So our initial response was uh, to take our both comprehensive sites and to uh, do something that was not easy to do, and that is to have a single point of entrance for our students. When you have multiple points of entrance, what happens is you don't have all the staffing or the proper staffing to ensure that it is being monitored appropriately. Now, Burroughs had a little bit of a head start with that. They had began that process earlier, but it was a big deal for Burbank. Uh, and I know it was a big deal for the parents in that community, but I got to tell you, uh, as expected, our parent community really stepped up and they really, truly were supportive. Uh, I got tons of email about concerns of uh, what if they're late? What if they don't get to class on time? So we were compassionate and we had about three or four weeks of a transition period where uh, we weren't as strict about uh, if you were a couple minutes late because everybody was getting used to it. But we don't need that anymore. Uh, kids are, are coming in through Third Street and going through the main gate and we are not having those attendance issues or tardiness. So thank you to the kids and thank you to the community. Every student at the high school is expected to wear a lanyard or to have their ID card accessible. Uh, that went over a little bit um, more smoothly at one school than the other. However, we're making huge strides in this area. And what I have told our principals is that this is not going away. This is going to be something that is just how we do things in Burbank, and kids will adjust. And I truly believe that they will, and we're seeing progress in that, uh, in that area. Uh, when kids enter a uh, school site, they are um, vetted in one of two ways. They are either, either going through a Raptor system or they are um, individually getting checked with their ID. Now, uh, and full transparency, the reason why I can't raptor every student is that the system requires a student to go through a two-step process. And that is time-consuming, and it is prohibiting us from getting every kid through raptor. So we are working with the company. They are working with us uh, as a client that's asking for a custom uh, modification to the system. They recognize that there's a huge potential for other school districts buying this product if we can solve this issue. So they are motivated to help us and we are working through that with them. Uh, another uh, feature that we did immediately was uh, because of declining enrollment, uh, we were able to move all the classes that were across the street in the bungalows move all those classrooms onto the main campus. So prior to that, at every 55 minutes, you had about 1,000 kids, 1,200 kids walking from the bungalow back to the main campus or, or vice versa. That does not happen anymore. So everybody is situated on the main campus and during passing periods, they are going to class that is on the main campus. So that is huge for us. Uh, and it was a huge deal in terms of safety. Now, for Burbank High School, I, I got to tell you, uh, it was um, 
like trying to solve a Rubik's cube for me because I've never been able to do it. But that door that leads from the parking lot onto the main campus, it, it took us a while to figure out how we were going to address that issue because that is a safety door. It's a fire door. So you have to have a push door mechanism so kids can get out of the parking lot if there were a fire. The problem is, is once they push that door, you're on main campus and anybody could have access. So we uh, worked with our partners and we got a lot of feedback and we found a solution, which was to um, segregate that area with wrought iron fencing. So when a student pushes in there, they're in a pretty sizable square box and the only way out of that box is to exit the door that's on the promenade or third street therefore they can't get onto main campus and must go through the front entrance in order to actually get into school so uh, we do have a picture of that if we can uh, advance the slide uh, you can see right there that uh, those those uh, doors uh, that are more solid those are kept locked uh, so kids can't enter the main campus. If they push through the door from the parking lot, they must exit on the promenade, promenade which is on 3rd Street. Uh, so I feel like we found a perfect solution for that problem. Uh, next slide. This is the most problematic area on the campus at Burbank High School. That is the building that is on the promenade on 3rd Street. Those doors must remain open. It is a fire hazard if they were locked. They need to push out. The problem is, is that it is a perfect exit for a student who doesn't want to be in class. They can push the door, come out. Uh, of course, we've always had staff stationed there. But if someone gets a call because of an emergency and they're run away from the door to take care of whatever's happening on campus, that door goes unsupervised and kids get out. It's also an opportunity for, for people who don't belong on campus to get in. So this, uh, this was uh, really, really difficult. I, I'll tell you what we're doing there uh, and explain that uh, we worked with uh, our city partners to try to find a solution, and it's just really difficult. It's really hard to do that. We talked about a turnstile. We talked about several other things, and it's just... Uh, it's just problematic. So right now what's going on and that on those doors is that they're all alarmed. So if you're going to exit that door, it's going to set off an alarm. So if it's in between classes, we're going to find you and we're going to know who you are mm -hmm. because we also have cameras installed there. So we get the notification because the alarm goes off. It's very loud. And we also have the cameras. Now, it took a, a several weeks before they realize they're not going to get away with this, but it, it's starting to work out and we're starting to see progress there. So this is 45 days in. Uh, if you look at the next slide, sorry. You can see we're continuing to work with the Raptor team, trying to eliminate a two-step process to a one-step process. Uh, second bullet, uh, in order to process more kids, we have uh, dispatched more Chromebooks. We figured out that Chromebooks work exceedingly faster than a laptop. That took us a, a, some uh, trial and error, but we have managed to uh, figure that piece out. We have closed off the subterranean parking uh, at Burbank High School. Uh, that lower level was um, a popular spot for our transient community and was uh, causing some safety issues. So we put gating on there to close that, and then we programmed the elevator to not be able to go to the to the lower level. So the elevator will only go to to the main level and one level up, but it won't go uh, to the lower level. Um, and so we programmed that. And at JBHS, we are completing uh, the last of the cameras. So uh, John Burroughs High School is fully secured with um, surve surveillance. Uh, adjustments to security after 90 days. Uh, again, we have alarmed the building two, which we showed you a picture of. We have cameras installed there. Burbank High, about three years ago, updated their surveillance system, but it was only 70% complete. They didn't have, we didn't have the funding to do the whole thing. That is what is happening now. Um, the, the plans have been made, 
the purchases have been made and we are waiting to get the cameras to install. They will be installed so that next school year, Burbank High School will be fully uh, equipped with cameras and surveillance. And lastly, at John Burroughs High School, in order to make sure that there was adequate overlap between assignments for people who are campus security, uh, we had to make some adjustments with their schedule so that there was no downtime or in-between time where we would have a loss of a person that would be manning a gate. So uh, those are some adjustments we made there. When it comes to uh, issues regarding sexual assault, sexual harassment, bullying, uh, or hate speech, we have put protocols in place that have occurred all year this year. And what I would start with is, is to tell the community that anytime we have an issue on any of the topics I just um, laid out for you, they we have a uniformed coding system. So if we have a violation of a sexual assault, it is given a specific code and an entry is made. If it is bullying, there's a separate code. If there's sexual harassment, there's a separate code. So at the 10-week mark of every semester, we run the data and we pull the data by code and we produce that on an Excel sheet. And the exercise we go through in our superintendent's cabinet is that we are reviewing those violations that gives us a barometer as to where we are uh, across the district in terms of these issues. It also allows us to read through uh, the steps that were taken to make sure that they were handled appropriately. Uh, and if modifications need to be made or we need to follow up, we're able to do that. That data is then sent to our Board of Education. So the Board of Education is aware and can see what the violations are. The data includes the school that happened, what the violation was, and how it was handled. So our board is informed. Now that happens at the 10 week, it happens at the 15 week, and it happens at the 20 week. When police need to be involved, we don't hesitate to do that. And the response there is always amazing. So that is what we're doing to monitor sexual harassment uh, and sexual assault. So uh, items for discussion, uh, what I would say is that we are continuing to do two things is one, work with Raptor to try to solve this problem, but also looking at other products. We're not committed to one and I don't have a contract um, or committed to a contract uh, that extends beyond the year. Uh, we're continuing our efforts to build a uh, culture of wearing lanyards, and I'm telling you that that has gone down to middle school now, where all our middle school kids are expected to wear a lanyard and uh, their ID. So if it starts in middle school, it's not going to be a huge adjustment when they get to high school. Um, we're looking at John Burroughs High School. If you think about the facility, in order to in order for kids to go through that main entrance, that hallway is very, very tight. And so it bogs down the school's ability to get kids in at uh, a faster pace. So for boroughs only, we may be looking at next year two points of entry uh, and say ninth and 10th graders have to enter through the front of campus, 11th and 12th through Bear, Bear Alley, or I think it's Bear Alley. Yeah, so we're, we're looking into that. Uh, and also, uh, I put down here discussion on school resource officers. I want to uh, publicly... Uh, thank the city, uh, specifically the Burbank Police Department. Uh, Officer Roberts is an amazing human. Um, I think that just on child abuse reporting only, there is enough work for another full-time SRO. Uh, and because I think that Officer Roberts is... Um, so good at what she does. If there were a person that would be concentrated on child abuse reporting, that would give her the ability to be more visible and accessible on the campuses. So uh, I've uh, spoken to our board president about this and we're uh, open to any discussion about that uh, as we proceed. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Paramo, I believe we also have some representatives from Burbank Police Department. Um, first, I will call up uh, Lieutenant Claudio uh, Losaco uh, to present an overview of sexual assault report response and protocols.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, board members and city council staff. Claudio Osako, uh, Lieutenant uh, overseeing our investigations division, which includes our SRO program. Uh, I'm specifically gonna talk to you about uh, sexual assault and sexual assault response protocols and reporting. Uh, when I'm done, I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, that anyone might have. Uh, first of all, I want to stress that sexual assault uh, reporting and investigations are extremely important to us, and uh, we take them extremely seriously, and significant resources are invested in handling those appropriately at, at every turn. Uh, each report is going to include a significant time and effort on our behalf. We interview the victim, obviously, any witnesses, uh, the suspect eventually will be interviewed, and then we will comb through any evidence that is uh, pertinent to the investigation. And oftentimes, uh, the evidence that we look through is what really is uh, most important, but it also takes a lot of time. Uh, victims of sexual assault, if they report it in a timely manner, we uh, facilitate a uh, sexual uh, assault with a forensic examination for them, and that's free of charge to them. Uh, the city pays for that, the police department pays for it, and oftentimes we're able to seek reimbursement through the state. But at every uh, time, as long as it's timely reported, there are some uh, particulars about uh, late reporting where uh, forensic exams are not possible, but we do offer those. Uh, we also offer by law and by city or department policy uh, an advocate to sit with the victim if so, if they choose. Uh, they can have somebody of their choosing come in, or we can provide somebody that we have uh, at the station. All the cases that uh, turn out to look like they may be a crime are presented to a prosecutor. It would either be the district attorney's office in felony cases, uh, or uh, misdemeanor cases, uh, the city attorney's office. If the suspect in the crime is a juvenile, it automatically would go to the DA's office for uh, filing. I want to make it clear, because sometimes folks are confused by this, the police department has no, um, does not make a filing decision. We gather the facts, the evidence, and uh, make a report, and then we provide it to the prosecuting, prosecutor, prosecution agency, and they make the final determination. They can either uh, file the case, reject the case, or send it back to us in some, uh, sometimes for further uh, investigation if they feel that there's other stuff that can be done. Uh, we follow through all the prosecutions from beginning to end. So if the case is filed, that's not the end of our involvement. Uh, once the case is filed, there's obviously, there's still a lot of things that have to happen uh, if, for the case to be adjudicated. So we follow through with that with our investigators and officers uh, all the way through. Um, often cases of sexual assault are not filed by the DA's office or the city attorney. And I want to stress that that does not mean that the sexual assault did not occur. It just means that the prosecutor does not feel that they can prove the case uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a big difference. Uh, that's a really, really high standard. Uh, any attorney will tell you that. To meet that standard is very difficult, to, to say the least. And oftentimes, we will have a case where we believe the person likely did it, but likely is not the standard in criminal court. So we will have victims who feel, uh, again, victimized by the system because the case was not prosecuted. But it does not mean that the case, uh, the, ca the uh, crime did not occur. It just means it didn't meet the burden of proof. Uh, obviously, each of these cases are unique, and each one requires its own tools and investigative uh, prowess. So uh, we, I, I'm just here to tell you that I want to make sure everyone understands that we put a lot of effort in these, in these cases, and a lot of them uh, are unique, and we uh, do different things to try to prove them, uh, but we're spending a lot of time on these cases. We're not pushing them off to the side. We're not uh, really able to speak, and this sometimes is very difficult for the community to understand. We're not able to speak to the specifics of certain cases. There's privacy issues and then prosecu prosecution issues with us publicly discussing cases. Uh, you know, I was at a school board meeting last year, or early, yeah, it was last year, and there was some very uh, specifics uh, brought up and spoken about, and it was really hard for, for me and for Sergeant Lawfer to sit uh, and listen and not be able to respond directly to a lot of those folks. Um, so please understand that it's really difficult for us in those cases, but we need to protect not only the victim, but also uh, the person that's being accused. And uh, finally, uh, uh, we do have a detective that's assigned to uh, sex registrant monitoring. So every sex registrant that resides or is transient in our city has to register. Um, if they're transient, they have to register once a month. 
If they live in town and they have an address, they have to register once a year. And we actively monitor those people. And if they fail to register, we hold them accountable. Uh, with that, that concludes my uh, presentation. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions from uh, either body or staff. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Lasako. Um, what I'm going to ask, uh, just to maintain the order of the conversation, is if you wouldn't mind grabbing a seat up here near the front. We're going to hear from uh, Lieutenant Frommer and uh, Sergeant Lawfer, and then once you've all presented, we'll go with questions and comments. Sure. So, I'll thanks. call up uh, uh, Lieutenant John Frommer. He's going to talk about traffic. Great. Thank you, and welcome back, Lieutenant. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, and BUSD Board Members, thank you. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, about traffic safety at the schools. Uh, basically, I think I can uh, get support from the chief when I could talk about, for those of you who don't know me, I'm known for my brevity and ability <laughs> to quickly get to the point. Um, it's a running joke in the school. Um, we're aware of all the schools that we have. We have our elementary, junior high, and high schools. We have our BUSD alternate uh, school locations. And we also have some private schools. And oddly enough, we have a lot, uh, more than I would have thought possible looking through the internet if you just Google private preschools. So we have several school campuses and we have several places throughout the city uh, where you have small children who are coming together for education. Uh, just to let you know when we start the school year, if you don't mind, uh, would we be able to pull up the PowerPoint? Okay, I'll have to ask for the next slide. Um, if you can just go to uh, Traffic Bureau Responsibilities. So here, this is what we assign specifically to the motor officers who work for the Traffic Bureau. Um, we have 12 motor officers assigned to my bureau. I also have two uh, DUI officers that uh, work primarily at night, so you won't see them around the school campuses. Their job is to meet with the school officials. That's what the administration primarily with the principal and anybody else in the administration that would like to discuss traffic safety. Unfortunately, we have a large amount of schools. I don't have that many motor officers, so we assign two to three officers to, to the, uh, we assign an officer to two or three schools. So it's quite a bit to handle, especially on a weekly or daily basis. Uh, this is the opportunity for everybody to come together and identify traffic safety concerns. So what we'd like to see is from our officers have that face-to-face -face contact and at the same time from the school please be open and honest about what you're facing at your schools because every school is unique every school is different uh, so we're always dealing with different attributes at the schools especially especially with traffic safety um, just to understand how the officers approach the beginning of a school year we try to be fair to parents that are new to the school system to be usd specifically um, they may not know all the traffic patterns or the rules. So what we do is we take an educational approach. Um, after a time period of two to four weeks, we will take an enforcement stance where we continue to see the same violations. The officers will start issuing actual citations where people have to go to court and answer for bad driving. If you could uh, go to the next slide, please. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but just to give you, this, this is just a handful of violations that we deal with at, a, at the schools, and schools have the morning drop-off, they have the afternoon pickup, but in between that at our elementary schools, we also have the early bird and late bird kindergarten TK schools, or classes. Not every elementary school has the same amount of those classes or the children uh, represented in those classes. Uh, however, some schools have a large... Uh, enrollment for uh, TK and kindergarten. Uh, just to touch on some that cause most of our issues. So the, the parents that park in a valet zone. Um, that valet zone is meant to bring some type of order to the schools. We would prefer that the parents drop their children off and wave goodbye and drive away, allowing an orderly flow of traffic to prevent congestion. However, a lot of parents still like to walk their children to the classroom and they will leave their car in our valet zone. So it kind of defeats the purpose of having that flow of traffic. Um, we also have people that will double park. This is, I'll touch on this in an, uh, the following slide. That's one of our biggest issues. The people that will double park actually tend to let their children out in the street. So whether it be on the side of the sidewalk or out in the traffic lane itself, the issue becomes 
several parents become very impatient when they see a car stopped in the traffic lane. So what they will do is try to drive around, frequently pu putting them in the opposing lane of traffic. Uh, what we don't like is that you also have children crossing the street. Some parents will park on the opposite side of the street. Kids have to walk from both sides. Uh, when the cars are passing that double park car, they don't see that there's children actually going to pass in front of that car into the other traffic lane. Uh, so we don't want that conflict between a vehicle and a child or any of our students. Um, the other one is failing to obey the crossing guard. Uh, the crossing guards are there for a reason, but we uh, frequently get uh, rushing parents getting, uh, don't want to be late dropping their children off. So they will push the limits on uh, what is safe when you're driving on the roadways. And but basically, you're putting that crossing guard and the children in jeopardy if you don't abide by the stop signs or the crossing guard giving direction themselves. Uh, the next slide, please. I went through this, but just to touch on this, this is going to add to you. This is the double parking where you're stopping in the traffic lane. You add to congestion, you stop the desired flow of traffic, you're passing in cars behind them that want to pass are now in the opposing traffic lane. Children are frequently, if you could tell from this photo, the child's going to be let out into the street side, okay, which is not what we ever want. And then you have reduced visibility. Just think about pulling up onto this street. You have 50 to 100 cars. Now you have cars blocking traffic lanes. You have cars coming in the other direction, and now you have children all over your street. Uh, visibility is horrible for a driver uh, in these types of conditions. So if we can keep that valet program running and operating smoothly, we reduce the potential for all these problems. Um, I'll have you hit play in a second. Uh, I have a video to show. This is just the educational approach that we like to take. This is one portion of the Traffic Bureau that I'd like to do more work with. We would like to actually co uh, collaborate with the schools on the topics that you think are going to be important. Again, this may involve individual principals for the individual unique problems at each school campus. But then it's upon us to collaborate with them and put that safety message out and get these videos both up on websites for the school and get that up on our, our website for our police department as well as working with our city PIO because we have a lot of great folks uh, in our PIO department. You'll be hearing from Lieutenant Green in a little bit, but he has Sergeant Turner that works for him. They do a phenomenal job assisting us with getting these messages out. It's just we need the time to put these important messages together. Okay. Um, would it be able to play? Okay, and then continuing the following two slides, I'm, I won't go through these. Uh, we will get through this, but these are going to be additional educational topics that we touch on. Uh, we can provide these to each of the schools. We put them on our websites. We discuss this with parents. Uh, we have for children walking to school, for children biking to school, if you see the slide here. Uh, we work with uh, AAA is phenomenal, phenomenal about producing educational pamphlets and handouts that we we have all of these at the Burbank Police Department and they're accessible to anybody in the community. And then on the next slide, then we have our back to school safety tips for parents that are actually gonna drive their children to school. If you know the makeup of our schools, we are completely built out city and we don't have schools with on-site uh, pickup drop off abilities. Some of the newer schools you'll see around LA County and throughout California You'll notice they have large U-shaped horseshoes for pickup drop-off. That's to reduce the traffic on street and to reduce conflicts. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that opportunity in the city of Burbank. Uh, the school has works with us. We still haven't been able to come to the 
best resolution on how do we do pickup drop off? How do we do the valet program? Which side of the school? How many sides of the school? Where's there, as uh, Dr. Paramo discussed, are we going to limit an access point for security for the school, or are we going to open up multiple access points for the parents uh, to get their children into the school campus? Uh, I think the safety and security of the school has become paramount, uh, so a lot of the schools will go to a single access point. However, you got to think about hundreds of parents driving their children's to, children to these individual schools are now trying to get to the same street, uh, because even if they can't physically walk their child in, uh, I'm a parent as well. I love to watch my child walk into the school campus. It gives you a peace of mind that you know they're safe and they made it, uh, and that there's someone from the school, and the school's fantastic about having staff greet children at these access points. Uh, so that gives people like me that have children in school, it gives me peace of mind, okay? Um, continuing with the traffic safety education, we just did this today. On the next slide we have, what we created, this was unfortunately after a tragic, uh, and a lot of the uh, members here uh, were around when this happened in 2021. We had the triple fatal accident on Glen Oaks and Andover. Um, with the direction and assistance from Chief Albanese, we worked with the schools to institute a driver safety training program. Uh, we call it the Mindfulness for Young Drivers. Uh, we currently hold this at Burbank High School and John Burroughs High School with the ninth grade students. We're trying to reach young students before they actually get behind the wheel of a car uh, to embed in them the safety issues that they will be faced with and how should, how should they drive safely and how should they approach driving a vehicle. Uh, the basic topics are basic rules of the road, distracted driving and impaired driving, and speed and reckless driving. Uh, annually, we reach about 13 to 1,400 ninth grade students between the two schools. Um, we would like to, we're exploring with Lieutenant Green through the COPS Bureau, we're exploring expanding this to additional grade levels to just reinforce these principles. Um, and we're also looking, trying to reach, we have Monterey Continuation School, we have a private schools such as Providence High School. These are in the works. Uh, this was a pilot program three years ago after that collision. Uh, we've continued it, thankfully, with the support of the school, um, and it seems to get nothing but positive feedback. Um, I think this is important. We're creating a relationship with students in the police department, but we're also sharing a very important message, and that's drive safe so everybody gets home safe. As mentioned, we're gonna continue with this uh, with social, we'll do uh, public service announcements. We're gonna continue trying to make videos. We're gonna continue to try to work with all of the schools. Um, it can be very difficult. We have a lot of schools and we have a lot of different competing interests. I'm working with Stacy Cashman with the school uh, to try to have a centralized point of contact for her to get the information we would like to have and then for the information we would like to provide to her and what programs can we do together. Um, next slide, please. This is just some basic information. I believe we already discussed the school valet program. Uh, a lot of the elementary school teachers have made contact with me this year because they are interested in revamping or taking another look at their current valet system. Uh, they want to improve it. Um, so we are working with Public Works with the city traffic uh, engineer, Edward Yu, if you don't know him. Uh, Ken Berkman is the director of Public Works. Uh, what we're going to do is take a serious look at this. This may take some time, uh, especially because what we have with the community development department, um, they are developing what's called Safe Streets Burbank. It's a safety plan for Burbank, and the purpose is to reduce or eliminate fatal and major injury collisions. There is going to be a focus at our school campuses. Um, the goal is to systematically analyze crash data and then quickly make modifications to if it's street design, traffic control devices, um, anything that's presented that we can have an impact on. The goal is to, after we analyze and identify that problem, the goal is to quickly adapt and make changes to prevent the problems that are occurring. Um, they have. They have a goal to bring this plan to city council in December of 2024. Um, this development plan, of course, is going to include cooperation with the BUSD, uh, with the school district, and this is also going to include a large public outreach to hopefully reach our parents and our students as well for their input. 
Um, with that said, if there's any, uh, uh, are we going to introduce the next speaker, Mayor? If, if you don't mind, or right. I'm happy to do it too. We'll do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, can we introduce Sergeant Marshall Lawfer, who will discuss school resource office? Sergeant Lawfer, come on down. I don't have a prize for you. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Marsha Lawfer. I'm a sergeant with the Burbank Police Department, and I'm in charge of the Domestic and Family Crimes Unit within our Investigations Division. And the SRO is part of our unit, the unit that I lead. Uh, just as a quick overview, we have one SRO for the whole city of Burbank, and that's provided by the Burbank Police Department at no cost to the school district. Uh, part of her duties include responding to high-risk or criminal activities at uh, or around the schools. We uh, maintain a very strong working relationship with uh, staff at the schools as well as at the district. Um, as Dr. Promo mentioned, uh, the school resource officer is primarily responsible for investigating all of the suspected child abuse reports that come into the city. And I can tell you that we have approximately 250 to 300 per year. Obviously, she can't do all of those by herself, so we do have help from other officers in the department, but she is the, the one that carries the primary responsibility. Uh, she also teaches classes, vaping seminars, um, the mindfulness for young drivers that Lieutenant Fromer just spoke about. Uh, she was involved in teaching all of those classes last year. Uh, threat assessment for all district employees. Uh, she was involved in teaching all of those. So our SRO taught 60 or more classes just last year. And she also speaks to or advises students upon request or as needed. It's not uncommon for a parent to come into the station with her young child and ask to speak to an officer. And if she's available, she would be the one to do that. The department takes this position very seriously when we understand that um, along with being a police officer, it is a community outreach position. And so the selection process for school resource officer is, is pretty stringent. And once someone is selected for that position, they do go through specific training uh, for that position. Um, just some statistics to let you know about. There are approximately 15,000 students within the district. During the last year, I know this has been a topic in previous years, so that's why I'm bringing it up. So during the, this last school year, we did have to arrest eight students at the schools. Offenses which led to their arrest were pretty serious. They included robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, battery, hate crimes, felony vandalisms, and weapons on the school campus. So those uh, were the total of the eight students that were arrested. And that's of the 15,000 students in the district. Another important job that the school resource officer performs is threat assessments. And that's become more of a hot topic in the last few years. I know myself, when I was a school resource officer 14 years ago, it, it really wasn't an issue. We would have it come up Periodically, we weren't specifically trained in threat assessment, and that has changed. Um, the national narrative has changed. The expectation of how police departments will handle that has changed, and City of Burbank Police Department has changed with it, and, I, and actually we're one of the forefront leaders in that training. So far this year, um, we've had approximately 25 threat assessments that have been generated out of our schools. Um, the SRO and other Burbank police officers uh, conduct very comprehensive assessments. And uh, we're able to do a much more in-depth investigation than school personnel would be able to do. Things like weapons checks, home visits, uh, coordination with mental health partners, 
um, with LA County, we have access to all of those resources that the school district just may not have access to. So in collaboration with the school district, we're able to conduct those assessments and also um, offer follow-up care. So things like, um, things like counseling through the school district or through the county, connection with our mental health unit uh, that is, is based at Burbank PD, and um, also connection with the county start team, which is the school threat assessment response team. Those are all partners that we work with in addressing those threats. So that's just an overview of um, part of her duties. In addition to all of those tasks, uh, just this past year, our one school, school resource officer also responded to approximately 160 other school requests. Those included things like requests for extra patrol, uh, nutrition or lunch visits, or other school concerns. So that's just an overview of the duties of our school resource, resource officer and an update on our program. And I'll be happy to answer any questions when you're ready. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sergeant. Um, before we go to questions and comments, Chief, uh, not to put you on the spot, anything you'd like to add? Or if not, that's completely okay, too. Well, I think we're going to have Lieutenant Green uh, do a presentation also, correct? Um, on this agenda item, uh, happy to. I think he might be coming up in a little bit, though, when we, we have uh, after this report on joint mental health initiatives. Oh, got uh, it. But if he has anything relevant to say, okay. Okay, got it. So um, I think it's clear to all of us, and especially the folks that are watching, especially parents, and we have a lot of parents in here, uh, uh, the time and the strategy we put into making it safe for our, our schools. The traffic plan, and uh, Lieutenant Fromer is very passionate about uh, the donning and doffing of our, our kids at, at the schools. And uh, uh, along with our motor officers and uh, our patrol officers, want to make sure it is uh, safe and as seamless as possible. And the investigative component side, uh, Lieutenant Lasaco's investigative staff really do a fine job as far as doing their investigations to make sure if there's uh, prosecutorial opportunities that is fully pursued, uh, hypersensitive to victims and especially uh, victims that are um, the subject of a heinous crime, that there is sensitivity uh, attached to that from the onset of the investigation to the prosecutorial outcome. Our SRO officer, uh, um, Akiomi Roberts, does a phenomenal job. Uh, it, it's a great fit for us, and it's a great fit for the school district because of her personality. She's welcoming, she's engaging, the kids love her, and she's very passionate about the mission. Uh, so, um, moving forward, if you have questions of our folks, but I'm very proud of what our folks do. It's a collective team effort. These are some of the faces, but there are faces behind the faces that we can't share with you because, you know what, they're out there working. So, <laughs> having said that, uh, please uh, free, feel free to ask away. Thank you very much, Chief, and thank you all for the comprehensive presentation, all of you. Um, so to mix it up, uh, we're going to start with uh, questions and comments from city council members, uh, everyone excluding myself, and then we'll turn it over to the school board, and I'll go at the end. Uh, Councilmember Mullins, any questions or comments? I knew you were just itching to hit that button and ask a question. I, I actually wasn't. I was reading my notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, would anyone else prefer to go first? We're going, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, it's fine. I, I'm happy. I was just going through all the reports and my notes. Um, I'm going to start from the first presentations regarding cameras. Um, are those camera, cameras being monitored during the day, meaning somebody's actually staring at a TV monitor looking? So what tends to what tends to happen uh, for a school administrator is they will. Uh, have a double screen and they will put the surveillance up on their screen and they're doing their work with that up and being visible with it. So it does record. Mm -hmm. So if a specific incident occurs, we can go back and look at footage. 
Uh, it is up on the screen. Uh, whether they're staring at that 24-7 is not likely. Okay, thank you. Well, and, and you probably can guess why the reason I'm asking, because um, in the event somebody tries to break in, as they've done in the past, it might be a little bit too late if they're not caught walking in. So um, I'm hoping that, I mean, obviously you've done it such a great job to secure the campuses, but as you said, there's little loopholes that applies in probably every security system that ever exists. So um, sure. it's it's always a good uh, reminder that we need to uh, glance at those cameras as, office, as often as possible to eliminate this from happening again. Are the kids in the high schools allowed to still leave campus during lunchtime? And you're doing the same monitoring process going in and out? Uh, yes, they can leave campus, juniors and seniors. Uh, they have instituted a little bit more restrictions on who can go, uh, but it is the same process to get back in. Okay, and time-wise for getting back because of class starting and everything you described earlier, it takes a, a long time, well a little longer than usual to process them going in. It's a significant, significantly smaller group that's going to be coming in after lunch. So it's, um, it's not even half the student body that would be getting off campus lunch. So it actually uh, is done really quickly. Okay. Getting them back in is done really quickly. Um, thank you. So I want to touch on some issues uh, or some of the things we talked about with reporting child abuse and sexual assault. Um, with this also applies to not just on campus, but off campus events that might have happened to a child. And I want to identify a child. Is it up to the high school age or younger? Because, I mean, to me, anybody younger than me is going to call him a child. So. You and me both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any cr any sexual assault that happens within the confines of the city of Burbank, whether it's on campus or off campus, no matter how old that person is from birth to, you know, later in their years, uh, we, uh, we, <laughs> we're not mentioning, we, we, not, age, not mentioning no. names. We are, <laughs> we are going to, uh, take that, take that police report and investigate it, uh, thoroughly. If uh, somebody is reporting a, an assault or any mm. crime, for that matter, that occurred outside the city of Burbank, we will take the initial uh, response and, depending on the circumstances, either take what's called a courtesy report for the other agency where that occurred or actually take the, uh, call that agency for them to come take the original report. It really depends on the specific circumstances of the case. Okay, good. It's good to know that they have access that, if it happens off campus, obviously that still, you know, have access to report it and get the help they need. Absolutely no bearing whatsoever uh, where it happens. If it's in the city of Burbank, we're taking the police report. If it's not in the city of Burbank, we're still going to respond and handle it appropriately. Thank you. Um, then I want to jump into traffic. I happen to be a very fortunate homeowner where I got 40 some years ago, I moved right next to Burroughs High School. And um, I have seen a lot of work that goes into um, the first couple of months when the students go back into school. And I do applaud you because every scenario that you described here, I have seen looking at either in my driveway or from my window, um, seeing what happens with the children and how they get dropped off in the middle of the street. And believe me, some days I scream because I think some child is going to get hit from walking in between cars. The one thing I want to mention, and maybe the school um, can also work with our police department, we tend to um, relax a little bit after the first couple of months of school because the kids have gotten into routines, the parents have gotten into routines, and then we start um, seeing the parents are relaxing of following the rules that have been applied. Um, and the children even um, do not comply with parking regulations, and which turns out that we have to call the police department. And so I'm wondering, how do we continue that effort? Is there a way the school can actually remind the children during the school year to adhere to the regulations? Because 
Um, I know that a lot of my neighbors as well as myself, and I don't want to focus on me, but I know if it exists in a high school next to me, it does exist somewhere else where they even remove your trash containers from the sidewalk and they put them on top of your, on top of the actual sidewalk because they need that parking space. And so it actually turns out to be a little bit of more of an issue because all the trash is falling on the, on the street. So how do we, how do we keep that message going for the parents and keep it alive that they need to adhere to the rules? Yeah, and I, th I think that's an area where we can improve upon with collaboration with the schools uh, to try to get those emails or contact information from parents so that we can, when we identify those issues, push out that safety information. Uh, right now, we have I have my motor officers on a rotational schedule through all the schools. So a after we focus heavily for the first couple months, uh, then they're going to rotate through the schools, and that's purely because of a, a staffing and resource mm -hmm. issue. Um, would it be nice to have? I tell the chief every day I'd love to have you know 20 more traffic cops, but um, we all understand that's a funding and uh, issue that has to be discussed. But I think the educational portion, we we really need cooperative parents and students at the high schools that are driving. We really need them to cooperate and understand the safety rules and try to adhere to them. What, my biggest recommendation is most people, when they commit the violations, they're in a rush. Mm -hmm. I got to get to work. I got I to I gotta go get my morning breakfast before I go to work, so I got to drop my children off. I, I think if we can just uh, get people to leave the house a little 15 minutes earlier, we could get a lot of people to slow down, and a lot of the activity we see uh, would not be as prevalent. Um, but we, we, that's, like I mentioned, that's an area we need to improve upon with the school, try to get a centralized point of contact to discuss uh, throughout the year when we want to push that information out and how best to accomplish it. I would really appreciate that because I know, uh, as I said, I've watched it for 40 years going on. So um, we talk a lot about it. I know the school, they try to do a good job in notifying the parents and the students. Uh, but it becomes an issue also in the residential neighborhood, and we don't want to turn every residential street into a par permit parking only. Um, and it, it's okay to utilize the streets, but safety is really my number one concern because I've seen what these kids do in the middle of the street, and it's terrifying. So I appreciate the ongoing education and efforts and trying to um, have them at adhere as long as we can during school year to the rules. So yes, thank you for that. Uh, and we would like to get that balance. A lot of people, unfortunately, if they're coming from outside an area into the school where the school's located, we don't want them to forget that there's people that live all around the school. And it is a neighborhood, it is a community. So trying to find that balance between their objective and the quality of life of the residents there, that's a balance we'd like to find. Thank you. Um, the one thing I want to do applaud you for in reaching out to the um, students and educating them about the consequences of speeding. And that is something we discussed at the council meetings. And I know we talked about early on, how do we get to the kids as early as possible, not just in high school, because by then they're driving, but you know, even in middle school, that safety is number one priority for when they do go start driving. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Oh, and thank you for all your support. Okay, um, my last uh, comment or question is CRO, and this is obviously, um, I am the council liaison on the, for the police commission, and I've heard and have seen the presentations before and regarding the wonderful work uh, the officer does and how she works with all the students. And the more I hear about it, the more it really um, makes me want to jump in and and have give you more resources to help in our schools and to help the students. Because obviously, um, she's doing such an incredible job that it's, a, it's, it's highly successful that um, helping a lot of students and helping the kids and even getting the ones that are in trouble off, you know, hopefully helping them to stop being in trouble. And so I, I'm sure once we hear from our from my colleagues, that's something I'm very much interested in, in looking and uh, expanding the program and providing those resources for the children. I think they need someone to look up to, someone that they can connect with. And um, I, I'm, 
I appreciate all the work that she does. I constantly hear about it at commission meetings, and I know they're very supportive of the program. So hopefully when we discuss it, this is something I'm very much interested in doing. So th um, please pass our thank you to her and her great job that she does. Thank you. I will. Thank you very much. Councilmember Takahashi, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Lots of information, great information. Thank you for sharing all of this with us. Um, I like that we're all here hearing it at the same time and discussing it together. Um, I'm like my colleague, uh, Councilmember Mullins, I'm going to go through different categories. But the first thing I have to say is that I'm so glad there's no more classes in the bungalows. Oh my gosh. Uh, my kids, I mean, they were not happy with the classes in the bungalows. And um, I, as a parent, too, just, I mean, I, I didn't feel unsafe, but it, still there was just that always having to transition between the two sections. So yes. it's nice that it's not happening anymore. But question, um, what are you doing with the bungalows now? Are they being used for other reasons now? They're all being utilized. Uh, Family Service Agency uses one. Oh, great. We were That's able great. to solve some Title IX issues by creating uh, space for our girls' softball team to utilize one right. to put their okay. equipment in. We use right. one for special ed testing. All, every bungalow is utilized. That's fabulous news. I'm so glad to hear it. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk a little bit about traffic. Um, f my first question is kind of more informational. Um, did you mean, maybe I missed it, but uh, do you have information on car and pedestrian slash bike interactions around the school, and how often does that happen? That there, You talked about the danger of the students crossing the street. How often does it actually happen that cars interact with bikes or pedestrians that, that you find? Yeah, so at the schools, I know we had an earlier caller who mentioned uh, – I was confused as to whether he said he witnessed uh, children being hit by, where he actually saw students yeah. hit by cars or the near misses. So okay. uh, we, we don't predominantly have an issue with skateboarders, bicyclists, uh, uh, pedestrian students. Uh, this isn't something that we frequently or commonly have at the school sites. Uh, there are sometimes collisions that are uh, blocks away, the route for the children to take to school. Um, so it's not typically at the school site itself where you think it would because of all that uh, congestion for that 20, 30 minute time period. Um, but it, it's not prevalent at a school campus, the streets surrounding the school. That's great to hear. I'm glad that that's not an issue. Um, how about car and car interaction? Is that pretty common either? It, it, for collisions as well. Uh, okay. and, and when there are collisions, a, a lot of people, we talk about the 25 mile per hour being reduced to 15. Yeah. Uh, when we have all of those different modes of transportation coming together to get to school, it's typically a 20, 30 minute time period. Mm -hmm. um, so you would expect, okay, we're probably, that's probably where we're going to see a rise in the uh, collisions or the conflicts, uh, but we don't. And when we do have collisions, there can be fender benders. Uh, right. But as far as like a serious collision, and it's so congested that no, nobody's doing over 25 miles per hour because they're typically, right. you know, they're coming to a line of cars stop to drop off their children. Okay, so it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the, there, there are issues with congestion and, and uh, cars maneuvering around with pedestrians, but fortunately we haven't seen a huge uh, impact on actual injury or, um, or interactions between the various modes of travel, right? So when we're looking at solving the issue or addressing the issue better, um, it, it, we're, we're not looking at actually decreasing the number of interactions, but more just trying to create a more flow and a more just generally feeling safe and being safe around the schools. Yes, because I could agree with uh, when they discuss near misses, we, we can agree with that. Yeah. We, uh, because of those issues uh, that I talked about during the presentation, uh, the visibility issues, the people rushing, yes, there, there are issues. Yeah. Um, and okay. that's what we're, uh, that's our ultimate goal is to try to fix those issues to make it more orderly. Right, great. So um, I'm mostly familiar with boroughs <laughs> because that my kids would mostly walk and bike to school, but we'd also drive them. And what I found is that with boroughs specifically is that it was fine until about five minutes before class, and then everybody's there, right? In I mean, everybody walking, biking, cars, everybody. And um, for, you know, trying to get your teenager out the door and get them to school. And I'm just wondering if there um, is a way to spread out the arrival timer or to encourage folks to come earlier or to arrive earlier. And one of the things my teens would say is that, you know, we don't want 
we want to get to school right when class starts because we want to, we don't want to hang around. We don't want to, there's nothing really to do. I'm just curious that that might be something that to consider of having things that the kids might come a little earlier for besides class, just a thought to kind of spread out the interest for the teens to come. It's a topic we've discussed, staggering the start and release times. Uh, it, it, it was under discussion, but you got to remember if we start school later that everybody gets out later, yeah. and that impacts quite a few yeah. things on families. I was thinking more like offering, you know, cookies 15 minutes before class or something, <laughs> and that they might come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you'd have all hey, the We've got lots there. of very, very <laughs> thoughtful businesses in our community. Dr. Parma, how many students are doing zero period, though, at each of these schools? Because that does help spread yeah. it out quite a bit. Yeah, 33%. Okay, great. Um, so in regards to education, which I think is a fabulous, a fabulous pr approach, um, you mentioned educating the parents. Do you also educate the kids um, about, you know, best practices for drop-off and pick-up? Um, um, so right now it's in the high schools. Uh, okay. We don't, uh, we, we had a larger, in the past we had a larger school resource officer presence at the schools. Mm. Um, it's reduced now. And we don't have a program for the smaller children. What we do have the interaction between my motor officers and the elementary school children is the valet program. Okay. Because uh, a lot of the schools will actually use the older children at the school, the higher grade level, fifth, sixth yeah. grade, to be the assistants at the curbside to help the smaller children out of the car. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it, it's great to have that interaction, and we get the education through that point, but it's not the school body as a whole. Okay. Because I find that my kids really liked knowing more than me and would tell me the best way, the best practices. Mom, you can't let me off here. You have to wait till I get closer. And I was really sure? No, I can't be left off here. And um, I also, was, uh, my question too is with the education, is it also translated into various languages? Oh, we do have uh, on our public service announcements, we do put it in uh, English, uh, Armenian, and Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, but not everything that we offer is in uh, all the various languages that are here in our community. Okay. And I ask these questions, I'm wondering if this might be an area where the city could partner together with the schools in education, with our PIO and with um, transmitting these educational informations through our different channels outside of the school district, through our general social media channels, through the other ways that our city educates the community, and then we have access also to translation. So I'm wondering if that's something that maybe we can consider um, assisting with. And then, um, again, about education, is, is there, are there signage? Is there any kind of directional signage? Uh, I didn't notice any when I was dropping off my kids years ago, but are, uh, how about now? Are there directional signs for folks to know what to do? No, there's not. And that's one of the things we are working with uh, Ms. Cashman at the school level to talk about creating nice uh, graphic maps for each school campus mm. to basically tell the parents that are driving, if you're coming from this direction, please use this street. If you're coming from the other direction, use this street. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be a work in progress because that's going to take some, uh, a lot of uh, hours yeah. to get this accomplished. Sure. But we are going to work together with them to get this done. Okay. More information, but there's no independent signage outside of public mm -hmm. street signage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one other thing on, on this topic is that um, there are other school districts I've noticed um, that are, are um, playing around with closing off streets in front of the drop-off area to just drop off folks. Nobody else can drive through. So like you're, you're talking about the valet, being that the street is completely closed except for the valet. And then if folks want to drop their kids off like two blocks away, they can. But if they want to get it right in front, they have to go through the valet and they have it two directional. Have you guys ever considered having, um, maybe trying that out maybe at Burroughs? I'm thinking of the, the entry point at Burroughs on um, Clark. That might be a potential area that, that could be tested. Uh, it could be something that we can try, but we'd have to work through some issues with the traffic engineer and public works on the legality of closing off parts of roadway at any given time. But it is, uh, that is something that we could definitely look at. Okay. So I thought that was an interesting approach. All right. Just a couple more questions, Mr. Mayor, on the SROs, and then I'm done. You got it. I'm here all night. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, so I am very, I'm very interested to hear what the other folks have to say about SROs because I don't have a whole lot of knowledge about it. So I really appreciate your having explained what she does. And I, this uh, Officer Robert sounds amazing. And I was wondering, if, first of all, can we clone her? Like the first option. <laughs> I wish, I wish we could. Yeah. Um, so I guess about what you know, the, the things that she does. I'm wondering how much of the of the of the responsibility that she has require an actual sworn officer to do, and how much of those responsibilities could be done by somebody who's a partner with her who's not sworn, as an example. 
And the reason why I ask is because sometimes when I mean, we're looking at, at staffing for our, our sworn officers, and we are, it's, it's challenging to get more sworn officers, yet there may be possibilities to get a partner that's not sworn that may be a little bit easier to ask. Right. Most of the responses that she has to the school involve situations that either on their face require a sworn officer or have the potential to uh, lead into a criminal investigation such as um, any of the items that I mentioned where children had to be uh, arrested for or because they are a victim of some sort of crime. So in those situations, um, it's already reached the point where the school is requesting a sworn officer to come to the, to the school right. and handle that situation because they've already vetted it out. So mm -hmm. most of the times where she is... Um, doing her functions as a school resource officer, it's already been determined that it's at the level that requires a sworn officer to handle it. Got it. Okay. Because we, we have a really successful model of our mental health evaluation team with yes. one sworn officer and whatnot. And so I was looking at that as potentially uh, a way that we could um, provide more services without having to bring in another sworn officer. But I don't know if that's, that sounds feasible or not, but I, I do think that MET model works pretty well and that might be something to consider. Yes, just to touch on that a, a bit more, um, I, I talked about her functions as a school resource officer. I didn't really touch on her functions as a child abuse report investigation officer. Okay. So those investigations, um, by law, have to be done in a, in a bilateral investigation. The Department of Children and Family Services assigns a social worker to each case, and they conduct an independent investigation. And then the police department has to conduct their own investigation separate and apart from the Department of Children and Family Services. And they both have to come to their own conclusions. So in that regard, it, it's not something that can be handled by someone who's unsworn. It, by law, has to be handled by our department. Great. Thank you so much for the clarification. Sure. I appreciate sure. it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member Anthony, you're up. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Um, the uh, sexual harassment and assault um, um, protocols that we have in place, um, we've seen a lot of major incidents come out of the high schools. Uh, I wanted to ask about what's going on at the middle schools. Do we do any sort of training specific to that? Um, I know my son comes home and talks a lot about getting informed about bullying and those kinds of peer pressure. Um, he doesn't talk much about gendered violence or anything like that, or even gendered language. Do we have a program in place? Are we, are we tackling it early? Um, what, what's going on at the middle schools? As far as the police department interacting with the middle school age students? Yeah, do we see any of that coming out of... It? What, what do the incidences look like? And then... And then, then I'd like to ask the superintendent if we have any programs to tackle that. Well, we certainly have calls that are uh, run the gamut uh, related to uh, assaults, whether they be sexual assaults or just physical assaults. Those are coming out of the middle schools as they are coming out of the high schools. So, yes, we're getting them not so much out of the uh, elementary schools, as you might imagine. And when there is, there really isn't police involvement for the most part. Uh, but definitely from the middle schools and from the high schools, we do have that. There's no... Uh, education component in place where we go uh, proactively engage the students uh, from the police department to the middle school age students other than when uh, the SRO has an opportunity to engage with the students either most you know informally or formally uh, when there used to be a uh, SRO on the middle school campuses like when I went to uh, Luther and Burroughs uh, I had an SRO on campus that I knew by first name and interacted with I would say almost on a daily basis. And so that informally happened all the time. Um, now, uh, as you heard, Kiyomi is pulled in 20 different directions on a daily basis. And I think each of the schools are competing for her services. Uh, that, that really isn't uh, an opportunity that we have right now to, to formally interact with, with the middle school kids. And, and so, Mr. Prama, what my, my point is, my son comes home all the time, and there's plenty of stuff talking about physical violence and bullying and, you know, he gets that 
all the time. Um, but I've had to, you know, sit him down and talk to him about the kind of gendered language and the gender. That's a little different. And I'm so I'm wondering, is there any discussion about tackling that uh, during sixth, seventh, and eighth grade? What, what's, what's happening there? So our uh, principals uh, work with a consultant to train teachers on how to facilitate conversations that um, allow kids to feel comfortable talking about things like pronouns, how they identify. Um, they've gotten a lot more sensitive about it because without trying to make a student uncomfortable, they initially were doing exercise where they asked everybody to identify their pronouns. And some kids felt really uncomfortable about that. Right. So it took some training to say, you can't, you can't force a student to identify their pronouns. Mm. But if a student wants you to know how they want to be identified, then you need to respect that. So uh, that has happened through multiple times of the consultant coming in to do training with staff because uh, it, it's uh, it, 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 like everything else is developmental and you need to hear it a couple times. You need to have some training to be able to do that. There is a concerted effort with our school administrators to work with teaching staff to ensure that they are being respectful of those things and to be respectful of pronouns. There are also um, specific assemblies for students that identify these areas. And a lot of times it doesn't look the same at each site because they're each doing their own thing. Uh, some schools have specific programs where it lends itself for a consultant or a professional development or someone to go in and do that. Mm -hmm. I just want to jump in quickly and add a couple of things. Yeah. Um, so just in response to sort of what's in place. So one of the things, I don't know if you, it was in the middle of a lot of conversation, but one of the things that we finally got implemented, um, and thank you to Dr. Anders for doing this in um, the district, is that we get every five weeks yeah. um, a report that shows us, obviously confidentiality is... Permit. Of the utmost, but mm -hmm. we can see if there's sort of a surge in mm -hmm. fights at a campus or there's some sort, you know, X, Y, and so gives us a chance to track trends mm -hmm. and then better be able to address it on, because we know every school site's different, right? So that's been a really big help. Um, and one of the things that we're consistently talking about is how can we bring mental health services uh, those kind of programs earlier and earlier to our students That's because right. you know we did it at secondary, but it really needs to be in elementary first so that it's sort of the trickle up. Mm -hmm. So I think that one of the things, and the research is still developing, but I can tell you like as a middle school teacher, one of the things that I have seen post COVID is a huge uptick in physical violence and in like a very, um, and sort of the inability to allow personal space, whether that's like taking stuff or kind of just like put, touching someone without their consent. And so I think we're still as educators trying to figure out best practices because it hasn't been that long. Like we're still, the research is just starting to come out. So I think that when, when we're talking about these kind of programs, we have to think about it holistically. So not only what are we doing to keep the kids physically safe, but also what are we doing educationally to help the kids sort of develop mentally and then developmentally um, deal with things like bullying or deal with things like sort of physical violence or mental violence. And then you layer into that uh, social media and it just becomes, I mean, at least, and we've like, whatever, we're all old, I'm old, but like, I knew that for the most part, when I went home from school, I wasn't going to have to deal with the stuff at school when I went home. And now it, it doesn't stop for them. And so one of the conversations, I know Ms. Ponser Kampkar has brought this up to Dr. Paramo, at, and, and I brought it up in a meeting yesterday, is how are we interacting with, um, how are our students interacting with phones in elementary and middle? And how much is that contributing to this kind of environment, the perpetuation of violence, perpetuation of like over-sexualization, things like that. So we're really thinking, I mean, we're so lucky to have the superintendent and assistant superintendents and directors that we do who are really in our in our principals and EPs looking at this. So I think that's a very long way of saying there's a lot going on. Um, 
but it does differ site by site, right? So trying to find a little more uniformity, I think is something else we're really focused on as well as how are we doing these things on every campus, um, not just, you know, when a problem, how are we being proactive as opposed to reactive? I think that five week report is fantastic. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, it's I, really helpful. I just want to, uh, I've talked to um, uh, Mr. Ferguson and Dr. Hagakani about this previously. I want to let you know that, you know, my son is in middle school and the the words and languages that his peer group brings home about about girls, about the LGBTQ community, even language about race and religion, <clears throat> um, it is very troubling, and I do have to talk to him constantly about this. So I'm seeing it. Um, we're all seeing it. Um, it is troubling, and some of it can be mitigated. Um, the reason why I brought it up here with the uh, sexual har harassment and assault issue is because it can be lasting for young girls um, with specific things. And so um, any care that we can take, um, obviously we're all here uh, supporting all these initiatives and um, we're, we're watching and we're supportive. Um, I wanted to move on to traffic a little bit. Um, um, I wanted to quickly, before we get into it, explain the school valet system to our mayor, who is probably going to be using it very soon. So at the elementary schools, there is, um, most of the schools have a long curb, most of it is white, and it's a pick up a drop off area, and they designate it, and what they do is they put out some cones, and a teacher and some students will organize the car so that you pull in, and you just, you you get your kid out on the right side and then you keep driving and you don't have to step out and walk your kid. It's really great for like third, fourth, fifth grade. Um, it's, I, lo I love the system, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so very supportive of that, whatever we can do to increase that. Um, however, I do wanna throw this out there. Um, I have been talking about this for many years and the funding isn't available but I wanna see if we can get creative with it. I would like to ask our subcommittee the next time they meet to discuss buses, the potential for school buses in Burbank. Not for the elementary schools, but for the middle schools. Here's why, here's why I bring this up. The big change from being able to walk your kid to school or drop them off right down the street at an elementary level because our, you know, they're zoned. The elementary are zoned. You're very close. Once you move to the middle school level, um, you are now traversing a lot farther. Um, some of these parents, very far across the city, to get. There's no, there's no more walkability, especially at the sixth grade level. Once you make that transition from five to six, I would love to just have a discussion, and just see if our subcommittee can come together and. Talk about a pilot, see what other cities are doing, anything like that, and find some funding mechanism that we can work on. Um, maybe there's a grant out there. Because I think going from a system that really works, this really great valet system that is awesome, and a lot of families actually walk in, at the elementary level, and then you transition to six, it is, it is jarring. It is jarring, and it creates danger. Um, so that's what I would ask. Um, and uh, lastly, the PIO thing that we mentioned earlier, um, Councilmember Takahashi, the streets are public streets, and that is our purview. So I would not be opposed to having us partner and mention, have the um, police department put out something through our PIO and through the police department PIO about schools and drop-offs and the valet zones and all, all of that system, because um, those streets, that's our responsibility. and. Once the kid is on campus, it's your responsibility. We want to get them there safe. So I would be totally in favor of that system. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, and lastly, Vice Mayor Perez. All right. I just want to start by personally apologizing to Mr. Paramo for always sneaking in through the band entrance door, not going through the front door at Burroughs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suspend me. <laughs> I, uh, it's only it's only a problem if you get caught. You just added yourself. I know. I know. If you confess. Well, we always have the option of censure. 
Well, now that all we're right. all awake, now that we're all awake. <laughs> Just making sure you're paying attention. Yeah. Um, I, I do have some questions for you all, and thank you for, for everything you've been doing. I know it's it's a lot, and, and just looking at the schools, and I, I say it in jest, but really the feasibility of get every, getting everybody in the same door at Burroughs, especially a school that has so many access points, it, it is a tough feat, and kudos to all of you for, for getting it done. Um, I'm going to start with a question about the, the sexual assault reported cases. I know we mentioned it was 250 to 300 a year. Is that comparable to other jurisdictions, other cities? Talking about the SCAR reports? Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head what the other uh, jurisdictions are doing. Marsha Lawford is telling me it's comparable. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's helpful to know because for me, you know, 250 sounds like a lot, but I don't know if, if we're seeing that across the board or if we're seeing that. It, it is a lot because each one of those uh, are an investigation uh, of themselves. Even if nothing comes of it, uh, the officers that are investigating it uh, have to spend the time it takes to vet everything that comes with it, right? So even if it turns out that it's uh, no crime, uh, you know, we still have to go through the, the steps to uh, get to that point. Right. Thank you. Thank you. But I, I I don't know if this is calming in any way, but at least I'm glad to know it's not more than other jurisdictions because then we know we have a real problem. And fortunately, we have a real problem everywhere then. But oh, Jesus. Um, my next question is it's somewhat in line there. I think it might be for both of you. Um, I know you mentioned that the department has to do its own investigation. Do we ever do any kind of home visits for these type of situations or even um, attendance issues or anything like that in collaboration with DCFS? So I think uh, Sergeant Loffer would be better suited to answer that for you. Thank you. Sorry to juggle you all back and forth. <laughs> That's okay. So to answer your first question, yes, we do home visits. Um, as I mentioned, we do a very comprehensive investigation. Um, and our department is very stringent on how those investigations are handled. In fact, we're probably more stringent than some departments allow. Anytime we have a suspected child abuse report, uh, our, our department by policy requires that a police report be written. It cannot be cleared with just a contact and being cleared in the notes um, in our computer system that everything checked okay. It actually requires a, a police report with all parties documented and um, the entire investigation documented. And as part of that investigation, it usually always involves a home visit. Um, to mention, to, to touch on the other aspect about attendance, um, our department does participate in the school attendance review board hearings, and I'm not sure if that answers your question, but anytime a child has an excessive number of absences, they get flagged with the district, and I'm not going to speak to the district's uh, process for determining that or setting up the, the meetings, but we do have a part in those school attendance review board meetings, and we always try to have a representative there from the department to um, just offer support. Uh, find out if there are any issues going on at home, if there's anything that would elicit a police response, um, such as suspected abuse, that is something that we respond to. And sometimes we do get called by the school to say, hey, we have this student and they haven't shown up for five days and we're worried because of this prior history. And that's something that would generate um, a welfare check on that child. So it may not rise to the level of a suspected child abuse report, but it could it could be handled by a welfare check where we send an officer to the home just to check on the situation and determine the next appropriate step. That is great to hear. I'm, I'm a social worker. So oh, okay, okay. <laughs> for me, that's music to my ears. I, I know, unfortunately, and a little bit of it is resources, a little bit of it is just time, energy. The pandemic created a big crash. I work in the city of LA and a lot of schools are no longer doing wellness checks for attendance issues, which I think is a big problem. So it's great to hear that we're doing this on two fronts, on the school front and with our, you know, with a police officer, because you never know why somebody is not going to school. So right. that is great to hear. And, and part of that is just the communication between 
the school personnel and, and our department. Um, many of the principals have my personal cell phone number, and I will get calls occasionally on the weekend or in nighttime hours. And I know that uh, Officer Roberts um, is in the same situation. So sometimes we will get phone calls just like, hey, this is the situation. We're not exactly sure what to do. And sometimes just that open communication can um, foster the relationship where we, we do take the appropriate steps. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the school has a direct policy for reporting children after a certain number of days absence and requesting a wellness. Okay, so they do. Okay, so, um, but I know that we have received those requests, and that's, the, the matter of, of children and safety and any uh, potential crimes involving juveniles, that is something that holds the highest priority for us, and that's always something that we're going to direct the appropriate resources to. Great. Thank you. And then my last question, maybe for you still. So, okay. Um, I know we didn't touch on it too much during the presentation, but one of the things I've seen practicing in, in LA, unfortunately, in LAUSD, is an increase in substances entering our schools. What are we seeing? Do we have numbers, any data for, for any issues involving illicit substances entering our schools? Unfortunately, due to the change in California law, a lot of the substances that used to be considered illegal are no longer, they no longer hold the same penalties that they did before, which limits our ability to enforce those what used to be laws. So many of these, these issues when it comes to kids bringing illegal substances into the school, many times we are not even made aware of it because the school handles it on the school level. So there have been some instances where we've been contacted uh, because perhaps they suspect that a child has overdosed and the fire department is responding to take, you know, medical, medical, medically evaluate that child and transport them if, if necessary. And generally, the police will always respond also to handle uh, the police side of it. But in general, we're not, we're not even hearing about many of the substances that the school may find because they're handled on a school level. Uh, Dr. Paramo, could you just jump in briefly and talk about, I know we've made some real strides thanks to our head nurse as far as Narcan and some of the other things that we're doing on campus in, in response to what we're seeing in, in other school communities? Yeah, we uh, have an amazing uh, district nurse, lead nurse, who has gone above and beyond in training uh, all of our staff on Narcan and how to use Narcan. And we have done an excellent job of providing Narcan in multiple key areas on campus so that they're accessible uh, and there wouldn't be any downtime in order for someone to be administered the Narcan. Uh, I will also share that, yes, uh, one of the alarming things is the number of students who are being transported to the hospital because of what they're ingesting. And, and what we see is that kids are doing this um, using edibles. And it makes sense if you think about it because they're taking an edible that doesn't take it doesn't take effect immediately. It takes effect 20 minutes or 25 minutes later. And oftentimes they're not understanding that and they think, well, I haven't taken enough. I haven't done enough. I don't feel anything. And they're doing more. And before you know it, it's too late and they've ingested and taken too much and then they're being transported. <laughs> Right. Well, thank you for that. I, I ask because unfortunately we have seen a rise of, and, and I say we just in the agency I work with, but mm -hmm. a rise of parents concerned because their child comes home because a friend gave them something that they don't know what it is. And now sure. here we are. So I just wanted to see what it looked like. It's unfortunate to hear it's happening here as well, but I'm glad we have Narcan available readily. And I know our, our PD and our fire have amazing response times. So, um, one, a couple more questions. I think these are for tenant, though. I don't know if, oh, there we go. Um, I know my colleagues alluded to this. The video is great, and um, it would be great to get that material in other languages and in front of parents at different intervals. Are 
Are there other times, do we have like a schedule of when we send those kind, that kind of information out to, with the school? Is there kind of a plan for that? Yeah, so what we typically will work off is because you have the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency, so NHTSA, and then you have the California Office of Traffic Safety. They have they have an annual calendar of events. Uh, you know, they typically will label this impaired driving month, uh, seatbelt, click it or ticket month. Um, so we try to we try to stay in alignment with that for some consistency, especially for the communities, because we don't want to conflict with what you're going to see on a statewide level where we're changing things at a local yeah. level. Great, thank you. And then I definitely agree with my colleagues. I would love to see that on our City of Burbank page. I know we have done, PIO has done videos before, like, hey, it's the first day of school, but it's just kind of announcing it. I'd love to see that coupled with, therefore be safe and don't throw your kids out of the minivan in the middle of the street, because I have also seen it. I will sell um, that idea for the beginning of school next year. <laughs> Sir, if we had that um, in electronic form, we can put it in our data confirmation packet so that at the beginning of school, every parent is required to go in and electronically acknowledge that they've gone through certain material, and that can just be another artifact in there. That would be wonderful. Could I, could I ask a follow-up real quick? Yeah. Is there any education to teaching the parents to letting the kids out on the right side of the vehicle versus out on the driver's side? That's, that's highly dangerous. Right, and that's going to be in the next video that we produce uh, because that is a growing concern that we're seeing, spe specifically because of the double parking. If, if I could give a suggestion, almost every single car has a child safety lock. I, with my kid, on the left side, I have the child safety lock activated, so he can't even get out on that side. So, I mean, if you want to put that in, you can show a little video of how to Absolutely. activate it. Absolutely. Add that, too. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, it definitely needed a reminder. Last question for oh. you before you go away. I tried to get you all in order. I tried. I don't know if I did a good job of it. But um, um, my last question is, Is I, I know you talked about a plan to expand the mindfulness for young drivers to Monterey or Providence, because I know, you know we have teens there too, um, and it's in the works. What do we need to expand it? Do we need more folks? Do we need more funding? Is, is there kind of a barrier that we could address as a body to expanding that? Um, it, it's co collaboration with the school um, on when they can afford the time and the curriculum that they have, because they have set formats throughout the year. So it'd have to be a carve out for this. But then also for us, it'd be a um, personnel issue. Uh, it's an all day event uh, just to get through we do this about three times at each school, but it's an all-day thing where there's 50-minute time periods for the students. Um, I think they currently do this through a health class. They give us the driver safety portion. Um, so it would it, it would take quite a bit of uh, officer power issues to uh, right. basically the out that way in on that. Yeah. chief. So uh, let's go back to uh, August of 2021. So that was August. When I spoke to Dr. Paramo, um, um, uh, Member Ferguson, and a couple other uh, board member Fer Ferguson, when we, we talked two days later as far as uh, an ed introducing an educational program to the school. And Dr. Paramo had to provide a tutorial for me is that, that w the school schedule is already in place for the calendar year. So the soonest that we could do it was April May, and once we got it calendar sequentially, so it would take a, a full year. So if we do uh, Providence or whatever school, it's going to take a year because they have their syllabus or syllabi already in place. So uh, it's doable. It's um, The collaboration was uh, essential for us at the beginning, and we got it done. We're moving forward. It's a model program that these folks have done a great job with, but but it also requires time, time and personnel. That help? It's helpful. Thank yeah, you, Chief. Thank, 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 you, yeah. thank you all. I really appreciate it. Sounds like we're doing great work at the schools, and, and I think safety is paramount on, on every level now more than ever. So thank you for everything you're doing in partnership with our folks on the school board and in the district. Uh, okay, we'll begin with Board Member Ferguson. Thank you so much. So, um, again, opportunities for us to learn from each other. You guys have restrictions, we have restrictions, so we're learning. You know, one of the things I remember from knocking on doors the most um, when I was running the first time, even the second time as well, but 
were people saying, you know, I wish that, that those schools would just teach kids how to balance their checkbooks. They can't even ch balance their checkbooks anymore, right? We've got one semester at the secondary level that we can make adjustments to, one class of one semester that we can make changes to. So if you divide, and that, oh, and by the way, that, that class is called health. We don't have the time to do or to teach lessons that, frankly, parents need to teach. Not in all circumstances. We can reinforce, we can backstop, but that that's a reactionary strategy, not a proactive one. If we want to be able to do this, so Mr. Anthony, you did call me, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of parents who are trying to do the best they can. Um, they may not have access to like childcare resources, frankly, that, you know, we could centralize then, frankly, some of these resources for us that we're building a generation and empowering a generation of parents to make decisions differently, to empower their kids to make decisions differently. Instead, we're saying we're going to hand it all to the school. We're handling medical, we're handling safety, we're handling you name it. Some changes in state policy, things we don't control. But we're trying to do everything we can as compassionately as, compassionately as we can while having funding cut. You know, you all experience that, I, I know that. So when we hear about these different issues, what's helpful for us, I think, in many ways, and I'm not trying to speak for everybody, but is to hear Solutions that don't result in the teacher having to do more because that's not what we can offer today or our classified employees to do more um, The reason why you're talking to an assistant superintendent about sustainability practices Is because we don't have any other administrators. We don't have a sustainability officer in the in the district I wish we could have a sustainability officer, right? I wish because there are a million different ways we could be more sustainable as a district but we don't have the money. We've cut. And we now have probably seven, seven to nine bodies on a daily basis that are administrators, and they're juggling plates that are full beyond that. So if this wasn't a crisis in your mind that we were trying to answer with the parcel tax, it is now. You're going to see it now. So when we're talking about partnerships, there are so many areas where we could dive in. But I'm going to have to start saying more and more there is a need for, an addition, for additional parent responsibility. These traffic issues, if everybody slowed down, we wouldn't have to have a meeting till 9.15 at night talking just basically about the traffic issues and campus access issues. It takes all of us doing that part. I realize it's tough. There's a million things we juggle. But there are things I think we can address. Um, Dr. Weisberg and I, uh, last year when I was serving as president, uh, really wanted to make sure that council members got to see these Raptor systems in, uh, in play. So uh, I think we did have badges printed for the, for the council members, so we will make sure we get those to you so that you can have access and we can set up. Uh, hopefully we can pair off. Uh, and so that way you have a bit of a translator to help you see things differently, so that way we can give it through our lens and you can ask the questions that you want to ask. Um, uh, so that's, that's one. Centralizing a point of contact, you bet. Uh, staggering start times to try and alleviate kind of that. In, I, you know, I think there's certainly grounds for it. You know, Anthony Portantino just changed the law so school starts later. That's, it's, people are still getting to school late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're trying our best, I think, and there are so many different creative ways that, that school sites are doing this. Um, but genuinely, like, kids are always going to wake up late. Mm -hmm. They just are. Um, and for them, you know, they are. So, but mm -hmm. I think it's creative. Um, and I think on days, and if we're seeing specific peaks I, you know, this was year one, but if we're seeing trends where there's, in an ongoing way, um, issues with, then yeah, maybe we should have uh, work with our ASBs, see if they're interested in doing some sort of event to help draw kids in sooner, uh, or do something of that nature, distribute something. Uh, we can figure that out. But if it's if there's trends being established, let's follow up. Um, and Ms. Takahashi, if you would like to vacate. Clark Road right there in front of Burroughs, you know, I don't, I, we'll take it, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, it, that will create traffic, it, 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 I don't know, but I appreciate at least thinking outside the box. Uh, because there are, it is concerning when you see a line of students out the door. What's happening? Why, you know, it, it is. So I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, and also to you and, and to Mr. Anthony who came up with the creative concepts, you know, can we have, uh, that video 
would have worked, I think, for, for my generation. It needs some help for this generation because it needs to be under 30 seconds, right? The attention span is click, 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 click. It's good. The intention's good. The kids need to write it. That's what we learned in 2001. Um, in 2001, sorry, this is where I become the old man in the room, which is ironic. So in 2000, uh, we created a youth transportation program in the city called Got Wheels. And the least utilized bus service was Got Wheels. It was a free program. All students had to do, go to a park, one of the main, one of the three rec centers at the time, uh, sign up and get a badge and go. And they would have pickup sites at all, the, at all the elementary, all the middle schools, all the high schools, free. Shut down. Why? Lack of use. We advertised. We went out. It was what young people wanted. Uh, they identified that in the Youth Solutions Summit of 2001. They didn't utilize it. Because why? Uber, Lyft, everybody's got their own experience. They can have their own private car when mom and dad are driving. It's a different experience. They don't want to do public transit. And that is the real crux, is that do our kids want to, t is that a is that a viable option for them? That's the culture we've got to change, not whether or not we can have a whole new bus system. You know, we need more people taking buses. Um, so, uh, but it's been done. And, and that was, the other thing is, is working with our PIO. That was a brilliant program. It was actually called Teens in Action Media Communications Team. They won Emmys for the work that they did. And it was great mentorship, um, phenomenal mentorship. So um, I, I think that, that there's an opportunity with that. We have our media classes. I don't know if those teachers have the capacity or space or time, frankly, but it may be a good kind of end of year project to then work with BPD to identify the things that are most uh, challenging uh, to you and your officers uh, in terms of enforcement around traffic and see what their take is on it, how they address it. And if it's usable, great, then you guys are both answering a need. Um, but if we could explore that, I think that that's at least some runway for you uh, to work with. I did have um, a follow-up about traffic safety. You said that you guys are looking at data. You, you had mentioned, for instance, like the number of um, collisions. You know, you knew that that was a relatively minor number, or at least normal number in your mind. You have the data relative to, obviously, enforcement actions around school sites, right? Is there any, do we get a copy of that data, or is there a way we could share that data so that we know, hey, okay, Miller's having a little spike in an issue, or, oh, Roosevelt's having a spike. Mm -hmm. So that way we can move in real time, work with parent groups, things like that. Is there a way we could do that, or if we aren't doing that already? Yeah, that's something we can work on. Okay. Because um, uh, unfortunately, I have more than just the schools for the city yeah. to deal with. So <laughs> You're not busy know, at all. No, you know, of course Micro you versus are. Yes, macro, of so when we're going to get into the micro, totally. that, uh, I, I provide general overall statistics, but I don't get into the minutia unless it's a requirement because of a trend or a problem. Correct? Got it. Got it. Uh, is this something we can look at doing? I do have uh, some, an admin analyst that works in my office that we can explore this, but okay. uh, because you do get these five-week reports that I think is an excellent idea, okay. maybe this is something we can jump. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? That would be, I think it would be huge. And if we, I, I don't know what, we do five weeks, and I think it, it was really wise because Dr. Weisberg was pushing this behind the scenes. Uh, to get it every five weeks, because that's a grading period for us. If it's every 10 weeks for you, because it's just too much, I think that that correlates. I think as long as we're able to kind of get a picture and, and, and give us enough time to react, that helps. Uh, so I love teachers that gave me extra time to turn in my book reports. There so you go. <laughs> you give me I love those teachers weeks. too. <laughs> I love those teachers as well. Uh, so um, thank you for that. So I, I just want to, if we can get that data sharing going, I think that that will help us answer some of this. And, and um, you do have some of the hardest work out there. I mean, the, I, I've seen some parents like snap back and roar back, even kids roar back. Okay, first of all, we all just got through a collective near-death experience, so that's the reality, right? We're living in this weird world. It's a little odd. People are acting strange. Um, they are, and if you're not experiencing that, uh, Lord knows I am and in my everyday. And you know what all I'm trying to do is be a little bit more compassionate and go, gosh, they must be going through it. So... Um, that's going to be a little bit, and the world's going to have to just kind of level out. But I do think in the meantime, the sports we provide for kids are, are, are going to continue to be good, but they're only good because we partner in the school district with you all. Family Service Agency, we have a response to it. Um, Ms. Mullins, uh, Councilwoman Mullins, excuse me. Uh, nope, titles first. There you go. Um, 
when we're talking about neighborhood responses, right, you're hearing, you're hearing the traffic impact. We need to know those in real time, and we don't. Uh, right, I, I, you live a block away. The sponsor cam car is your neighbor. Uh, you know, she's right on the scene, right there. Um, but, but here's the challenge, right? Is that when I'm knocking on doors or when I'm communicating with na uh, neighbors who email us, hey, the school's having this impact. Inevitably, what am I, what am I going to say? Well, that's a city. You know, th what you're actually talking about is a city issue. And then, okay, and I'm going to direct them that way, right? Um, and that gets back and forth, right? You may get an email, and then you may say, oh, that's actually a school district issue. So what I'm actually proposing is that we've got 21 school sites. We don't have to adopt all of them. But every year, council member and school board member, we should go knock on those doors and around those school sites and say, hey, how do we be better neighbors? And by the way, here's the number, just in case. It's not difficult. It's four blocks. We've all knocked on doors except for, no, yeah, OK, yeah. Uh, has she done it yet? Anyway. It is, it is an old joke for us. Um, but seriously, I mean, that's what it's going to take. And I'm not afraid to go do it. I know you're not afraid. To, we've all knocked. So, but we need to get at that level. And what's really great is that that may inform traffic enforcement as well. But we can't have data that we, can't solicit, that we don't solicit directly. And if we're not humble enough to do it, then you know, we're going to keep having these issues. And I, I just I think you're going to approach. So I'm inviting you, Ms. Ms. Mullins, to join me. We'll go knock on doors around some schools. Monday morning, 7 o'clock, I'll meet you. Don't <laughs> <laughs> me with a good time. OK, let's go. So with that, um, I think that that is a, actually it's a real partnership. Because we're going to get to hear, as two representatives from the agencies, what's really happening and what that experience looks like. So um, beyond that, uh, that's about it. To, uh, when it comes to our, our SROs, um, I keep, I've heard everywhere around town how wonderful our SRO is. Uh, I love that, and I love hearing that. Um, this is not about a personality. That's the other thing. It's about what is the role of these SROs generally on our school sites. Um, I love what I hear when I hear it. Um, I don't know that every one of these positions needs to have a uniform officer on school sites. Um, when I hear some of the requests uh, that are being made, and uh, Ms. Perez, uh, Vice Mayor Perez, talked about you know drug treatment being a big deal, and we're hearing it from parents, vaping issues. Um, you know, we're talking about for the most part marijuana access, right? THC. Um, and, and there's no recovery programs for those. You, know, you, you, you need to figure out why you're, why you're using that, right? Why you're self-medicating. Um, but what we're not talking about is like other harder drugs, right? And where the recovery programs for that exist. You guys handle the law enforcement side. Um, there is, you know, we'll handle the absence side of that. But there are no drug treatment programs for young people in this region. And that is a city responsibility, generally, in terms of health and wellness. Uh, that's a county responsibility in terms of health and wellness. So we need to work closer on, on that front in order to support kids going through and who are using different substances to, to self-medicate. Um, but when it comes to our SRO, like I, I just wanted to pass along, there is great feedback. I do think we need to, you know, and, and you've always been a partner in this, so I'm not, you know, uh, we really do need to be careful, though, in this world that is a little weird, that is kind of leveling out after a really crazy experience. What police officers represent to some communities, and, and it's not even a 50-50 kind of, like, it is a please do not, um, that we are hearing from some of our parent communities. It's nothing due to you or your behavior or your actions any single day. It's just the state of, of where people are at. So when you hear, I'm hearing, you know, lobbying, you know, hey, we got to get our, our SROs back on campus. If, if it wasn't going to be an issue, fine, right? And, and what I'm saying an issue is, if there's a kid who goes, I'm not going to go to class today because that cop's on campus, that's an issue. That's not an issue for you to handle. You're just the police officers. You're just doing your job. But it is an issue for me as a school board member who has to make sure that that kid is in, is in their chair. So that's, I'm putting mission first, not because I don't like police officers, but because I want that kid in the chair. Because when I know he's in the chair, he's not somewhere else. Which then he is your problem. Uh, so, you know, so I, you guys are aligned on that mission. I think you understand that for the most part. But there's still not an articulated kind of way we're going yet. Uh, there's curriculum here, curriculum there. That's great. 
But I think we just need to double down this year. You have a subcommittee that is working. But I, I, if we can identify either curriculum or something specific to work on and get back to from the old model to this one, let's do it. But I, I just having officers, for instance, um, the officer is very, you, you were saying, like very relatable and somebody, or, um, somebody to look up to, uh, I think was the example. I think that's great. But how many of us stand aside on the side of the road? Sergeant, how many, how many times have you stood on the side of the road and just had a casual conversation with you know, an adult who came up to you and said, hey, you know, you're very relatable. And very, like, no, you interact because you're conducting an investigation or an enforcement action. Or, right? We don't hang out with cops for the sake of it. We interact with officers, and we interact with them for very specific reasons. And, and those are not informal and formal interactions. They are all formal interactions, right? Well, to, to answer your question, there is a difference in the SRO program, and the main goal of the SRO program is early intervention. I understand. Um, mm -hmm. And years ago, when we had the DARE program, there was a lot of interaction between the officers and the students. Mm -hmm. That has faded away over the years. We right. used to have five SROs plus one assigned to the Family Service Agency. Right. And the primary role of the SRO was for that early intervention to, to make it a more natural interaction with the officer. And no, it wasn't just for investigative purposes or right. to investigate a crime. It really was to build relationships. The SROs would commonly go out and play sports at lunchtime right. or just sit down and talk to the kids. They were um, advisors. They right. were, you know, a lot of the kids looked up to the officers, had questions, and it, it kind of did break down those barriers where kids had uh, underlying biases or they'd had bad experiences. This was a way mm -hmm. where it could be normalized. Right. And I understand that there are uh, families within the district who have have had bad experiences right. and who have strong opinions about that. And I'm not here to um, to argue that. It's certainly not my position to try to be forceful that officers need to be on the campuses. That is uh, something that's up to the district. As I mentioned, the SRO that's provided is mm. provided by the Burbank Police Department at at no cost to the district. Mm. And it's primarily because we recognize that it mitigates numerous safety concerns and numerous crimes from occurring before something catastrophic occurs. Sure. Um, I mentioned that we've had uh, just this, so far this school year, and I'm talking from August uh, 15th to now, we've had over 25 threat assessments. And in some of those, we have determined that there was a plan in place. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to mitigate that where Nothing occurred. No one got hurt. So when it comes to the, the value of having a school resource officer at least available to the schools, I definitely see the value in it. Right. But I do recognize that you know, I'm, I'm operating with the mindset of a police officer. Um, so, so I do recognize that. And, and I understand that people have different That's viewpoints. Right. But, but I do want to clarify that the police officers that are assigned as school resource officers, they do go through a stringent totally. selection process. So <clears throat> while Officer Roberts is in her own and an exemplary mm -hmm. example of what we would hope to have in that position, we've had a history of excellent school resource officers, and that is not mm -hmm. by chance, that's by design. That's by selection. That's by specific training. That's by um, supervision and mentoring and, and forming those officers into that position. Right. So um, I, I just want to just want to clarify. I, that. Yeah. And I look, you're talking about those kids as if they're abstract. I'm talking to you as one who was one. Sure. Um, right. I, I was at. Roosevelt Elementary School with Carol Schilf uh, and V. Jones. Uh, I, I have uh, Officer Adler uh, mm -hmm. as well. I remember these officers quite well. Um, and they are, for the most part, exemplary people and, and phenomenal people. And, but I am who I am. Sure. And that was my interaction with them. And it was mostly positive, but I was a kid who, held, who like, used to hang out some of my time in the, in the office. Like, we, like, you know, it happened. Um, but I'm telling you that there was other things happening. There was intel gathering, right, that you don't have control over, right, when some kid just says something and, and you hear it. 
Um, and that creates an environment that's more tense. So that's the example I'm trying to use. What I do want to find is those partnerships, because I do know that when you can break down those barriers, right, you are more willing to call if mom or dad is in trouble. And I think that there's both kind of joint ways that we can work on that. But I haven't seen an elementary school curriculum yet from you. I haven't seen examples of programs that could work quite yet. I've, I've seen, I've heard ideas, and I'm not saying specifically you, but I've heard ideas. Isn't it nice if, right, mm -hmm. but we've got 30 minutes. Right. Help us in that regard. So I want to get that to that constructive place, but let's get to a place where we have an actual model we can evaluate mm -hmm. and, and go, let's see. With one SRO, we really don't have the ability to institute any programs. Right. Um, so, we're very reactionary in our, totally. in our current state. And we understand that we are in the schools and operating at the pleasure of yeah. the board and the school district. If, if that school resource officer wasn't assigned to do her current job, right. uh, she would be out on the streets patrolling and, and still offering protection. That's right. Um, in every regard, our main focus is, is the safety of our citizens and of our youngest citizens. Yeah. So how that works with the school district is really... Uh, that would be a discussion between our chief and, and of course, you, you but, but I can tell you with only one school re resource officer, we don't have the staffing to institute any programs. Correct. And, and my, my position is, and I totally understand that, is that the old model, the 1990s model, okay, of, of doing that means that you shouldn't probably have any. And that's why we've got to work on finding a pathway because this community has identified having pathways and interactions between police officers and young people, that's a priority for us. And we're going, yeah, we want that, but we can't sacrifice one mission at the, at the altar of another. Sure. And that is what I'm trying to figure out. I know other colleagues have, maybe they figured it out on their own, but that's my question. So and we're I want, definitely not operating in that 90s model. We're not even I, operating I, in so that. So I understand that, but I haven't, I haven't heard of a new program yet. So sure. that's my challenge. Okay. So um, I, I want to get there. I want to be supportive, but I haven't seen it. So I, we can, we'll figure it out. Thank you. Board Member Tabit. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I can start with you since you're there. Sure. Um, I learned a lot tonight about SROs and her job, it, hers, this particular person this time, uh, that I didn't know. I was... Under similar, well, I'm not sure that's what you said, but but I remember I went to school in the 80s, and the SRO was just there. And I didn't necessarily have any interaction, but I know that he was there for whatever he was there to do, didn't really think about it. And then as I got on the board and learned more about <clears throat> SROs, um, I still thought of him as somebody who was there to create... Uh, relationships and and as you said come across with early intervention but listening to you tonight and talk about all the responsibilities on her plate it's so much more and I think you said something very vital it doesn't necessarily mean but that's still important but it's not about a body on campus it's that a someone with a certain skill set with certain training is available to help our schools and our principals in certain situations. And when you, you even talked about she's requested 160 times in a school year for certain events, for certain activities, for certain times of day. We're only in school 180. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of demand, plus everything else she does, on one person. And if She's able to do what she does, and we are a tad bit safer because of it, or kids are a tad bit better off as a result of something she's done, then wouldn't one more or a couple more be even that much better for our, our students? Just my thoughts and feelings. I, I, you don't, I know you're not going to answer me, but just wanted to share my thoughts about that. So thank you. And thank you to Officer Roberts. Do I have yes, her? Yes. Is, and is that her title? Yes, ma'am. Okay. For all the work she does, too. It's greatly appreciated. If one kid, in my opinion, 
survives or one kid is better off because of that, then we've done a, a good thing. And obviously she's affecting far more kids than just one. So I'm appreciative. Thank you. And I hope that we're able to add more to this program or more people or something. I really do hope that. So thank you. Uh, and listening to counsel and Mr. Ferguson speak to, I'm moving on, sorry, <laughs> to uh, um, Lieutenant Frommer's traffic report. When 2001 came in August, there were some, com after that horrific event in our community, and there's, that was just one. We've lived through others um, equally as horrific, and that's, you know, <laughs> when, when you're a council member or, or a school board member and your phone rings at 5 a.m. from the district or the superintendent, you know it's not a good call. You know it. And to get those and find out that some of your own students, either recent graduates or still students at our school, have been involved and, and there's deaths or horrific things, you, it just rips you apart inside. So um, after 2012, uh, 2011, when the accident on Glen Oaks happened. Oh, sorry. the Glen Oaks one was in 2021. 2021, thank you. There was lots of conversations about what do we do? How do we help? How do we make it safer to drive the streets of Burbank every day? And we did talk about, Mr. Ferguson, you're correct. Um, we got the program into the health classes, which was awesome. And then we talked about further, I know I talked about this with somebody, um, being able to create, with teacher buy-in, of course, the kids then that went through the the uh, safety in the health class would then partner with kids in the um, video production classes or something along those lines to create PSAs right. that then could be shown on the city's channel. Because you're right, there needs to be constant stuff thrown at them and constant, and especially as Mr. Ferguson said, other kids are making it, so it's relevant and using the vernacular that kids want to hear and relate to, then that's a great thing. And mm -hmm. if we start working on something along those lines now, it might be able next to get year. in in the next year. You know, you just have to pre-feed our, our teachers that this is an expectation. So I, that's something I'd certainly like to work on because I think it would affect a whole bunch of kids. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering, and this might only affect a couple hundred kids at both high schools, but... We currently, kids have to um, apply because not everybody gets a parking pass. Mm. So why not make one of the requirements like, gosh, we know in ninth grade you took this segment, and but now in order to be able to get a parking, you also have to watch these three videos or whatever or answer some questions or something in order, that's not your... <laughs> In order to be eligible to, um, sure, you know, because I know there's a GPA, I think, and sure, I don't know what else there is, but a lot of this stuff is very doable. We need a year's lead time because, of course, I know our our teachers have standing projects or assignments that they do. The assignment could be to create a video on safety. Sure, they just need to know that ahead of time to make it the assignment. So uh, I, th I think that they would do an amazing job. Uh, and I think that it, as, as was said several times, it will come from the perspective of kids and kids know what's gonna attract other kids and they'll do it for us and it becomes a project that they get a grade on and, and when they're gonna get a grade on it, they're gonna do a good job on it. So I think we can definitely make that happen. And then part of the parking requirement, that would be on on admin absolutely um, but we would need help creating whatever they were going to watch because i you probably want a, a little more maybe in depth now that they're actual drivers coming onto our campus might be a little different focus hmm. but you know stop at the sidewalk before you pull out from the parking lot don't peel out uh, we just had a accident with a staff member and a student yes. you know coming yeah. from opposite sides uh 
people not paying attention, remind them about hands-free, whatever it takes. But I think that might be another way because I, you said something that I thought was important, that there needs to just be constant reminders. Yes. Hey, when, school, when, when kids are, are around, it's a 15-mile-an-hour zone. Don't forget because that's ticketable or, or whatever the other things are that you had up on your list that was a, a reminder of what people get ticketed for. Absolutely. Um, and also, too, there was conversation with Mr. Ferguson, I think you said, about working with our neighbors right around the school. I had, um, the last time I ran, and I actually did go to Howdy. a few places, um, <laughs> uh, one of the neighbors across from Burroughs said, you know, I'd really like to hear from the school about hey, um, here's some things first semester that might cause noise. Here's a phone number after hours that you can reach. Here's, you know, whatever. And if it's not the principal or a board member knocking on doors, let's just send a district letter. Um, this, We've done those things before. We have. Okay, yeah. Let's, let's, and, it, and it works. You just need to be consistent with it. Yes. We want to be good neighbors, and we want to teach our neighbors how to be good neighbors. You know, people forget. They get irritated. They get angry. But you bought a house across from a football stadium. There's going to be announcements. The band is going to play. I don't recommend play. telling that to the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Personal experience? Personal experience? Um, but you. that's what I would love to say and the things we'd love to say and the things we actually do right. say, right? Okay. Anyway, those are just a couple of my um, little things I needed to say. But I think you all do an outstanding job and you know family members or friends that don't live here all talk about how lucky we are to live here um, because we have an amazing school district we have an amazing city staff and we have an amazing police and fire department so thank you for everything that you do I've lived here all my life which I'm old and I have not can't tell you I've had one bad experience when dealing with our police department, whether I was just, you know, a bystander or was the one that actually had to call because something was going on. Always do a top-notch job. So thanks. Thank you. Claire Ponser Kampkar. Sorry, I'll come back to traffic. I'll do the other one first. Um, so thank you. There's the chief. Um, thank you for all of you um, for just partnership and commitment on this. I, I especially want to shout out, like, last year we had a special meeting after the um, incident at Burbank High, and that meeting turned into that plus a lot of um, talk about sexual assault um, on campus. And so I just want to appreciate your support on that. I know you stayed after to talk to, to, talk to students, to talk to parents, and I think that meant a lot um, to those young women who came. Um, and I appreciate you saying like we can't always give people satisfactory answers because of the uh, because of the process. Um, and I think that was important for people to hear. It was important for me to hear, frankly. Um, so just a quick question on um, just the logistics of the reports that the SRO is receiving. So the the 250 reports is that across K twelve is that is that just at the high school level? So the 250 to 300 reports includes. Uh, the all of the suspected child abuse reports for the city of Burbank. Got it. it just so happens that most of those those children attend the schools within Burbank, but it's really anybody under the age of 18 um, that is suspected to be a victim of child abuse. Okay, great. That's super helpful. Um, and and I make up that many of those are coming from. Well, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I would make up that a lot of those are coming from school district employees because we're mandated reporters. Um, is that possibly the case, or are they coming kind of from all over the place? Um, they do come in from many sources. Sometimes they do come from district employees, but sometimes they come from healthcare professionals or. Um, therapists that children go to, and sometimes they come anonymously from um, other family members or neighbors that see or hear something and they make a report, and the Department of Children and Family Services deems that it meets the threshold for a report. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so how much, how much of, our, of our SRO's job is, 
is really responding to these 250 to 300 reports? It sounds like it's most of the job, <laughs> but correct me if I'm wrong. I, I can tell you that with one SRO, that officer is spread extremely thin. Um, I've been fortunate to have another officer on loan um, from the Traffic Bureau, which has been helping with um, those investigations. Additionally, when the SRO or that officer were not available, patrol would absorb the initial investigation um, into those suspected child abuse reports. So they do, they do encompass a large majority of her time, and she is responsible for handling um, the reporting and the follow-up on, on those reports. So every child abuse report uh, goes through a system that is managed by Department of Children and Family Services, and our school resource officer is the designated person in our department that has to do the mandatory uh, informational updates on what, what did our investigation determine? Was it uh, determined to be child abuse? Was it unsubstantiated? Was there an arrest? What occurred? So she is responsible for maintaining that system. So while she may not be out investigating every situation, she's the one that, that manages the um, reporting of it. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, folks have kind of weighed in on where they stand on adding additional SROs. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of a model where kind of we have additional support for this person completing all of these child abuse um, investigations and reports. Because um, it sounds like there's a real need for that. And the principals have identified that need as well. Um, uh, and like, I think I'm supportive of that in the, in the kind of construct constraints that like our senior staff and our principal kind of know who that person is. It sounds like we've developed a really great relationship with mm -hmm. Officer Roberts um, and that the principal kind of has control for who's the adults that are on their campus. Not control, but like that they are able to kind of direct that person and and intervene if they feel like things are inappropriate. Because um, I know, you know, I don't think that um, it sounds like we would never be going back to kind of a, a 1990s kind of world, but um, I think there's certainly an appetite of like, what is what is even returning to a pre-COVID world look like? Um, and wanting to make sure that we're kind of adjusting adjusting in real time. And and the other thing that Dr. Perum and I have talked about a little bit is because this person's job is so much of these child abuse reports. Like, is there um, is there a bifurcation of secondary versus elementary? Because certainly there's there's reports coming in across the board, or or is there um, is there some way that we can kind of separate out the, the duties for these additional folks so that um, we don't necessarily have to feel like there's, um, that we're returning to a 1990s model where there's like kind of, where students may perceive that the police officers there is like the de facto security guard, right? And I don't think that that's what the officer wants to, wants to feel like either. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, like what, in an ideal world, right, like what would you actually need in order to complete all of the work that you want the SRO to be able to complete in a in a timely manner, right? Like That's do you need question. one additional SRO? Do you need 10? <laughs> like does each school need one? Like what, what does that actually look like? I think that would be best deferred uh, to my chief. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good response. Yes. Well it's only well done. 10 to so, 10, sir. Uh, to answer your question, it really depends. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a need? Absolutely. And, and it should be um, shared with you is that at the beginning of each school year, typically in September, our whole command staff, juvenile bureau, and traffic meet with all the principals and BOSD staff. And, and we, we chat. We, we talk about what is working, what is not working. Mm -hmm. And there's a common theme, and that theme is the overwhelming support for the SROs. And um, <clears throat> uh, it's genuine, and they, they like the program. So um, best case scenario uh, today uh, to have at least a second F uh, SRO, uh, certainly to provide some relief for the Detective Bureau and Officer Roberts as far as the SCAR reports and all the other uh, demands on on that position. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, what is the magic number at one point in time? I think there was seven uh, SROs back many years ago. Don't know if that was too much uh, right now. Probably two or three in time. Uh, it just depends. It, went, it also depends on the trends and themes that we're seeing in the schools. So uh, that's why it's important that we maintain Dialogue. Dr. Pramo has my personal cell phone number. If there's an issue, he'll phone me directly. In fact, we're connected with all the principals and detectives. So uh, if there is a need, we're going to provide that need. Right. Okay. Thank you. you I appreciate that. Yeah. You want to add? I, can. I get all the, the reports that come through. I, get, I see them all, and I read most of them. And it's spread out throughout the school district. From a perspective, you know, not to overstate what the chief said, but one SRO for each high school and one for each uh, middle school is probably where we would get the best bang for the buck. Now, do we have the staffing for that and do we have the funding for that, right? That's, that's going to be the big question at the end of the day. But from a workload um, perspective, that would give us the ability to handle those schools. And then each of those uh, SROs at each of those schools in the perfect world would be assigned an elementary school. So they would have a couple elementary schools each and then the private schools. And then also assigned by uh, the uh, schools that uh, John Frommer was talking about. There's a whole other host of schools that we're not talking about here that are privately uh, dealt with that would also need some attention and some of those scars come from. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be like the perfect world from where my desk is and when I see all the reports. Uh, the question is going to be staffing and uh, funding. Great. Thank you. All right. Now I have questions about traffic. <laughs> Hello. Um, actually, um, so Ms. Tabbitt brought up the idea of, of having students watch videos. The other thing that I thought of is, um, because parking at school is a privilege, is there, and I feel like this came up last year at the joint meeting, was this idea of like sharing data on whether students are having um, moving violations um, near school property as, as part of a gate for them to go through in terms of getting their parking pass. Is that data, are we able to figure out how to share data and match data in that way, or is that too... Um, it, it'd be a discussion. Obviously, we'd have to incorporate the city attorney on this mm -hmm. on what can be shared and what could not be shared. Again, we're dealing with juveniles. So mm -hmm. We are dealing with legal matters. Uh, those are, if we're talking about just traffic infractions, mm -hmm. um, but then it, it is a more of an in-depth discussion. But uh, if it benefits the school and benefits the ability to allow them to park on campus or not, it may be something worth pursuing. Okay. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, the other thing I would say on this is, um, I know uh, Council Member Anthony brought up school buses. Um, have we thought about doing the valet program at middle schools? I know that middle school students, you know, don't really love um, having their parents follow them to school, but they are probably getting rides anyway. My son will not let me drop him off on the block at school. Could we I'm sorry. could we set up the valet line like a block away <laughs> in a way that would make it appropriate for teenagers? I just I think that that might be a better solution than than busing. Um, He's gonna kill me. Okay. He's gonna kill. No, okay. he can he can come he can come talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I just I think Growth. I think that middle school students could also have the same like um, I see our our like upper elementary students uh, managing the valet every morning and uh, I'm joking, I but I, I actually agree with you. Yeah. I, I think it would be fantastic okay. if we did it at the middle school. Let, let's yeah. let her finish your question. <laughs> I do I do think the eighth graders would enjoy that um, sense of power of running the valet line as well. Um, so I'd love to, to see that move. And then um, I just, uh, I know that there's, in terms of safe streets and that planning that's going on, um, one way to, um, I hope, reduce our number of, of traffic incidents is um, encouraging walking and biking to school in a safe way. Um, is, is that something that your team is is supporting on Safe Streets about, or like how how is that all kind of coming together, and are you taking into account like the fact that kids, a lot of kids walk, do walk and bike to school? Yeah, we are supportive of that. And every year through the California Office of Traffic Safety, they help support and promote the walk and bike to school day. Uh, uh, not every school will participate because it's always at the beginning of the school year, mm -hmm. and people quite, uh, sometimes people just aren't ready to put this together. Um, but the numbers uh, seem low. So when we help at the various schools, when we do do the day, 
the, the number of children that actually participate in the walking and biking is relatively small. Um, I, don't, I don't work at the schools on a daily basis. I can't talk about generally on a, on a daily or weekly basis. I'm not sure. Uh, but I do know the number of people individually driving their children to school is increasing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep, for sure, for sure. Um, and then the last thing I'll say um, along with that is I love this idea of doing the education that the council member Takadashi talked about with the smaller children. Um, young kids are really good narcs. Um, I know my children would probably correct my driving if they knew to. Um, so, and they... They love, uh, you know, they love seeing people in uniform. So, like, would really encourage working with the with the elementary schools and getting them to understand, like, oh, your re your parent really shouldn't be letting you do that. And you could really <laughs> tell them Absolutely. not to let you out. Very yeah. honest. I need Jack a tip line. Com car. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for all that you do. I appreciate it, Dr. Agukanian. Thank you. I think all my colleagues have all, all the questions and beyond, so I want to thank you um, for all you do. But also, ultimately, it is really a question. Do we need more SROs? Yes. We need, I hope we figure out a way, maybe partner, try to see if we can get one more. And I know we have funding issues, but that is the reality of it, that there is a need, but we're going to have to come up with some kind of a creative way to hopefully figure this out. Thank you. OK. Um, a lot of uh, what I have questions about, I think we can do in the subcommittee meeting. So it would be wonderful if we can get that on the book so that there, I have a lot of follow up, but now it's not the time because it's a million o'clock. Um, I will go six, fast. Eight. So, uh, Sergeant Lawfer and Lieutenant Lasago, I want to echo what the Clerk Ponser Kamkar said. It will remain very much ingrained in my mind the kindness and empathy that you showed those young ladies after our meeting. It was an unbelievably difficult meeting. You didn't have to stick around, but you did. And I really think it made a huge difference. So I just want to thank both of you for that. Um, I really won't forget it. Um, I will ask almost all of these questions. A lot of my questions have to do with the training the SRO receives, how we're adjusting that training for the large influx of um, asylum seekers and immigrants that have come into Burbank Unified and will continue because we know that um, young people from different countries have very different relationships with um, police and so just, I, I don't know what's out there, but something that, so I have questions about training. I have questions about some of those requests. Um, what sparks threat assessments? I, mean, I think overall what I want to say, and I, and I think everybody in this room knows this. I mean, Sergeant Turner was unendingly helpful. The chief has been helpful from the moment I came on board, um, is that, you know, questioning the efficacy of SROs is not an anti-police statement in the slightest. I think everybody up here is unendingly appreciative and knows how lucky we are to live in a city that has, what, a three-minute response rate. Um, so I, I, I want to say it out loud because I know, like, that in, in conversations with the police commission that I am viewed very much as anti-officer and I am in no way anti-officer. And I, I just feel like it's important to say that to you publicly, that I have deep respect for the work that you do. I have. I continue to. But, you know, that being said, our job as board members is to be thinking about our students, right, in the same way that your job is as Officer Roberts' job is to think about the students when she's on school sites, and your job is to think about all of the million and 12 things you think about on a daily basis in your job. So I, I think it's really important that when we have these conversations, it's not framed as a pro or anti-police conversation, but rather, how are we best effectively using our resources? Now, I think it's really clear that having an SRO dedicated entirely to SCAR reports, and I wish we could call it something else, it's the worst, but would be really valuable so that it frees up Officer Roberts to do the good work she's doing. Something I asked uh, Dr. Paramo to look into, and I appreciate it, is he spoke to all of the principals. Um, I think w taking a more individualized approach because so I'll give you an example. Um, April Weaver at Monterey talked a lot about how important having an SRO presence was there because it helped the students there create a positive relationship with police when many had previously come from a place where they had not had positive interactions with police. Um, so that's obviously maybe not what's going to be happening at Disney Elementary, right, or at a different high school. And so I think taking a more individualized approach and figuring out which school sites are, are asking for and can really benefit from Officer Roberts being there on a regular basis. Um, and so I'd love to be able to initiate 
twice a year, beginning of the year and at the end of the year, just to sit down with Officer Roberts and who and and you and just to sort of debrief and plan ahead. Um, because it makes it makes me more informed. I think it makes all the board members more informed to know what's happening. Um, I haven't even met Officer Roberts yet, so I'm super excited to meet her because I've heard wonderful things. So I think it's just about having these these ongoing conversations and communication. So this isn't the only time we're talking about it. Um, and I also too just want to remind my colleagues that our personal experiences are not the experiences of our students. Um, and so when we're making decisions and we're thinking about what we need on our campuses, we we should be a little mindful of what our experiences were in comparison to what our students' experiences are right now. Um, the the last thing I'll ask, and this is a longer conversation, is just about mental health support. Um, the data shows that how important it is to be investing in um, social workers, mental health professionals, counselors in partnership with SROs and other people on campus. So the, I think this this uh, sort of motivates a longer conversation, whether it's in the subcommittee or somewhere else, about how we can better support our students in concert with our SROs. Um, and I have myriad questions about that, which we can talk about offline. But I think um, more consistent communication would be a really wonderful place to start. And and putting a little more thought on our end into which school sites are really asking for and looking for um, more consistent SRO presence and which ones are like, no, we're good, we're okay. But it'd be cool for them to stop by once in a while. So I think we've taken more of like a kind of a blanket approach, but maybe on our end being a little bit more specific with the need could help Officer Roberts figure out perhaps the best use of her time, even though she's still going to be split into a million different avenues. But if we had a second SRO who took the huge chunk of those reports off of her plate. She's still going to she's still going to be stretched too thin, but I think it would be effective and then we can sort of take a step back and say, "Okay, how did this go?" So, much more in the future. Um thank you to everybody for the reports. They were really helpful and really thorough. Um I want to remind my esteemed colleagues if we can keep our comments to questions. Um and just be mindful of the time. It is 10:03 in the PM. Um, but obviously the reports that you gave were fantastic and they generated an enormous amount of conversation. So thank you. Thank you to everybody. Um, so yeah, just a gentle reminder. I appreciated Miss Ponser Campcar timing herself and in keeping with asking people to be brief, council member Anthony has something to say. Uh, here's a follow-up. <laughs> I do have one follow-up question. Um, I, I haven't seen, uh, officer Roberts, uh, in action on duty, um, what, does she wear the standard dark navy uniform like Burbank PD? Yes, yes. She wears the same uniform. Uh, you actually met her in the lobby of our police department one time. That is her. Okay. That, I that was her, her and I that, that were with you that day. I remember it was you. Yeah, yes. I wasn't sure if that yes. was her. Yes, that was okay. Officer Roberts. Okay, great. So, so yes, I have. For so the, the for standard the rest, uniform. Yes, for the rest of the board. She, she does wear the standard uniform that our officers would be seen on the streets in. She did great, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the reason I ask that, we've had great success um, with some of our team that does um, sort of the, the more plain clothes when we do um, mental health stuff um, with anyone. There's just, just this, I'm throwing that out there. But thank you. And yes, she was great. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna jump in now. I have no questions, uh, but Lieutenant Lasako, um, uh, 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 Oh, sorry, I thought that was a question for me. Uh, Lieutenant Frommer, uh, Sergeant Lawfer, I just want to thank you all for staying so late, for the comprehensive uh, presentation, for fielding questions over an hour and a half, if I timed it correctly. Um, <laughs> no, no, that, that's not a slight. I mean, there was excellent discussion and dialogue. I have nothing further to add, but I want to thank you for being here this late and for provide, providing that context to us. Um, so with that, I don't see that there being any further need of action or vote by the, uh, by the body. I think we'll move on to our next agenda item. Um, so thank you all, and thank you, Chief. Um, folks, we have about four more agenda items. So in a minute, I'm going to ask staff if there are any items that you are recommending can be moved to a later meeting. We'll obviously put that for consideration by the whole body. I'm not dictating that. Um, I just want to ask 
uh, moving forward for all of us voluntarily, not to be stringently enforced, but I'm asking you to voluntarily try to confine your questions and comments to a couple minutes so that we can get through the rest of these items. If you need longer, you need longer, but if you can sum it up in you know two, three, five minutes, that would be much appreciated. Staff, are there any items that you're recommending can be moved to a later meeting? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could chime in. Uh, we only have one uh, of the four remaining items. We only have one action item, which is um, item number four, the joint resolution. Uh, being the given the late hour, I'd recommend uh, doing that one. And we could always uh, take these three and carry them over to uh, um, our next meeting. Dr. Parama, what's your uh, take? I'm fine with that. Okay, so colleagues, I think we should have some discussion on that issue, but quickly, are there, I think I agree, action item four should be considered. Uh, my preference would also be um, item six. I think it's quick, and it was carried over from the last meeting as well. Um, I do feel awful for Lieutenant Green, who I think is still somewhere here on item three. <laughs> we could do that quickly. Uh, it just depends on if we can keep comments and questions fairly limited. I have no problem moving item five to the next meeting. Anyone have a different opinion? No? Okay, so uh, if we can just do by a show of hands, is everyone fine with moving item five to the next report quickly and expeditiously doing item three since Lieutenant Green has waited and proceeding with four and six for action? Show of hands in favor? Okay, record will reflect that's unanimous 10-0 vote. Um, so item five is removed uh, or moved to the next meeting. Thank you. Lieutenant Green, if you want to come up and present our third report this evening, and we'll try to be uh, quick in our questions. Uh, for the record, uh, item three is a report on our joint mental health initiatives. Um, I wel be welcome back, of course, Dr. Paramo and Lieutenant Derek Green uh, to provide the report. Thank you, Mayor Schultz. Good evening, Vice Mayor Perez, Council Members Takahashi, Mullins, and Anthony. Uh, I'm Derek Green, Lieutenant. I oversee our Community Outreach and Personnel Services Bureau, and encompassed under that is our mental health evaluation team. I'm here uh, to provide a brief update on an unmarked vehicle. As the chief says, it was a journey. It certainly has been a journey that spanned the course of uh, about four years. Um, so to lay some foundation, uh, just to refresh our MET team is a co-response model. It partners a police officer with a clinician from the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, as well as an administrative analyst that uh, assists with case management and provides analytical and statistical data. So I will go back to the uh, early 2021 when uh, Assistant City Manager Paget, at the time she was Police Administrator Paget, and the chief drafted a comprehensive staff report that went to the city manager as well as city council, um, seeing the need to um, increase our resources in addressing uh, the increase in calls for service involving mental health and the unhoused population um, and expanding the service delivery model of the mental health evaluation team. And a component of that was to implement a, an unmarked vehicle for the purpose of transporting individuals that were experiencing mental health crises. Um, this vehicle would have had a customized interior. At the time, it was a relatively new um, idea and we were one of the first agencies to actually consider onboarding such a vehicle. Um, so I will briefly go over this timeline that you see before you again in 2021, uh, City Council. And I, and I want to quickly recognize, I know it's late, but I do want to recognize the people that were involved in bringing this um, idea to a reality, um, beginning with the city manager who listened to the ask, um, agreed that it would be beneficial for the community, uh, onto the city council who approved the funding for this project and of course all of the city staff since then that has taken the time to outfit this vehicle, uh, really a one-of-a-kind unique vehicle for the organization. So in 2021, the council approved the expansion of the MET service delivery model that included appropriating the funding to purchase a designated unmarked utility transport vehicle with a modified interior. Also in 2021, towards the latter part, the vehicle was ordered. It was a 2022 white Ford Explorer. Now, as with uh, is typical with ordering new fleet vehicles, there was a bit of a wait for this car. We had to uh, wait upwards of a couple of years before we actually took delivery. Um, it was an arduous journey. And if I'm missing something, I will have the chief pick me up because he was personally involved with this journey. Well, in the COVID, COVID time, the pandemic uh, slowed the production of, of vehicles, so the inventory was sparse. Um, and then uh, once we took delivery in 2023, we immediately started equipping it and outfitting it uh, in preparation for deployment. 
Um, in early 2024, the vehicle was completed and has since been deployed. So I'll go through some highlights now on the vehicle itself. Um, it is plain white. There are no police logos or police designation. It has what we refer to as a personalized safety compartment. It is a, I'll show you some photos in a moment, um, but it provides um, a therapeutic mode of transportation for people that are experiencing uh, mental health crises. There is also an adjacent rear seat for, for a clinician, a support person, um, whatnot, which is a very important part of this, and you'll see that in a second. The vehicle is equipped with latest technology and avionics. It has a removable laptop, um, in-car camera system that is compatible with the current Axon body-worn camera system, so it, it syncs directly with our evidence cloud-based storage database, and also equipped with GPS tracking. The vehicle is equipped with low-profile hidden emergency lights. They are used only if and when necessary. At the end of the day, this is an on-duty police vehicle, so it needs to be equipped as such to uh, be in compliance with the California Vehicle Code. And the next slide. So here are a couple of photos. This is the car on the left. Uh, nothing extraordinary about this. It, it does resemble uh, an unmarked police vehicle. It certainly does. Um, but, you know, the, the goal of this, especially in, in reference to responding to calls for service at our local schools, is that it is, is not marked. Um, it removes some of the stigma that's often associated with police cars. Um, it does not draw as much attention as a black and white police car parked outside of a school. It's a little bit more discreet. And of course, it is equipped much different than a traditional police car. On the right is the interior driver passenger area up front. It's very similar to a regular police car. Now that is a Panasonic Toughbook. That is the latest in technology for our mobile display terminal. What's interesting and unique about this is it is already compatible with our upgrade to the new um, computer-aided dispatch and record management system that we are in the process of onboarding. So eventually all of our patrol vehicles will have that removable laptop. In the next slide, you'll see the rear portion of the vehicle. So on your left is the personalized safety compartment. Now this compared to a traditional police car has a lot more leg room. Um, it is more spacious. I have personally sat in this seat and I noticed a, um, a recognizable difference as from a traditional police car. So um, it is still secure. At the end of the day, it still needs to be secure because the nature of mental health calls are always unknown. Uh, they can be volatile, they can turn violent quickly. Um, so we do need to have a secure compartment. In the right photo is the adjacent support person seat. This is unique in that it allows a cl clinical social worker, a support person, a parent of a minor to sit back there and be able to converse, um, provide that therapeutic care during transport um, and, and that comfort level for whoever you are transporting. So that is one of the um, real selling points of this vehicle. And I'm just going to provide a few recent case studies since we have deployed the vehicle on the next slide. We are being vague with these just to protect the privacy of the involved individuals. But in February, the vehicle was used. Uh, an elderly woman was uh, reported missing and located. She was not comfortable in being transported in a traditional black and white marked police vehicle. We offered up the unmarked vehicle and it was deployed from the station. It is deployable 24 hours a day. The watch commanders have keys. Um, it has a designated parking spot, and that uh, individual was willing to get into the unmarked vehicle for transport for care. In March, we transported a young child who was experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, we used the vehicle and some encouragement, and the child willingly rode discreetly and comfortably to the hospital. Side note on this one is we did offer uh, the parent to ride along in the support seat. They respectfully appreciated it, but did decline the offer. Um, in April, we uh, just actually, this is, this is last week, we respond, responded to a local school. This was a student requesting assistance uh, and support related to mental health. And the investigation did culminate in a um, committal and transportation of the student to a behavioral health center for minors. So again, we were able to deploy this with our MET team from the station uh, much more discreetly at the school and uh, comfortable for the patient. That was quick. I was I moved quickly, but outstanding. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have.
All right, we'll try to be just as quick. President Weisberg, all you. Uh, we'll do school board first. Uh, board member Ferguson. Thank you. This has taken years, but it's been a partnership. It's been a compassionate model that you guys are deploying. And, and to Chief Albanese, who I think I was instrumental in moving this forward, and uh, to you, I can't thank you enough. And I, I have followed up on this year after year after year. Not to any of your uh, problem. You guys aren't delaying this. You guys want it. You wanted the resource. Um, but in this town, we hospitalize quite a few kids every year, kids who are having the worst day of their lives potentially, but it could be the best day of their life if they are being introduced to a model that gives them care and gives them support. So being able to do that and not be featured on, the, on Instagram is huge. Um, and so uh, to this police department who does get it, um, this is an example of what happens when we can give feedback and support each other in our missions. Because this is you guys at your best and this is the city at our best as a result of it. So thank you guys for your service. And, and this is just, it's a huge victory. And Chief Albanese, uh, you've created the culture uh, since you've come here, along the work with your leadership team, well, and I appreciate you. But, but, but thank you, but it's a collective team effort. We button. had a lot of folks that uh, same I, I have no doubt that there are, but I, I am going to call out leadership where, I, where at least I see it as a leader who's independently elected to do so. <laughs> thank you. Board Member Tabbitt. Real quickly, can you tell me one more time um, the team that supports this vehicle it is a police officer so trained the in mental team, health? Yeah, the yes, MET team you. has primary responsibility over the vehicle. That is a police officer who is a uniformed police officer, although sometimes the officer wears a, a softer uniform, what we refer to as a softer polo style uniform. She works daily with a licensed clinician mm -hmm. that is employed by the Department of Mental Health and also an administrative analyst. So it's a three-person team. But the car can be deployed by any police officer at any time. Okay. And so this is really a report on the car, not necessarily the MET team. Um, okay. The car is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Clerk, sponsor Cam Car. Cam Car. Just thank you. That's all. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Huge thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's huge. I know Dr. Prama and I talk endlessly about the trauma that we inadvertently often put on our kiddos when they're having mental health crises, and the only way to transport them is via police car. And this provides such a more um, humane option for our students who will, you know, and, and again, it's through no one's fault, like that was what we had available to us. But I think this was, this is a huge step. Um, I'm really, really excited and really, really relieved and I think it's going to make a huge difference for our students. So thank you for the investment in it. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we're on to, is Dr. Agakanian doing any questions? He's not. Comments? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, on to council, council member Mullins, anything? Huge. Thank you. I sat in the back of that vehicle mm -hmm. and I agree with you. Lots of room there. Thank, Thank you. you. And she was there voluntarily just checking it I, out. I, I, I just I want to be having, very clear. Uh, I was having a long council meeting and they had to do it. <laughs> there are moments. Uh, council Member Takahashi. I think it was parked out there earlier. Is yes, I, I should have said that. Uh, we did have it parked out there for a little over an hour and a half. Um, so if anybody had a chance, we had the doors open, opportunity to sit inside. We did have it you know, cleaned and detailed. But um, yeah, hopefully some, some of you got a chance to see it. Yeah. It's gorgeous, and I, I also had an opportunity to sit in it. And, I, and this, this vehicle has been a labor of love for many years, and so much blood, sweat, and tears has gone into getting this produced and you know, purchasing it, but then getting it actually delivered. And, and I, I know that this has been um, something that uh, has been somewhat of a con co causing consternation <laughs> in the department, but now it's here. And I'm so proud of our city for, for having this, this vehicle. You mentioned we're one of the first to adopt a vehicle like this. At the time when we, we approved the funding, we were one of the first to consider onboarding a, a, a dedicated, modified vehicle specifically for transporting in these situations. Yeah. I remember back in, in 2019, 2020, um, 
I had heard about the star van in Denver and I'd called in the police commission and mentioned the star van and it was just kind of an idea. And it, like, like months later it would came back as a report. And then months later after that, the, it, it just, the ball got rolling really quickly. Everybody seemed to be pretty excited. And I'm so, this is really, it's really amazing to be at this point to see it all come to fruition and finally have the vehicle in our, in our fleet. So thank you to everybody who's put effort into this. Thank you to the folks who use it to deploy and discreetly and help our community and uh, and and I just can't I just can't say enough how much I love this uh, this van so thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Anthony. Um, the chief and I have talked about this for a long time and and seeing it deployed and its success is it's it's, uh, it's exciting to see. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Vice Mayor Perez. I mean, same as everybody else. <laughs> But um, one thing I do want to mention is I, I want to make sure that our colleagues on the school board who haven't had the chance to see it get a chance to, to take a look. Anytime, yeah, and we can facilitate that at your next meeting. We can have it brought out there at, at, uh, beforehand. And absolutely. You mean hey. Armand? No. Well, one time. Around the <laughs> once around the block. No, that's the, uh, and our, our MET team does work expanded hours. They work into the evening until um, either 8 p.m. or 10 p.m., so we can facilitate that. We'll, we'll connect and make sure that happens. Sure. Thank you so much. And, and this car is wonderful both for the folks who have to take a ride in it and for the clinicians yeah. and the officers in the car. So great all around. Sure. And hopefully next we can work on getting that second clinician. That's part of that expansion. Yeah, we're still working on that. Yeah. Better for us all. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I just want to say thank you all for staying so late. Great work. I, I know this is only one half of the vision you have, Chief, and we'll keep working on the other half. I personally love vehicles that are blue and gold, but that's just a personal preference. White is perfectly fine, too. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mayor. All right. We are on to item number four. Item number four is our fourth report this evening on a joint resolution in support of the LGBTQ plus community and inclusiveness. At this time, I welcome BUSD uh, Superintendent Dr. John Paramo to present the report. I would uh, say that uh, recently, last week, being able to sit uh, with our city manager and review the document, uh, was a uh, proud moment and our agreement to uh, solidify our commitment to this group uh, was uh, personally very uh, important to me and I'm glad that we can move that forward. Uh, it's important to our kids and it's important for our families to know that we are inclusive and protective of our kids. Our kids come to us every day at school and however they come, we will serve them, we will protect them, we will make sure they're safe so that they can learn. And that's what this is really about. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I would, sorry, was there anything else? Okay. I'd like to, uh, I, you know, my understanding is that uh, Councilmember Anthony and uh, Board Member Ferguson, uh, you two are really leading the charge on this agenda item. So I'd like to let you go first in whichever order you think makes the most sense. And then we'll go to everybody else. Um, if it's all right, um, Mr. City Manager, do you mind going through the the, the resolution as we have it, or, or the language, anything that we've put together, or do we just start from scratch? What do you? What do you mean? We have, we, we have a, a draft. You have a draft. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm I'm asking, should we just read through it, or well, how are you? I I'm trying. Um, I don't I, know. Reading through it is the best. Uh, that's going to, I think, take a long time. I, oh, I Mr. Hess, if, if yeah. I might, um, because it was uh, published on the city website and it's a publicly okay. available document, I think if you have questions about the resolution or suggested changes or if either of you wanted to provide a little bit of background, that's great. Okay. But that's where we should leave the conversation. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a late hour. It's fine. Um, this was brought up uh, last year. Um, agendized by both bodies. Um, I think it was timely. There was, um, I feel, a need from the community. Um, this arose from uh, many conversations, not just between my, myself and Mr. Ferguson, but the both of us um, speaking with the community, seeing what is happening um, both in the schools with our young folks and out in the community. Um, I think at this joint body, 
the statement it has more power. And so um, I was happy, more than happy, to um, work with Board Member Ferguson to put this on our joint agenda. Um, and um, I think it's, a, a, it's an excellent um, stance for us both to take. Okay. Thank you very much. Board Member Ferguson, I know you champion this. What would you like to add? Yeah, um, so, you know, it's almost a, like Sicily, 1950. Like, when we take ourselves back to when this was happening, um, we had a flag burning at Sadequoy Elementary School, uh, and we had the Glendale Unified School Board meeting, you know, eventful meeting, uh, that, that traditionally, you know, maybe 30 people will show up for. Maybe contract negotiations bring out teachers, but this had 300 people. And they had to have the elected board. This is, again, not some remote town. This is next door. Uh, and they had to have those board members shelter in place. Losing control, losing democracy of its, so, of its sorts in education. If you're an LGBT young person and you're seeing that, what does that mean when the city next to you and to the other side of you both have, are having these issues? It's pretty profound. Um, and it's been a tough time, not just for those who are of the community, the LGBTQ plus community, it's been hard for the teachers who have to teach the lessons of, of, of equality, right, of, of equity, harassed for following state curriculum. Under, you know, it just, it hasn't ended. And so it is, uh, you know, uh, part of the uh, delay in this was figuring out, could we even do this? And to me, what I think is really beautiful about that is that means it's a first. And it sends the right value system uh, that this town is, is, though surrounded by whatever, that, that our values are very, very straight. Forward. Thank you. That's it. Thank you both for your passion and moving it forward. Um, let's go with council. Um, so council member Anthony, you went. Um, any other council members have questions or comments on this issue? Seeing... Oh. I just have a comment. Please. I think this is a no-brainer. <laughs> Thank you both for bringing it forward. Um, I, I think, you know, Board Member Ferguson put it very, very nicely and gently. But I will say, in the last year, I'm watching as a member of the LGBTQ community. And we have had hate speech at our school board meetings. We have had hate speech here against council members, against um, people in the community. It's, it's no secret. It is happening left and right. People find ways to sneak it into public comments about other things. People find ways to bring in gender um, and sexuality into comments that have nothing to do with that, only to get their hate speech through. It has even led to people threatening my life. So I think this is beyond the pale of the things that we see. And I think here, by, and I'm sure you have experienced this too, Board Member Ferguson, but as you sit here, the one thing you think about when you, you get a, a piece of hate mail or an angry message or a derogatory comment is... If I am experiencing this as an elected official in this city, as an adult, what are the children in our schools going through? And so I think this is absolutely a no-brainer and unequivocally states where we stand. That's all. Thank you. Councilmember Takahashi? Yeah. yeah, thank you for bringing this resolution um, to Councilmember Anthony and Board Member Ferguson, bringing this to us to, for consideration. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important... It's important for our community to see the leaders of our community standing together in unity around this issue and supporting them. Um, I do have a couple uh, requests in the language of the, of the um, document, just because um, I think that we owe it to our community to have a very high quality document, so I'm being kind of picky with the language to make sure that it's grammatically correct. Um, so in the paragraph where it says, whereas laws enshrining equal access, that's actually, the whole paragraph is a, a sentence fragment. <laughs> so if we could change triggering to has triggered to make it a full sentence, that's okay. Uh, just while we're on the point, anyone have an objection to that grammatical change? Mm -hmm. No? Where are we talking? Yeah, whereas laws enshrining equal access to employment, housing, and public facilities, as well as laws which prescribe, there's, it's a, the whole thing For, is a Fourth a whereas. Sentence. The fourth one. The yeah. fourth, I mean, yeah. number, I mean, most of these, most resolutions are just entirely run on sentences. <laughs> the, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't mean that's pejoratively, like, they're honestly, each whereas is like one long, giant sentence. I understand. 
they are complete sentences, though, and that one is a fragment. So I just thought it would be nice to, to switch it to uh, has triggered. And then I'm fine if you guys don't want to, but it's just important to me to have high quality. And then the last um, paragraph where it says, therefore, in the very last, next to last sentence where it says, uh, allies and members of the LGBTQ community taking Burbank too closer to what? There's an extra two in there, so I just want to take that out to fix the typo. But just little things, make sure it's, okay. you know. So I, I heard eliminate an extra two in the mm -hmm. final paragraph yeah. and uh, convert triggering to trigger. Yeah, has I still don't. I yeah. still That's, don't. Oh, is there any any objection to those minor changes? Uh, I was. I asked. It, does, it just changed the tenses. So if we're if we're gonna ask for high quality at the risk of looking like I'm slumming it, mm -hmm. um, I don't know that. How does that? Whatever. It's fine if you don't want to, but I I, I just. It, it, and not being a complete sentence was, uh, you know, just I noticed it. But uh, that's fine if we don't change it. And the extra two, though, I think is pretty, pretty easy. Mr. City Attorney, should, the, uh, should our two bodies adopt the joint resolution, could we count on staff to do a comprehensive review to catch any typos, extra words, clean up the language, check tenses? Is that, would that be sufficient direction that we could provide tonight? That rather is than sufficient direction. Outstanding. Yes, Mr. Uh, Hess. I just want to confirm, uh, uh, both bodies are okay just having the mayor and uh, president sign, or would you like all to sign? It's. I, I would preference. like everybody to sign it if people are amenable to that. Yes. I, 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 I'm feeling consensus on that issue. The other thing I would add, I'm sorry to go out of turn, but since we're on the topic, um, I would also be in favor of adding a second, therefore be it resolved, only because I think that resolutions are great, but they're more powerful when they're distributed. So I would suggest that this resolution be promulgated to, at a minimum, Los Angeles County Board of Supervisor uh, Catherine Barger, um, our current state assembly member, Laura Friedman, both of our existing state senators, our member of Congress, and perhaps our two members of the United States Senate. It doesn't also, have to be, but something. And I also make sure every member here gets a copy of it, too. I will personally deliver that for you, Dr. Agakanian. <laughs> um, I'm getting consensus on the addition of that second, therefore be it resolved. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, President Weisberg, uh, over to you in the board. So you guys can question, comment, anything else? Uh, does anybody in the board have questions, comments, feelings, emotions that are succinct? Board President Weisberg, I have a succinct comment, which yes. is... Um, uh, I think members of the board got an email today um, oh. asking us why why we are um, singling out a particular group. Um, and my response um, to this, I thought generally, if I'm being generous, thoughtfully worded email, um, uh, was that, you know, we often recognize individual groups um, at various points during the year. Um, that said, I think there is a timeliness to this that makes it exist. I, I don't want this resolution to exist during the month of pride, right? right? Because this is about um, support and um, recognition of like the basic humanity of a group of people. Um, and so I wanted to make it clear that there's, that not only are we taking this resolution up because we're all together and there's that timely na nature of it, but also of what's going on in our community and that we want to use Pride Month to celebrate people in this community, not to have to tell others that uh, they are, in fact, humans and part of our community. So um, I just I want to thank um, Council Member Anthony, Board Member Ferguson, for bringing this forward. Um, I think it's really important and really important for our kiddos. Thanks. All right. So why don't we take a motion in a second? I think I might know where to look. <laughs> so moved. All right. Seconded. Outstanding. Any other discussion? Um, with the permission of the city attorney, I think a vote by acclamation should do. So everyone, we are good? Yeah? Brown Act requires a vo voice vote. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Oh, oh roll call. Okay. Ms. Ty, please conduct the roll call. Yes, Mayor. Um, Councilmember Anthony? Yes. Councilmember Mullins? Yes. Councilmember Takahashi? Yes. Vice Mayor Perez? Absolutely. Mayor Schultz? Yes. Uh, of the school district, Member Ferguson? Yes. Member Tabit? Yes. Clerk Ponce or Kamkar? Yes. Vice President Agakanian? Aye. And President uh, Weisberg? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Outstanding. Motion carries 10 0. Yay. Yay! The voice vote is always fun.
Well, I, I like vote. I, I like vote, vote, vote by acclamation. But well, there is the Brown Act. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Item number five has been moved to our next meeting, and that brings us to our final report of the evening, a discussion on the creation of a Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. At this time, we welcome city, the city's library services director, Elizabeth Goldman, who's still with us and awake, to present the report. Good evening. I thought I was going to get to make the joke tonight about good morning instead of good evening, but you really Close. sped things up. So. <laughs> So, good evening, Mayor Schultz, President Weisberg, and members of the City Council and Board of Education. Um, I'm Elizabeth Goldman, the City's Library Services Director. At the previous joint meeting on July 19th, 2022, uh, Vice President Agakanian requested a future agenda item regarding the potential establishment of a youth entrepreneurship center as a partnership between the city and the district. Uh, Mayor Schultz, Vice President Agakanian, and um, some BUSD and city staff held some preliminary conversations to better understand Dr. Agakanian's ideas in June of last year. And the topic has been agendized as a first step tonight in order to allow discussion among the members of both bodies at this meeting and to provide further direction to staff, if any. As a little more background to support your discussion, what do we mean when we say entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship, a word I realized earlier is really hard to type over and over again. Yes. Uh, and it's hard to say. Entrepreneurship promotes the creation of small business by encouraging individuals with ideas to develop plans, obtain funding, and launch their business, leading to economic growth. Some municipalities have responded to this need by creating entrepreneurship hubs, incubators, or similar spaces or programs. Both the city and the district already support youth entrepreneurship in several ways. Through the library's print collection and online resources, youth have access to learning materials for small business skills and industry-specific information, and all BUSD students have automatic access to these materials through the Be Connected Library Card Partnership that we established several years ago. Through the Spark Digital Media Lab at the Central Library, aspiring entrepreneurs can obtain access to equipment and training to develop skills, create port prototypes, or build portfolios. The Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Department's Youth Board and Youth Leadership Programming support development of leadership skills. And the Economic Development Division of the Community Development Department offers SCORE Small Business Counseling in partnership with the library, the online Untapped Startup Academy for Entrepreneurial Training and Coaching, Burbank Tech Talks, and the Startup Burbank Pitch Fest, where entrepreneurs can receive feedback on their ideas, and these are open to youth as well. The school district supports youth entrepreneurship through the CTE, or Career and Technical Education Program, with pathways in animation, digital media production, photography, business, IT, medicine, and many, many other areas. CTE offerings expose students to business leaders, including entrepreneurs, and can often lead to internships. Entrepreneurship programs are not new for K-12 or college educational settings. Most are offered in partnership with a not-for-profit entity, such as the, a partnership that exists between New York City Public Schools and the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, or with an institution of higher learning. For example, the ELAC Incubator at East Los Angeles College provides a space, programs, and services for aspiring and existing entrepreneurs in the region it serves. Public libraries increasingly support workforce development and entrepreneurship at times by co-locating spaces for business meetings, training sessions, and access to technology. And the Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, is a federally funded initiative with locations throughout Los Angeles and the country that guide business startups from idea through planning and the funding or expansion stage. Establishing a full center would require significant funding both for startup and ongoing operations. While it may be possible to obtain grant funding for initial activities, ongoing efforts would require commitments from the city and or BUSD general funds. Obtaining grant fundings may be challenging without demonstration of the effectiveness of the partnership in attracting an audience for youth entrepreneurship and programming activities. Another challenge would be identifying a suitable and accessible location for the center. The city currently does not have such a space, and based on previous discussion, a potential space may exist at the Burbank Adult School, which is operated by the district, but it would require significant improvements. Many communities, when faced with these challenges, decide first to start by continuing or expanding existing sets of programs and services already offered. This could provide proof of concept for budget or grant requests and would not require new space immediately. 
So with that background, I will leave it in your hands to discuss any additional direction that you may want to provide. I do want to let you know that that's about the limit of my knowledge on this subject for now. So um, I may not be able to answer other questions, but I will be taking notes about anything you would like us to look into further for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goldman. Um, why don't we begin with Dr. Agakanian? Thank you, and thank you for the report. Um, if you're uh, paying attention to the report, the ELAC incubator, I am the founder of the ELAC incubator. That stands for East Los Angeles Community College Incubator and Center for Entrepreneurship. It's the only one in the region for women, minorities, LGBTQI, formerly incarcerated, and veterans. Started with 120,000 project. I'm glad to say that last week we got two and a half million dollars from the state of California. Um, there is funding, uh, even during those difficult times, there are certain programs that the state is taking a very serious look at. This is being one of them. Um, I know we have all these existing programs, and even at East LA College when I started this five years ago, we already even had a you know, certification in entrepreneurship. The idea is to have a joint center where we can not only offer these programs, but within that also grow ideas, bring outside interest, and I believe that once we have this and we've talked about the space, you know, bringing these programs there um, will help us. And I've given a, a little bit of a, uh, to my colleagues, I've given the reasons why this is important. Uh, having a center promotes economic growth. Um, so it's not only about having the programs. Um, it's, you know, having an actual space where we can work together. And there will be educational opportunities with the school district and the cities. The center will provide valuable educational opportunities for students. And this is more than just workshops. Acknowledge, uh, knowledge exchange. This will be a collaboration between the city and the school district, encouraging a healthy exchange of ideas and resources. And I've, I did this also when I was working at Marymount, when we created a center there, when we created the first uh, project to have buses run on biodiesel. We actually created a lab. And, you know, and if you made a mistake, your byproduct was soap. You know, for those of you, you know, it was very difficult to just find dirty grease. But this was a student-driven project, and the city got involved. This is the reason why LA Harbor and uh, Long Beach Harbor, now they have a biodiesel project. Back then, Congresswoman Janice Hahn, Mayor Villaragosa, they came to Marymount. They adopted the program. So that was the birthplace of why you have a biodiesel project now at the LA Harbor and Long Beach, started by students from the college. Um, it also supports innovation ecosystems. So creating innovation ecosystem is not just about creating classes or courses, you know. Um, it's where you really have stakeholders who get involved. Incubation is, you know, it's a very lengthy process. Um, I have people who have come up with ideas and gone public with their products and, or put forward a uh, product like Mazatli Footwear, one of our former students from ELAC, who now is, didn't, when he first started, didn't even know where China was in the map. He just received 400 orders for his products from China. Um, so incubation, sometimes it takes a little longer, but it's really creating that ecosystem where you know where to go, where to talk. And when you do this, what's the old saying, if you build it, they will come. Um, you will have in different institutions, banks, you know, programs. SBA is already very interested in, you know, talking to us. Um, addressing local challenges. We have a lot of entrepreneurs here who would love to have a center. I would love, love to have somewhere that they can go and, and work with the city. And that includes also students and also our students' parents who might be challenged and when they see an opportunity, you know, they could be coming up with the next big idea. So, um, and I think there's long-term benefits at the end. Investing in entrepreneurs and innovation, you know, it's, it's, it really brings the, you know, not only the small entrepreneurs to our cities, but it also creates a hub. We have similar programs in neighboring cities, but they're kind of, I don't know how to describe them. It really does not feel like a center. It doesn't feel like an incubator. It feels like there was a little bit of funding. You did a little program here and there. This is not what I'm talking about. It's a true partnership of having an actual space where these programs will come in. And I, I believe once we launch this, we can have the other programs 
continue as well. Because some of our students, you know, might want to come after school and, and, and work in the center. Um, and I think that's important for some of our students. You know, incubation is not a, a you know, I just got an idea and I'm going to take two courses and it's going to happen. So in summary, a joint center for entrepreneurship and innovation between the city and the school district, it's a strategic investment that promotes economic vitality, enhances educational opportunities, fosters collaboration, and strengthens the overall fabric of the community. And I think this is something that I've started. It works. I got money for it during the time that, you know, we're cutting every budget. So obviously there is a very big interest, not only from the state, but also, you know, from a lot of businesses. So I think it's something that, you know, and I do want to thank Mayor Schultz uh, for kind of starting this together. And I, th I believe that Burbank is ready for this. And, and if we have to start in a smaller scale, that's fine. And I think when we go to a point where we're looking at the library and the new library master plan, hopefully we'll have a permanent center for entrepreneurship and innovation where all these resources will be put in there, and where no other city right now has it. I can't name one city around here that has a center for entrepreneurship and innovation. They don't. The only one is Lane, and that's in downtown LA. And they're really, they got $60 million from the city of LA's water and power when they were building it. It was for green technology, and they've gotten more funding ever since. The issue is also, we're forgetting about certain communities, certain, you know, that's why the center at ELAC, it's so targeted for women, minorities, LGBTQ, because some of these programs you see out there um, traditionally does not address the concerns of certain communities. So I think we can start something new. We just passed the historic resolution. I believe this is also something that we could do and it will be historic in terms of, you know, bringing the, not only the partnerships together, but also doing something that uh, has not been done around here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Akakanian. Just to add a tiny bit of context to that, um, I agree. Um, I've enjoyed our conversations. I think this is something to help our community stand out and cultivates um, outside the box entrepreneurial spirit, especially in our young people, um, because we don't just want to recruit some of the best to come relocate to Burbank. We want to really cultivate young minds to be inventing the things of tomorrow that we really frankly need today. Um, but in terms of getting down to brass tacks, uh, I guess my question for staff, because I know we've talked about this a little bit, the asks for each of our bodies tonight, I think that it kind of divides into two separate issues. First, we need a physical space, and I don't know if the district has had some conversations about opportunities for that. And then from the city perspective, I think the staff, I, I guess my question would be back partially to you, Dr. Agakanian, because you have the experience at ELAC. Um, we probably couldn't contribute the physical space with access to students. What we could probably help with is um, some programming assistance. We also have strategic partnerships with the chamber. So I think that's sort of the direction I'd like to take it. What is it that the city could do to offer some assistance here? But maybe we could start with uh, Dr. Paramo about physical location. Yes, we have a couple possibilities uh, in terms of trying to find a suitable space. Uh, in all honesty, it's limited to what would be a bungalow that we could dedicate. Um, originally, the thought was the uh, bungalows that are adjacent to the Burbank Adult School. That may not be the place, but there is still another space that I might be able to uh, secure. So I'm, I'm not too worried about the physical space if a bungalow will work. Um, before I open it up to other questions and comments, so Dr. Paramo, from the board from the board of education perspective, is that something that you would need guide, guidance or authorization from the board to pursue making that a priority, looking for space? Yes. Okay, because right now you essentially have one board member saying I'd be interested in doing it. Correct. So just to guide the conversation, that's I think the ask of Dr. Agakani, and, and maybe we can settle on that point first, and I'm going to turn it over to President Weisberg for the board's questions on that. Uh, board members? I think this may, I mean, I, I, I think, I see possibilities. I don't understand a lot. I don't know where the kids come from. How do we get kids involved? Is it a class? Who teaches it? Who runs this? Do, does it cost, it doesn't seem like it'll cost a lot of money. So that might not be a big figure, but maybe it's time for 
uh, a committee to sit mm -hmm. down and really figure mm -hmm. this out step by step by step mm -hmm. uh, because it seems like a big picture yep. idea, but it needs some details before I would say go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Ayakanian. You know, uh, I, one, I'm happy to see you invested in, in this idea, right? Um, and you have the experience, certainly, uh, running an institution like this, you know, where I, where I, I want to see where this interacts with and how this interacts with all the existing city programs that exist today with Verdugo, uh, I think it's like workforce job training. Uh, there's so many regional uh, hubs working at this in, you know, collaboration with EDD, you name it. So I want to make sure that, that this is a complement or it, you know, allows us to truly be innovative. Is there a place where you can go and upload your resume and do, yeah, the library right now. Uh, the library is a great, but... It doesn't need it. I, I think it, it, it's worthy of exploration. You have concepts, you have ideas. I think there's ways to say, identify at a minimum. Are there any services where there's a gap? And and we can evaluate it from there and build from there. And if there really uh, can be a space for innovation, we're partnering with Glendale or with uh, with LA Valley College, uh, like never before. Uh, and that can be a place, again, where this can grow. So this does bring opportunities, and I, I thank you for your energy on that front, because that, that's not where my energy has been. My energy has been over here. So uh, and, and it's important that way. And it's funny you mention, uh, like, so again, it, the gap is, and that's what I've discovered over the years, and that's why we created the center, is that there are programs, but also uh, it's not as centralized as you think it is. Also, a lot of communities are left out. That's another big challenge, you know. I can name uh, so many incubators out there that are private equities and venture funds and angel investors just throwing money at it. So, and I think that's something that a committee should look at. Just to give you an idea, speaking of Valley and Mission, our own assembly member, Luz Rivas, again, she got millions of dollars for some eight million, six million dollars, if I'm mistaken, to Mission College to explore this area as well. So. So I think a committee is a good idea. You know, it's not only about the space. I don't want to repeat what I, what others are doing, but having a center for entrepreneurship and innovation, it's very different than just having the programs offer. It's a, and then within that, you go to the sec, second phrase, which is the difficult one, which is incubation. We're not there yet. It, it took us five years to get where we are. I'm just putting this out there because there is a need and I believe that we will be the first district to really offer this in a way that the city also can benefit from, meaning that these are the students, and I agree with my colleague, these are the students who will incubate here and grow their ideas and stay here and grow their businesses here. You know what I mean? And I think, I think mm -hmm. that's something that I'm looking at in a long-term investment as well. So, Thank you. So my colleagues just suggesting that we have basically until the next joint meeting, we're, we're joining some items tonight, you know, that we have till the next joint meeting to kind of facilitate and to build out a program outline along with, you know, any other considerations in terms of um, space being utilized. It, you know, if we can do that, great. If we can't, we can outline at least where it could be useful, what all it looks like. So that way it's not an indefinite timeline, but we're able to kind of land this and get this moving as a priority. And our next meeting is next month, right? As you said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to come back. Um, no, so I guess my question for the body would be, do we need a separate committee? Do we want to just have the joint subcommittee do it? You're here, I'm hearing at least separate committee from yeah. one person here. Okay. So if I could ask, like, I, I think it's a great idea to do a joint committee, but it sounds like we're not done on our, our end yet. So the idea is maybe if we can take this on, Great. Run the ball and then uh, pass it on to the subcommittee if that's where it goes. I'm not sure if that's, I, I just want to make sure whatever we're doing is obviously compliant. But I, I think we need to do our end and then we'll. Pull yeah, it. I agree. I, let's start with our end because uh, once we partner with the city and once this grows, then eventually I think it's the transition part of it when the city comes in. So students come in, they have ideas. If they incubate and then the idea grows, then the city comes in and takes that uh, those ideas. That includes also, you know, a lot of small businesses out there. A lot of these students have parents who might have ideas as well that want to come in and help them as, uh, with the students as well. And then they can also, within that, learn how do they can do business with the city. You'll be surprised uh, how many people don't know how to do contracts with the city. You, you have all these programs out there. 
But I can tell you, based on my experience, <coughs> we're sitting over $8.7 billion bond, and a lot of people in the community don't know how these contracts work. That's big billions. Um, three of it's gone, five is left. The point I'm making is that sometimes just seeing that, saying, ah, oh, there is a center, actually, it does help people. Thank you. Um, so I um, like the idea of this a lot. I think um, this question that Board Member Ferguson brought up around, like, what are, what are the gaps <laughs> that we're trying to address here? I think that might be where we want to bring in city earlier, right, in terms of, um, yes, there's likely a need for specific communities that have been left out of other kind of entrepreneurial um, incubators, ventures, et cetera. I'm wondering also if there's a sense of what the city needs from a, um, from a service, from a product, from a industry perspective, right? We're the media capital of the world. Could we start an incubator or a, a center for innovation around media, right? And, and really try to um, figure out how to structure this as, a, as something that's specific, that's specific to Burbank. Um, and so maybe the, we're not bringing them in a year from now, but we're bringing them in like a little bit earlier on. Maybe we've figured out space and we've figured out a little more of the structure and then working with folks on council to think about how are they thinking about workforce development? Where, is there, where are there really gaps in our community around what's needed um, in the business community that we're seeing gaps in? Would be my suggestion. And also for the record, I want to let everyone know that our, our, our kiddos, this, the entrepreneur spirit, I mean, just look at the influencers. Look at the young people who are out there doing their own business. It's not as simple as people think it is. But the spirit is there because it's something that's been injured. I mean, over the last five years alone, uh, 10 years, sorry, there have been 20% increase in entrepreneurial in younger people, just to give you an idea, because the technology is there, they can start a company. Uh, but having the center and knowing that the, also that something as wonderful as the city of Burbank is a partner, it also adds to it. So I, 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 I believe this is something... And then we had the same questions when we started our incubator at ELAC. And I think it's a learning, uh, but it will be something that I'm, I'm hoping that um, looks like you want to be on the committee. So, so I think we can bring this <laughs> I'm sorry. But we can bring the city at, as early as, as, as maybe you think. But I, let's find the gaps. Let's create this committee. Um, let's see what the needs are first, and then we'll go from there. That was going to be my suggestion as, as I was like trying to get your attention. We kind of figured out we need to figure out what this is. So let's make that happen and go home. Great. <laughs> Great. Well, in fairness, Council, any questions or comments? Uh, Councilmember Takashi. Um, I'm so glad that this came up tonight. Um, a couple of meetings ago, the Council, we adopted our five-year strategic economic plan. And part of that process was a very in-depth gap analysis. And part of the discovery was a need for some, this kind of program. And there is a bit in, our, in, in, the, in the tome about having an incubator and inno, an innovative, um, some way of creating innovation. So I'm wondering um, if it, through your process, if you're going to go through this process, it might be valuable to talk with our EDD folks and look at the gap analysis and what they discovered to get to, so you don't have to re reinvent the wheel. You can use what they've already discovered and already um, looked at and, and then see too what they're, what they were, because it's kind of a, it's a very, you know, um, you know, high level uh, strategic plan. So there's, the, the details are not yet fleshed out. And so if there's an opportunity there to kind of uh, collaborate with what's already existing okay. in the plan um, and, be, and creating a partnership. And then our, our end um, colleagues, maybe perhaps we can um, look at how we can encourage our EDD to incorporate the school district um, as part of, as a partner and when, and when looking into that, that, that section of our strategic plan. Mr. Mayor. Please. We have a time issue with council. Oh, yes. Uh, Councilmember Anthony, I see you going for the motion. Yeah, I move that we uh, extend the meeting past 11. Council on, oh, wow. Okay. We got motion in a second. All in favor, show of hands. Great. Meeting moves past 11. Thank you. Um, I think, Councilmember Takashi, anything else you want to add? Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor President, did you have your hand up? 
Yeah, um, one, I wanted to address the 11 p.m. issue. <laughs> and uh, number two, um, can we get the school board members a copy of our handy dandy strategic plan, the shiny, beautiful blue book that we got? Yes, we can. Great. I think that would be really helpful as you all take that starting point in looking at what we need um, to clerk, uh, sponsor Cam Kurt's point. Great. Um, and then the only other thing, I had a question for you, know, Dr. Agakanian. Um, what funding grant opportunity did ELAC receive? Was it federal, state, and what was, was the uh, grant, if you remember? Actually, it wasn't a grant. It was Senator Rubio, who went to ELAC, who was, uh, who was a teacher for years, and felt that there was, while she was a teacher, there was no need for it. So, so uh, we went to her and asked for a very small amount, and she came back with two and a half million dollars. Um, and again, there are grants out there, but also when it comes to state uh, funding for members to ask, um, governor pretty much has taken everything back except this one at this point, because there is this really big need for this kind of uh, program. So. But to answer your question, it was not a grant, but there are grants out there too. We did receive a couple of grants from a couple of banks. So um, as I said, once you open it and it's there, you will be surprised how many different opportunities will come your way. I think, I think what's important is not to rush this, to do this the right way, look at what the needs are, look at the strategic plan, look at this in a five-year increment of where is this going to be in five years, where will it be housed, what benefits. The benefits are already... We kind of know about it, but I think it will be also very different because other districts have thought about this, but again, the question came up, well, we can't fund it. That was the same question we had. We took a risk. We went from 120 to two and a half million, and there's more to come, actually. We have a lot of other businesses and entities interested. Is it 11 o'clock? It is. Thank you. <laughs> Vice Mayor Perez, any other questions? No, that's everything. Let's hope we can find some of those funds in this lovely budget climate statewide. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we have uh, clear direction from both bodies. I don't think there's a need for a motion unless staff disagrees. Seeing no disagreement, uh, good work, everybody. So almost done. Uh, second to last item. This is uh, items for discussion at a future joint meeting. I just want to note that uh, this is a, an opportunity for each of you to individually request a future agenda item. The joint subcommittee will hammer out a tentative agenda and then bring that back to each body for approval. But does anybody have any suggested items for future meetings? Uh, yes, so I heard incubator from Dr. Agakanian. Councilmember Takahashi, you have your hand up. Yeah, yeah I have two. Um, I would love a report back at the next meeting on the subcommittee's discussions around the solar initiatives. So that would be great to bring back. Okay. And then um, I'd, I'd love to, if, if, if possible, to look at, um, we talked about safety around the school sites itself, but if the subcommittee could look at and discuss a possibility of bringing back the topic of safe routes to school for kids, especially high school kids, to start um, to either bike, walk, or take public transit from anywhere in the city to their high school that they attend, that, they don't, that no, no child has to take a car, that they can get safe routes to school. Um, and as a kind of just a topic for, like, to, 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 to move, general discussion topic. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, I, uh, Board Member Ferguson, and then I go to Vice Mayor Perez then we'll over here. The, the ball at this point should be moved a little bit further down the road on the LA Valley College potential partnership. So having a briefing on that uh, for the full body, I think would be really good. Uh, just a new asset that could potentially come online and, and help this community. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I would like to see item five come back. I really did want to talk about the enrollment issue. It's something I'm really concerned about. So I'd love to see that report come back the next time we meet. Um, additionally, I'd like something on um, the responses at schools during a mental health crisis. I'd love mm. more education about what our district is doing, how the process goes, and who's involved. Um, and then my last ask is on school buses. I want to see what that looks like. Okay. okay. Duly noted. Thank you. Anyone on this end of the okay. table? Yes. Board member. Um, uh, cosign on the safe routes to school, and then also um, we have joint use funds that we use um, <laughs> jointly. Um, just uh, it would be great to get a report on on what's still in that pot, um, how we can use that, especially given a potential bond um, coming up for the school district. 
Great. Noted. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilmember Mullins. I agree with everyone else, but what you uh, wanted to have on the agenda, I want to also continue to add the discussion about uh, SROs and to find out how many, uh, what the right number is, uh, according to the chief, he's talking about maybe two, seven, five, so I'd like to have to continue the discussion on that. Thank you. Council Member Anthony? Um, <clears throat> I would like to request that the subcommittee discuss whether or not this body should uh, be briefed on um, active shooter drills. I don't want to bring it back directly here. I just okay discuss it, yeah. figure out if it's appropriate to come back to this. Okay, for noted. A presentation. Noted. Any other requests? The only request I would have for staff, and I don't know if it needs to be an agenda item, but um, because we're getting into a into a rhythm now of requesting agenda items, talking about it in the subcommittee, bringing it back, I think a standardized schedule. It doesn't need to be like an exact day, but we're going to have our joint meeting every summer or during this month. I think a proposal will come back would be helpful, so that way we can all plan around that throughout the year. Um, so that would be my ask. And I think that about does it, everybody. So with that, uh, I wanna thank everyone for coming, attending, viewing the special joint meeting of our two bodies. It's been a real pleasure. I wanna thank you all for your uh, uh, professionalism, participation, it's been real. Uh, we now adjourn the meeting uh, to the next Burbank City Council meeting, in our case, uh, to April 9th, 2024. That will be a joint meeting uh, with successor agency and authority in the council chamber located at 275 East Olive Avenue, second floor. Um, Board President Weisberg, do you wanna mention your next meeting? Uh, less than 24 hours from now, folks, we'll, uh, noted for the millions of you still awake and listening that tomorrow we begin our start time of a six o'clock meeting, uh, which is a change for us. So we'll see you bright and early at six. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night.